In Korea, it has been nine years since the Anti-Corporal Punishment Act was passed. The law prohibits teachers from disciplining their students using corporal punishment or physical harm. However, once the law was adopted, it became increasingly difficult for teachers to manage their unruly students. Survey shows that almost all teachers found the law made their job extremely more difficult. Then one day, a teacher assaulted by a student dies. This sudden development forced the Ministry of Education to pass a new law, this time protecting the teachers. Two years later, the first part of the law commences. Kyung and Kim is a normal first-year student going to school. One day, a second-year boy committed suicide right in front of Kim. The boy that died is Daesyuk, a student who was relentlessly bullied in their school. However, instead of being scared, Kim laughed. Why? Because Kim himself is relentlessly getting bullied at school. Bullies beat him up and make a game as to who can make him scream the loudest. They punch him, pinch him, or even sit on him. He tried to tell the teachers before, but they just scolded the students, which made them bully him even more. He overheard from them that the teachers chose to just ignore the problem since the law doesn't give them any authority anyway. With Dasak's death, the cops would be involved and maybe the bullying would stop. Unfortunately, no one told the cops anything and they concluded the suicide was due to grades, not bullying. Faced with such difficulty in life, Kim is now on top of the building, contemplating whether he should just jump. Before he can, a man suddenly speaks up from behind him and urges him not to. The man is sitting on the rooftop surveying everything that is happening all around the school. He introduces himself as a new teacher and asks to be brought to the teacher's room. While on the way to the teacher's room, a bully suddenly kicks Kim and starts beating him up. Out of nowhere, the new teacher suddenly slaps the bully and starts disciplining him. The bully warns the new teacher that teachers can't harm students and tells his classmates to start videoing them. However, the new teacher just smiles and continues disciplining him. When the principal arrives, the new teacher introduces himself. He is Warden Huajin Na of the newly created Teachers' Rights Protection Agency. They give special guidance to delinquent schools, whether it's because of bullies or teachers who cover up suicides in their schools by paying hush money to cops. Moreover, the TRPA has no limits on its educational methods, even if it's for students or teachers alike. Thus, Hawaijin Na announces that he'll give their school a true education. After learning who he is, the principal and vice principal tried to convince him that their school is free of violence. They even tried bribing Hawaijin with an envelope of cash, but he just ignores their excuses and instead asks where the classroom of the student who committed suicide is. In class 2-5, some goon is trying to make one of his classmates, Bayongsu, drink a bottle full of liquor. They are trying to hide the fact that they themselves are hungover and forced Bayongsu to take the blame. One of these bullies is Jun Yang, a son of a congressman. Just then, Wei Jin enters and announces that he'll be their substitute teacher. The students snicker and think that he's no big deal, so Wei Jin just starts taking attendance. When he arrives at Dasak's name, the bully explains to him that he's already dead. When he reaches Bayongsu, who is drenched in liquor, the bully quickly tells on him for being drunk. However, Wei Jin quickly points out that he can smell it more on the bully. The bully gets angry at his accusation, but Wei Jin just also asks if he's the bully who pushed Da Sok to suicide. He then pulls the bully by the lips and drags him in front of the class. He announces that their school has three main problems. First, they don't respect their teachers. Two, they bully each other. And third, the school remains complacent with all these. He then introduces himself as Warden Wei Jin Na of the TRPA and he congratulates the student for being their very first case. As a start, Wei Jin orders all the students to stand up. However, Jun Yang orders his classmates to sit down instead. He shouts at them, and all the students sit down in fear. He then smiles at Hua Jin and tells him that it seems the students respect him more than Hui Jin himself. In response, Hua Jin orders Jun Yang to go in front. When he doesn't, Wei Jin calmly goes over to his desk. Before anything happens, Wei Jin notices the principal and the vice principal spying on him from outside the classroom. The principal tells Wei Jin that he should be careful with Jun Yang since he's the son of a congressman. Meanwhile, Jun Yang saunders out of the classroom without any fear of them. Hua Jin thanks the principal for the warning, but he just calmly holds Jun Yang's head and slams him to the ground. He scolds the principal, pointing out that his fear of Jun Yang makes the students lose respect for their teachers. He then orders the principal to round up the teachers since he has an announcement for them. Meanwhile, Jun Hian menacingly looks at them from the ground. With all the teachers rounded up, Wei Jin announces that they can exercise their authority as he does. 
He promises that he will take responsibility and opens a cabinet full of disciplining equipment for them to use. The teachers react confused to his announcement, with some apprehensive, while the older teachers gleefully get their old weapons from the cabinet. From that moment on, it is a common sight to see teachers punishing the delinquents in their class, slapping them with sticks, or making them do exercises. Some students fight back, but those get special counseling from Huijin. After giving his guidance, the students leave his office terrified and apologizing to their teachers. One day, the bullies are having a meeting on the rooftop, and they urge Jun Yan to make his dad do something about it. However, he tells them that their school is in the pilot program and it was passed by the Ministry of Education two years ago, so his father cannot do anything about it. However, he has a different plan. He calls over Byongsu to do his plan. Meanwhile, on the school grounds, Weijin is asking Kim how his school life has been, and Kim happily reports that there has been a lot less bullying. However, he points out that this will only last while Heijin is in their school, and if he leaves, they'll just go back to their old ways. Their conversation is interrupted when Byongsu arrives looking like he was beaten up, asking Weijin for help. Weijin leads Byongsu to his office, but out of nowhere, Byongsu suddenly stabs him, just as Jung Yang ordered. Weijin is shocked by the knife now sticking out of his side, but he just calmly looks at Byongsu and twists his arm and pulls out the knife. He then brings Byongsu back to his office and orders him to hold the mirror while he sews up the wound. Thankfully, Byongsu's inexperience made the wound only shallow. He then intimidates Byongsu to tell him who ordered it, and when he stays silent, he lets him go, telling him he's just a pushover letting everyone else order him around. Byongsu cries out, telling him he has no choice since Daesuk himself failed to stand up against Jun Yang. Byongsu then starts telling the history between Jun Yang and Daesuk. Daesuk was a popular kid with many friends while Jun Yang hung out with the delinquent students. They don't interact until one day, Jun Yan was about to hurt a teacher when Daesuk suddenly punches him in defense of their teacher. From that day on, Daesuk became the target of bullies, and Jun Yang even ordered the other students to make Daesuk an outcast. What's worse, Jun Yang used his father's influence to affect Daesuk's father's career, who was a government contractor. A few months of bullying later, Daesuk asked Jun Yang if he hadn't done enough, but Jun Yang just answered that he will never stop until Daesuk's dead. Thus, Daesuk committed suicide. At their school, Jun Yang is king. That is why Byongsu had no choice but to follow his orders. However, after Byongsu's explanation, he notices that Huijin wasn't even listening but instead was just sleeping. He tries to make Huijin understand how big a deal Jun Yang is, but Huijin just looks at his phone and instead shows him something on it. Meanwhile, the bullies are waiting on the rooftop for cops or ambulances to arrive and take away Huijin. When nothing happened, they assume that Byong Su probably just ran away instead of following their instructions. Jun Yang is thinking about what other plans he should do when Hui Jin and Byong Su suddenly barge onto the rooftop. Byong Su angrily walks to Jun Yang and gives him an uppercut, knocking him down to the ground. After the bullies get over their shock, they are about to manhandle Byong Su, but Hui Jin pulls them over and throws them to the ground. Jun Yang is recovering from Byong Su's punch but Byongsu yells at him and tells him he cannot use his dad as a defense anymore. Byongsu shows him a phone and in it is news about Jun Yang's dad being indicted on charges of bribery and scandal. A few days ago, Weijin was complaining to his boss about the school he had chosen for their first case. Having the son of a politician as one of its students would surely just make their work harder. However, his boss just lights a cigarette and tells him that Weijin to focus on his job, while he will handle the dirty work, Back in the present, everyone is surprised at the revelation that Jun Yan's dad has criminal cases against him. One of the bullies approaches Jun Yang and asks if it is true. Jun Yang's childhood has always been a hard one. His father, a prominent politician, always disciplines him whenever he causes trouble or when his grades are low. To his father, Jun Yang was an embarrassment of a son. However, his hard life only extends to the walls of his home. Outside, things were very different. Adults and children alike all fawn over him thanks to his connection to his father. Thus, Jun Yang started to use his dad's status to make everyone kneel before him. His greatest joy in life was watching others beg for mercy. Unfortunately, something bad happened. One of these people ended his own life. Jun Yang feared for his life as he might be sent to prison. However, even the police fawned over him. On that day, he realizes he can do anything. But now, he is sitting on the bathroom floor with the other delinquents bullying him now that they know his father's not a big deal anymore. 
They pour juice on him and even spit on him. After the bullies leave, Wei Jin casually exits a bathroom stall. Jun Yang angrily shouts at him why he didn't save him from the bullying when it's what the TRPA should be doing. However, Mr. Nut just announces that he's leaving their school. Thus, everything went back to the way it was with just one major difference. Everyone is now bullying the once king of their school, Jun Yang. Not only that, but even at home, his dad starts beating him up again when an old video of Jun Yang's bullying surfaces on the news. With his world crashing down around him, Jun Yang decides to just kill everyone who bullied him. In the dead of the night, he goes to the school and pours gasoline all over the hallway. All of a sudden, someone kicks him on the stomach, and he comes crashing down to the ground all drenched in gasoline. It was Hua Jin. Hua Jin mutters that Jun Yang seemed to still haven't realized what he did wrong. He then lights up a cigarette and tells the kid that it's time he learned his lesson. Jun Yang is surprised to see Hua Jin there, but Hua Jin just drops the lit up lighter at the gasoline Jun Yang scattered around the floor and walls. Jun Yang panics and tries to get away from the flames, but he soon slips and gets cornered by the blazing inferno. He finally realizes his faults and asks Hua Jin for help, who promptly extinguishes the flames with the fire extinguisher. Hua Jin then tells Jun Yang that learning is something one experiences with one's whole body, not just through words or books. And now Jun Yang himself knows what it feels like for his life to turn into a living hell by someone wrongfully using power and authority to gang up on someone and drive them into a corner. By being subjected to his own actions, Johnny Yang can finally understand what he had done to Desya, and him taking real responsibility for everything he has done is precisely the real education Hui Jin seeks to impart. However, Hui Jin points out that no matter how much responsibility he takes for his actions, there's no bringing back Desya, so in that case it's only fair that he makes Johnny Yang carry the weight of his mistakes for the rest of his life. Hui Jin then leaves, with Johnny Yang contemplating his life and crying. That morning, Hui Jin appeared in the news and revealed himself as working for the Ministry of Education. He then divulged all the evidence he collected during his time at Jun Yang's school on Jun Yang's wrongdoings. Thus, the police took Jun Yang in, along with the rest of the bullies who tormented Da Seok, into custody. Not only that, but news of Jun Yang's father being expelled from his political party also broke out due to his numerous scandals. Due to all these revelations, the whole country learned about the TRPA and Wei Jin's teaching methods. Public opinion and social media are becoming abuzz with criticism or support of the TRPA, including its method of corporal punishment. Meanwhile, the head of the Ministry of Education, Gang Stuck Choi, is preparing himself to face the public through a press conference. His secretary tries to give him a few scripted answers, but the head of the Ministry of Education rejects her help. After all, he points out that it's not his style to predict things and come up with scripts like a coward. Out of nowhere, their car stops since a man is standing in the middle of the street, blocking the way. It was Jun Yang's father, Congressman Ryu. Congressman Ryu confronts Gang Suk and asks him if he's the one who leaked his scandals to the press. He asks him why he did such a thing when they were comrades once, but Gung Suk just points out that he should have been a better father. Congressman Ryu is intimidated, for in front of him is Gang Stok Choi, the former head of the ruling party and a veteran politician of 26 years. Gang Shok Choi, the current Minister of Education, is a 69-year-old man and a former congressman for six whole terms. He is a sharp-tongued speaker, and unlike every other politician, he wasn't fake. His honest and brash attitude appealed to a lot of people, giving him enough base support that he was always considered to be a viable president of the country. Nevertheless, his brash attitude means he always butts heads with every reporter in Korea. At the start of the press conference, reporters start asking him if he supports corporal punishment and whether this is because of his old-fashioned thinking. Another reporter questions whether his methods are in violation of the rights of the students who now have bruises all over their bodies. In response, Gang Suk points out that the TRPA only works in schools where situations are so out of hand, so he does not support corporal punishments at all. Moreover, they have proof that the schools change for the better after the TRPA's involvement, so the students themselves show if corporal punishment is an outdated method or not. Furthermore, the rights of the students who want to study must be protected too. Not only those students who chose to be bullies. He then announces that if he's the Minister of Education, he will support the TRPA no matter the opposition. So he warns all the parents calling him that they can never change his mind. A few days later, Wei Jin is watching his boss scary interview on the internet. To his surprise, Gang Sok, his dad is behind him already. Together, they visit and pay respect to the grave of Giyun Choi, the real reason why they started the TRPA. As they are about to leave, Hua Jin reveals that his new assignment has already been chosen, Guan High Tech High School. Hua Jin is curious since normally the principals try to hide their school's problems, but this time, the principal of Guan Tech himself asked for their help. Thus, Hua Jin enters the school and as soon as he climbs the stairs, two groups of high schoolers are having an all-out brawl. The students of the electrical engineering department and the members of the auto engineering 
department have crossed paths once again and are at war with each other. All Huijin must do is stop it. Ever since he was little, Hyeonju was a fanatic when it came to cars. He was never interested in robots or anything else, just cars. That is why even when he was a kid, he knew that he wanted to become an auto engineer in the future. But when he finally gets to enroll in an auto engineering department, his dream turns into a nightmare. His whole department is currently in a fist fight with another department, and when another student notices him just standing by the side, he shouts at him to join the fight. Hyeonju charges with his fist, but a single punch knocks him out. He really doesn't like his new life, but what can he do? He then notices what seems like a seemingly familiar person in school. Meanwhile, Hoijin meets with the principal of Guan Tech, who tells him of the power struggle currently going on between the departments. Later, the leader of the auto engineering department, a student named Hojan, is punishing their members who didn't contribute much to the fight. This includes Hyeonju, who was wishing he could go back in time and stop himself from getting into cars in the first place. The hierarchy in Guan Tech was determined through fights, and despite being the third year, he was in last place. The only way he is surviving is thanks to the auto lessons he loved. Hojun punishes Hyeonju for being a weakling in their department. However, Huijin suddenly appears and tells Hojun that school is for learning, not fighting. Not knowing who Huijin is, Hojun tries to teach him a lesson, but a single punch from Huijin sends him down. Huijin then motions to Hyeonju to help him with a plan. Meanwhile, the electrical department is also having a meeting. Their leader, Honki, is motivating his underlings for the upcoming brawl, but the school speakers suddenly blare out with Hyeonju speaking that he, the weakest of the auto department, is challenging the whole electrical department. The whole department rushes to the gym to accept Hyeonju's challenge, but what welcomes them is a smack from Hoijin's baton. Inside the gym is a makeshift classroom, with the auto engineering department sitting on one side. Hoijin tells the electrical engineering department to take a seat since his class, character education, will be in session. Those who have any complaints can just go to him for a fight. Honky and his goons ask Hoijin who he is, so Huijin introduces himself. Honky finally recognizes him as the TRPA who's been on the news lately and warns Huijin that they're not small-time bullies like those at other schools. He then dismisses Huijin's proclamation and tries to leave, but Huijin throws his baton at them and tells them they cannot leave. This angers the engineering department with Honky picking up the baton and rushing at him. However, Huijin just knocks him out with one blow. The other students were shocked, so they all decided to rush him together at the same time. Meanwhile, Hojun from the auto department is just smiling at them since they experienced the same thing a while ago. After the whole department gets smacked on them behind by Huijin, he tells them to go to their seats and hands out test papers. After all, he points out that their school is a place to study, not to fight. Ayanju gets weirded out because the exam is just a basic general knowledge exam, but it seems that he's the only one thinking that way. Everyone else cannot seem to answer the exam. He never really told anyone else. But truthfully, Hyeonju is the number one smartest student in the school. The next day, the whole of Huijin's class now has a new hierarchy. Some of them are pulling tires while jogging across the field, others are resting by the shade, and one is sitting on a throne. Huijin's class is now divided based on their grades, with those who have a GPA between 0 and 59 points as the pawns, those who have a GPA of 60 to 90 points as the knights, and the one ruling all over them giving the order is Hyeonji, the king with a GPA of 100 points. Meanwhile, outside the school, a boy is sitting over the bodies of the people he beat up and calls his underling, the electrical engineering student Honki. He informs Honki that his suspension is weirdly finished, with it ending at only two weeks when it's supposed to last for a while. When Honki tells him of the TRPA's presence in their school, the boy breaks his cigarette and angrily asks Honki if it's true. The boy is Wanyuk, the overall number rank one in Guan Tech's fighting hierarchy. Meanwhile, the combined auto and electrical engineering class are made to follow a new set of rules. The rules are class hierarchy is determined by grades, anyone can challenge the instructor, and insubordination in the rankings is not tolerated. Not only that, the knights get to eat good food, the pawns can only eat dry rice and potatoes, and the king dines on gourmet food. Hojong, Annoyed at his experience as only a pawn, throws down his food and challenges Huajin again as per rule 2. However, his whole gang easily gets decimated by Huajin. After class, they try to bully Hyeonju, but when Huajin catches them, he makes them do physical exercises as punishment in front of the king. Hyeonju begs Huajin if he can step down as king because he knows that the moment Huajin leaves, everyone would kill him for being the king. However, Huajin promises that once he's done with their school, he won't need to be scared ever again. Meanwhile, Honki asks Hojun why he's trying to keep fighting against Huajin. He tells him that they should rejoice because the number one of their school, Wanyuk, is finally returning, and he will surely put Huajin in his place. Suddenly, the door to the gymnasium rattles and shakes as someone from outside tries to enter. The door knob breaks, and when the door opens, Wanyuk enters wielding a hammer he used to break down the door. However, instead of being scared, Huajin smiles and welcomes Wanyuk. After all, he was the one who requested the principal to end his suspension and let him go back to school. 
However, Guan Yuk just puts down his bag and punches Hui Jin, which he thankfully was able to block. Guan Yuk points at Hui Jin's rules and tells that he wants to challenge Hua Jin. Hua Jin stares at him with blood on his lips from Guan Yuk's punch, but still smiles and happily accepts his challenge. At the start of the fight, Hui Jin manages to dodge Guan Yuk's punch and delivers one of his own. However, instead of going down, Guan Yuk endures his punch and slams Hui Jin's head down to the ground, knocking him unconscious. It turns out that Guan Yuk is a living legend in their school. Even when they were just first years, he managed to claw his way up the food chain of Guan Tech. Not only that, when other schools start belittling their students because a freshman was king, Guan Yuk showed them who's boss. He had earned the title of number one powerhouse in the district. Their infamy became so wide that they were able to match the past legendary status of their school. Before their school was known as Guan Tech, it was known as Guan Vocational High, and Guan Vocational High ruled over their district with an iron fist, getting dubbed as the Guan Mongol Army. But with Guan Yuk as strong as he is now, they can surely surpass that. The students celebrate Guan Yuk's victory against Hui Jin and start chanting his name. Meanwhile, Ho Zhang compliments Guan Yuk and calls down on Hyeonju to receive his punishment for strutting around as their king the past few days. However, Guan Yuk suddenly punches Ho Zhang and Honki, scolding them for bowing down to Hui Jin in the first place. He then announces that he will start conquering their whole district under his iron fist. Guan Yuk then notices a laugh coming from behind him. It was Hui Jin who was just pretending to be knocked out. Guan Yuk attacks Hui Jin again, but this time, Hui Jin elbows him in the chest, cracking his ribs. With a cracked rib, Guan Yuk won't be able to punch his way out of things for a couple of weeks, and thus, Hui Jin assigns him to be the king, Hyeonju's valet. In a Chinese restaurant out in the city, a group of high schoolers from different schools are having a meeting. They are sharing information about how Guan Yuk managed to beat the thugs of Surak High all by himself just two days ago. They are worried that Guan Yuk isn't done rampaging around yet, but instead will be coming for their own schools in the coming weeks ahead. Thus, one suggests to the representatives from the other schools that they should join forces and go bring down Guan High. Their meeting gets interrupted when a new high schooler enters the room. It was the top dog of Surak Hai who got beaten up by Guan Yuk himself just two days ago. He yells at the others that there are no problems that cannot be solved with money. Meanwhile, back at Guan Hai, Hyeonju's life as the king had just become much more nerve-wracking now that the top dog of their school, Guan Yuk, is serving him water as his butler. At first he wasn't that compliant, threatening him every time he gave him an order. But as always, Wei Jin comes swooping in this time with a feather duster. He just tickles Wan Yuk's nose, making him sneeze, which moves his cracked ribs and causes him to double down in pain. Then, Hui Jin just hands over the feather duster to Hyeonju and tells him to use it whenever Guan Yuk is being unruly. Guan Yuk also tried rallying the other students to go after Hui Jin together, but no one listened to him. They pointed out that Guan Yuk himself got beaten up, so who is he to tell them to fight again? Guan Yuk was no longer able to reign over the others. But that wasn't the only thing that changed. Hyeonju himself noticed that the other students are now teaching each other their lessons so that they could raise their ranks. After spending two weeks packed together like a tin of sardines, the line between the auto and electric departments gradually faded and everyone started to get along with one another, whether it's in food or games. The principal also noticed these changes and complimented Hui Jin on a job well done, especially with Guan Yuk, who is now meekly going along. However, Guan Jin points out that Guan Yuk still hasn't changed. Meanwhile, Guan Yuk and Hyeonju are walking outside with Guan Yuk carrying his bags for him. Hyeonju is pondering whether Guan Yuk had really changed while Guan Yuk is just counting down the days until when his ribs will heal and he can get his revenge on Hui Jin. While walking, Sorakai, unfortunately, finds them and starts teasing Guan Yuk. Guan Yuk asks them why they're so confident for someone who got beaten up a couple of weeks ago but Surak Hai then called out their weapons, a group of adult gangsters. Wan Yuk immediately punches the gangsters, managing to bring down two of them. However, the last one easily blocks his punch and delivers a powerful haymaker to his side. The gangster then mentions that it feels wrong to beat up students from his old school. After all, he was the top dog of their school eight years ago and the former ruler of the Guan Mongol army, aka the Great Chan. Wan Yuk can't believe that the gangster he's now facing is the legendary Great Khan of Guan. He tries to punch him, but the Great Khan just kicks him in the face, sending him back down. As a child, Wan Yuk thought he was just a normal boy, 
but one fateful day, a group of kids starts bad-mouthing his parents in front of Juan Yak. This angers him so much that he eventually beats them all up. That's when he realized he could fight well. Everyone was soon on their knees begging for mercy, but now he finally gets scared as a man pounds on his bloody face. He taps on the Great Khan's arm and tells him that he has won. He admits defeat and he'll never mess with the Sorak High students ever again. The Great Khan stops pounding on Wan Yuk and asks his employers what he should do. The Sorak High students give him a thumbs up and tell him that his job is done. However, the Great Khan speaks up and shares his opinions. For him, punks like Wan Yuk never say sorry and mean it. Once he's back to 100%, he'll start to stir up trouble again. Thus, the Great Khan promises for a small fee that he'll ensure that his employers will be safe until they graduate. With this statement, Wanyo can't help but cry about what's coming ahead. In a dark corner of some construction site, a gangster holds down Wanyo as the Great Chan prepares to mangle his hand beyond repair. At the side, Hyeonju is quivering in the corner, brought along by the goons to keep his mouth shut. Wanyo and he never spoke a word to one another until all this, but his hierarchy system of brawls had made Hyeonju's life hell for three years. But with the scene playing out in front of him this time, he can't help but yell at the gangsters to let him go. With his yell, he throws his body over Guan Yok, protecting him from the boot about to stomp on his hand. The Great Khan asks him to move, and when he doesn't, he starts beating him up instead. Guan Yok himself can't understand why Hyeonju is protecting him when they didn't really know each other. Meanwhile, the beating had elevated Hyeonju's heart rate tracked by his watch and sent a report to no other than Hua Jin. A while later, the Great Khan himself is amazed at Hyeonju, since he's still standing up even though he's been beating on him for 10 whole minutes. He asks him why he's doing this when he's clearly not friends with Guan Yok, but Hyeonju explains that there are still limits. At that moment, Wei Jin finally arrives and faces the gangsters. Hyeonju explains what's happening to him, which is further reinforced when the gangsters threaten Hua Jin. In response, Wei Jin quickly takes two of them down exclaiming that he's thrilled to be fighting adults since he can finally let off some steam. Since the Great Chan knows that Puijin is a good fighter based on how he defeated his two companions earlier, he pulls out a knife. However, Puijin loses his smile and tells him to put it away. If he doesn't, then he'd have to treat this as a battle, not a brawl. The Great Chan doesn't listen to him and charges him with the knife instead. Thus, Puijin gets into a stance and swats the knife away. He swats all his attacks and disarms the Great Chan. He then delivers a punch and sweeps him off his feet at the same time. As Huijin pounds on his face, the Great Chan realizes that Huijin is probably one of those people who knows martial arts designed for special forces, Krav Maga. The Great Khan hugs Huijin's feet and begs him not to kill him. He promises to stop being a gangster anymore, but when Huijin still doesn't stop, he apologizes and begs Hyeonju instead to stop him, promising to pay him a lot of money. This makes Huijin stop and tells him that what he's doing is correct not paying people but apologizing to the people he hurt. Afterward, Weijin lets him go. After he's gone, Weijin approaches the beat-up Waniyak and tells him that how the Great Khan acted is how he's been acting the whole time in school. The next day, Weijin formally left Guan Tech. Thus, the auto and electric department banded together to do what they promised to do once he left, the execution of their king, Hyeonju. However, Waniyak suddenly barges in on their gathering, and tells everyone that whoever lays a finger on his friend Hyeonju will answer to him. Everyone leaves the gym, confused as to why Guan Yeok is suddenly defending Hyeonju. Meanwhile, Guan Yeok is remembering the lesson Hui Jin taught him last night. He was using his muscles to crush people weaker than him, and he was never going to learn unless he first learned what it was like to be on the other side. Hui Jin then tells him that if the thugs weren't there, he would have done the same thing to Hui Jin to make him realize this. And thanks to Hyeonju, it didn't escalate. Most people would have just sat there and watched him lose his hand, but Hyeonju put his life on the line to protect him. Wajin tells Guan Yok that people aren't measured by their strength, but by their character. And if Guan Yok still doesn't learn that, then he'll be back to teach his lesson again. Thus, Guan Yok saves Hyeonju from his execution and walks away. Before he leaves, he clarifies to Hyeonju that he didn't save him as payback for saving him last night, but because Hyeonju looked awesome last night, after that day, Hyeonju was able to graduate without getting bullied anymore. Won Yeok didn't get in a single fight for the rest of his time in high school and instead focused on preparing and training for his future. Each of them went their own separate ways. Ten years later, they even ended up working side by side at the same automotive company.
Back in the present, Weijin had just come back to the Ministry of Education, but what was waiting for him was a stack of reports. Gang Suk explains to him that even when the nation is still on the fence about corporal punishment, it seems like requests for help just keep coming in. Wajin reads one report and is surprised at the chaos unfolding in just one school. The school is Soyeon High School for Girls. Wajin is on the fence about going to a girls' school, but Gang Suk explains that he knew this was going to happen. Thus, he already scouted a capable woman for the job, and enters their new recruit, Shjit. Hanrim Aim, Wajin is taken aback because he recognized her from his military days. At the same time, Hanrim last as she gets to work again with her team leader who went MIA. Meanwhile, in Soyeon High, a teacher is getting bullied by his students. One girl waves an electric razor at his hair wanting to shave his head. The teacher tries to fight back, but the girl just laughs and tells him that touching her has very great consequences. The faculty members of Soyeon High are shocked when their co-teacher enters with his hair shaved and cut short. They already know who the culprits are, but the law stops them from doing anything. One teacher observes that the students are getting bolder after the incident, but another teacher quickly shushes him since one of their co-workers is still traumatized by it. The teacher they were talking about is Miss Sun Young, who was lifelessly preparing for her next class. Miss Sun Young enters her classroom and tells the students to open their textbooks, but no one heeds her. To the students of Sien Hai, she is a ghost. Meanwhile, Hui Jin and Han Rim are catching up with each other's lives, with Hui Jin complaining that he didn't recognize her since she dyed her hair red. They then went separate ways with Hanrim going to her new assignment as a new teacher in Soyeon High. She's assigned to be Miss Sun Young's assistant who just warned her to keep her head down. When Miss Sun Young tried to introduce Hanrim to her class, Hanrim was astonished to notice that the class was using a stonewalling tactic to ostracize Miss Sun Young. Whoever breaks the tactic will be made the next target, so every student is forced to play along. Only one person can break it, the ringleader, and just as she expected, a haughty-looking girl named Yuri raises her hand and compliments Hanrim's hair. Yuri then implied that Hanrim probably had plastic surgery, and following her lead, the other students started piling veiled insults at Hanrim. However, instead of following Miss Sun Young's advice to keep a low profile, Hanrim retorts back at the students with insults of her own. Thus, the class ends with the students annoyed at their new teacher, and Yuri wickedly smiling promising to have fun playing with Hanrim. Outside the school building, Miss Sun Young scolds Hanrim for not following her advice, when Hanrim tries to defend herself by stating that students shouldn't be disrespectful to their teachers, Miss Sun Young tells her that she doesn't know what she's talking about and that she doesn't know how wicked kids are these days. At that moment, Hanrim notices a flower pot falling right on top of them, and she pulls Miss Sun Young out of the way. She then quietly whispers to Miss Sun Young that she is aware and that she's sent by the TRPA. As they gaze up above to where Hanrim is standing from the place where the flower pot came from, Hanrim asks Miss Sun Yang to tell her what happened at their school. Miss Sun Yang explains that in the past, the original homeroom teacher of her class was a teacher named Mr. Yang Su. Mr. Yang Su believed that there are no bad students and always saw the best in everyone. However, his trouble started when he got Yeri in his class. One day, Mr. Yang Su confronted Yeri after he found Yeri smoking cigarettes. Yeri tried to deny it, but Mr. Yang Su told her he would let it go as long as she promised to stop. Yeri did with a smile on her face. However, the next day, the principal told Mr. Yang Su that someone reported him to be flirting with his underage student. Thus, the school was forced to dismiss him. Unable to bear the fact that a student would accuse him and how others now see him, Mr. Yang Su ultimately took his own life. In an interrogation, a student who was Yeri's friend confessed that she was the one who reported him because she heard him and Yeri flirting in the classroom, so she reported it. Yeri, however, explains that she and Mr. Yang Su were just joking around. It was their MO to pretend something was a joke or a misunderstanding so they could wipe their conscience clean. Back in the present, Hanrim enters her classroom to find the students surprising her with a cake as an apology for their bad behavior. They asked her to blow out the candles, but when she leaned over, they tried to push the cake to her face. Hanrim's quickly reacted and sends the cake flying over to Yeri's head. Yeri's head starts to bleed and she threatens to report Hanrim. Hanrim, however, just looks at her and quickly slams her head into the table. She asks her why there were hidden razors in the blades. She then finally reveals that she's from the TRPA. Later, Hanrim is letting off some steam in her gym when Weijin arrives to ask her how her mission's doing. 
Wajin is about to give her some advice, but Hanram tells him that he can just leave it to her. After all, she also went to a girl's high school before, so she knows how girls like Yuri think. At school, Yuri's friends are freaking out that the TRPA is at their school. Yuri advises them to just act like usual since according to her research, the TRPA only stays around two weeks at their assigned school. In the meantime, she texts everyone that they're going to ignore Hanrim for those two weeks. Unfortunately for her, Hanrim is standing right behind her and tells her that it's up to the discretion of the TRPA warden on how long they plan to stay. She then confiscates Yeri's phone and her classmates. Not only that but during classes, every teacher calls on Yeri to answer their questions which infuriates her to no end. She screams out why she's being ganged on when she clearly doesn't know the answers but Hanrim watching from the back answers why she seems to be so proud of being stupid. Yuri walks up to her and asks if she has any evidence that she messed with the teachers in the first place. Hanrim in response forces her to kneel and asks her if she has any evidence herself that the teachers are ganging up on her. She then announces a new rule every time someone misbehaves, the whole class gets punished. Later, the girls are in the bathroom complaining about how they must live for two weeks under Hanrim's tyranny. An idea comes into Yeri's head and she starts slapping her friend. With her friend's face now black and blue, she tells her to call her mother and report that Hanrim had hurt them. Later, a mother barge into the room and slaps Hanrim. She starts berating her for hurting her daughter and that she'll get her fired. However, Hanrim calmly just slaps her back and tells her that she can complain all she wants to the Minister of Education. In the back, Yeri is infuriated that Hanrim can't be stopped. Ten days later, Miss Sunan observes that Yeri had changed. Of course, she didn't submit to Hanrim's authority right away and even continued her mastermind plans. After their phones got banned, Yuri tried to pass out her plans using notes. But when Hanrim caught them, she made all the second-year students do punishments in the yard. One day, Yuri is in the bathroom annoyed that all her plans are getting foiled by Hanrim. While there, she overhears the other students complaining not about the Hanrim, but about her. They resent Yeri for causing so much trouble that the TRPA is now at their school and is making their lives a living hell. In the blink of an eye, all the students at the school started to blame Yeri for the TRPA's methods and Yeri, who had once ruled the school like its queen had become lower than dirt. In Hanrim's next meeting with Weijin, she reports that her job might end soon, but Weijin reminds her to be careful since if Yeri's really that easy to break, then the school wouldn't have called the TRPA in the first place. Meanwhile, Miss Sun Young is walking home thinking how maybe Yeri can really change for the better. When she reaches her house, she sees Yeri crying by her front door. She's asking for Miss Sun Young's help and how to apologize to her friends. Miss Sun Young remembers her predecessor, Mr. Young Su's words that all students can change, and she helps Yeri enter her house to talk. However, just as she opens the door, Yeri suddenly grabs her by the head and pushes her inside. Yeri's accomplice then shows up, and they start interrogating Miss Sun Young. They know that on the TRPA's website, anyone can submit anonymous tips, which means that they had to be tipped off by someone to come to their school. Yeri believes that Miss Sun Young is the one who tattled to the TRPA and her friends pull out some box cutters and scissors to threaten Miss Sun Young. Miss Sun Young realizes that Mr. Yang Su is wrong, and it seems that there are students who really are monsters. Suddenly, someone bangs on Miss Sun Young's door. It was her neighbor complaining about all the noises in the apartment. Yeri shouts at the neighbor to mind her own business, but the neighbor answers and calls Yeri by name to open the door. It was Hanrim, and if they didn't let her in that instant, she'd break the door down and make them regret it for the rest of their lives. A few weeks ago, it turns out that Hanrim moved to Miss Sun Young's apartment complex after receiving her assignment at their school. She explains that she needed a place to stay while working, and it happened to be close to the school. It's only a coincidence that they became neighbors. But the truth was Hanrim and Weijin both know that when students like Yeri failed in trying to trouble Hanrim, they would probably target the one who ratted on them in the first place. And that is most probably the person she thinks she was cruelest to. In this case, this was Miss Sun Young, and that's why Hanrim moved in right next to her. Back in the present, Hanrim starts counting down to force Yeri to open the door. Meanwhile, her friends are shocked and panicking about what they should do. Miss Sun Young looks at Yeri, and tells her that she's willing to tell Hanrim that she invited her over for counseling and they can just pretend that the whole thing never happened. All Yeri needs to do is open the door. However, Yeri just creepily smiles at her and believes that this only confirms that Miss Sun Young was the one who ratted on her. She grabbed the box cutter knife from her unsuspecting friend and tried to stab Miss Sun Young with it. 
Thankfully, her friend quickly tackled her and asked her what she was doing. They were planning to just threaten Miss Simyang, not hurt her. In response, Yeri swipes the knife and wounds her friend in the arm. Miss Simyang immediately goes to help the injured student while Yeri's other friend quickly opens the door and lets Hanrim in. Seeing Hanrim, Yeri quickly dashes to the balcony and jumps out. She tries to run away while Hanrim jumps after her. Yeri spots a couple of policemen walking around and she quickly runs over to them and cries out that a woman is trying to kill her. She pretends to cry, prompting the police officers to protect her and confront Hanrim. Hanrim tries to explain that she's a teacher, but she can't show them any ID. Meanwhile, Yeri is smiling at her from behind the policemen's backs. She runs away again and Hanrim was forced to dodge the police officers and run right after her. Back in the apartment, Miss Sun Young performed first aid on the injured student. She then asks them if Yeri had always been this way. The student narrates that Yeri used to be a good kid. She was smart, outgoing, and popular. That is, until that one incident in middle school. Meanwhile, Hanrim manages to catch up with Yeri on a rooftop and confronts her for the crime she just did. However, instead of finally giving up, Yeri had another idea, a way to truly end Hanrim and the TRPA. Yeri chose to fall back out of the rooftop and into the streets below. After Yeri's classmates finish narrating the incident that caused her bad behavior, Miss Sunyang is stunned by what she had just heard. She cannot believe that a teacher could really do such a thing. It turns out it was all because of Yeri's ninth grade homeroom teacher, Sangyeol Chien. Back at the rooftop, Yeri is about to throw herself off the roof, and Hanrim rushes in to stop her. She jumps after Yeri, catches her, and then grabs hold of an air conditioner jutting out of the side of the building to stop their fall. However, Yeri starts wriggling in her grasp and forces them to fall again. Hanrim absorbs the impact, causing her to cough up blood. Yeri smiles and starts beating her up. Meanwhile, Miss Simyang and Yeri's friends go out to look for them. Yeri spies a brick lying on the ground and she picks it up. She plans to bash it down on Hanrim's head, but Miss Sunyoung arrives and restrains her. She tells Yeri that she already knows what happened to her in ninth grade, but that trauma doesn't make murdering anyone okay. Yeri backhands her in the face and retorts that since she already knows everything, then she should know that she hates hypocritical teachers like her most of all. She is about to throw the brick at Miss Sunyoung, but Hanrim stops her. Hanrim punches her and Yeri kneels in front of her, begging to be let go. The police officers show up again and Yeri begged them to help her. Hanrim shows this to Miss Sunyoung and points out that Yeri cannot be fixed. Thus, Miss Sunyoung filled the police in on everything, from Yeri breaking into her home to how she caused the bullying in school. Their conspiracy of them framing Mr. Go was also found on Yeri's phone and Yeri's friends confessed to it too. A few days later, Yeri is awaiting trial at the Juvenile Classification Review Center. Hanrim visits her and shows her that the people who reported her to the TRPA were students furious over Mr. Go's death. In fact, Miss Sunyang never reported her. Hanrim tells her that she knows what Sang Yul Chien did to her, so she knows why Yeri became so twisted. But being traumatized doesn't excuse one for becoming a criminal. Nevertheless, Hanrim promises Yeri that they'll make Chien pay. In a school somewhere, a teacher wipes the windowsill with his finger to check it for dust. When his finger comes up dirty, he scolds the boy he assigned to clean it and jams his finger at his mouth. The boy coughs but the teacher orders him to swallow it out since that dust is his responsibility. The teacher's name is Sang Yul Chien. The next day, a student gives Mr. Chien a gift in appreciation for the guidance he gave to her. Mr. Chien only accepts the letter, not the gift, and tells the girl that his door is always open to his students. His co-teachers compliment him for being a good teacher, while Mr. Chien secretly opens the letter which was full of cash. Suddenly, Huijin barges in with the principal trying to stop him. The principal assures Huijin that they have no problem students so there's no reason for the TRPA to be there but Weijin states that he's just responding to a report they received. In class, the boy that Mr. Chien was bullying earlier, Hyun Wong Choi, is now dutifully studying when a bully steps on his books and tells him to start cleaning. The bully asks him why he's studying when his trash collector grandpa won't be able to afford college anyway. Choi calmly rebutted him earlier, but the insult to his grandpa sends him into a rage. Meanwhile, Weijin is accompanying Mr. Chien to his class. Mr. Chien mentions that he's actually a supporter of the TRPA's methods since he believes that some students are garbage and need a few hits to come to their senses. He then enters the classroom and witnesses the bully beating up Choi. 
The bully informs him that he was just telling Choi to start cleaning up when Choi suddenly hit him. Choi tries to explain himself, but Mr. Chien just orders him to apologize. He tells Choi that the offspring of a trash collector can't even follow orders and now is being violent. The additional insult to his grandpa enrages Choi, and he grabs Mr. Chien by the collar. He aims his fist at Mr. Chien and asks him why he's always bullying him. Out of nowhere, Weijin holds back Choi's fist aimed at Mr. Chien. The class erupts in gossip upon seeing Weijin, while Mr. Chien thanks Weijin for stopping Choi. However, Weijin just whispers to Choi to tighten his fists, and he helps him punch Mr. Chien. He tells Mr. Chien that he's the garbage teacher for calling his students trash. A few days later, Hanrum delivers some information about Yeri to Weijin. From this information, they determine that before she met Mr. Chien, Yeri maintained a top 10 rank at school. Her father raised her on her own, but his job made him absent throughout Yeri's life. From this, Kuajin shares that Mr. Chien is currently doing the same thing to another honor student who's also in a bad family situation, Hyun Won Choi. They then see some teachers slapping students who tried to sneak out of school. It seems that Huajin's presence had emboldened the other teachers to exercise corporal punishment again. Huajin sighs in annoyance since everyone seems to have some misconceptions about the TRPA. Meanwhile, Mr. Chien is wondering who reported him to the TRPA. He notices his co-teacher, Ms. Kang, hitting a student for being unable to answer a question. Outside, the gym teacher is harassing the female students and using the TRPA as an excuse. It looks like teachers from all over the school are punishing their students for little mistakes, whether it's due to long hair or not listening to class. Unbeknownst to them, Weijin is watching them jotting down their names in a notebook. Later, Weijin summons the teachers he listed into the gymnasium and presents them with their new clothes. He announces that their teaching methods are flawed, so starting now, they will be stripped of their positions and will be students instead. Ms. Kang tells him he should be protecting their rights, not taking them away. However, Huajin answers back that he's there not only to protect the instructor's right to teach, but also the student's right to learn. He then happily warns them that if they don't want to follow his orders, then they'll just get disciplinary action from the minister. Thus, the teachers have no choice but to don their new student uniforms. Later, Mr. Chien introduces himself to his new classmates, which was the class he was formerly teaching. The students giggle at his new look and Choi hands him a rag and tells him that he's got cleaning duty. Classes proceed as normal in the school, except now Mr. Chien is learning beside Choi and the other students. During lunch, Weijin notices Mr. Chien glaring at Choi, so he joins him at his table and asks him why he's discriminating against Choi. Mr. Chien, however, just denies his accusation and walks away. Later, Mr. Chien meets up with the bully, Guan Sik, and angrily asks him why Choi still seems to be okay. He had ordered Guan Sik to crush his spirit before midterms rolled around. Wansik explains that Choi is tougher than he looks, and he's not doing it anymore since the TRPA is watching. Mr. Chien suggests doing the bullying outside the school, but Wansik just annoyingly walks away. Before he can leave, Chien stops him and offers him something he cannot refuse. Meanwhile, Huijin was watching them from atop the building. Outside the school, Choi's grandpa is dutifully collecting trash as part of his job. He didn't notice that a couple of thugs wearing masks were watching him from a distance. Meanwhile, Mr. Chien is meeting with one of his students' mothers. The mother is worried that her daughter's rank is not high enough, but Mr. Chien assures her that one of the high-ranking kids, Choi, is surely dropping in rank after the midterms. Outside, the thugs start messing with Choi's grandpa, spreading his collected trash and destroying his cart. When the grandpa tries to stop them, they just hit him in the face and are about to kick him some more. A little while later, Choi is walking home from school when he notices his grandpa pulling his cart. He quickly runs to him and offers to help but he suddenly notices his grandpa's face full of bruises. Choi asks his grandpa if someone messed with him again, but his grandpa assures him that someone actually helped him fight off against the group of thugs. It was Guansik and his friends who were the thugs in masks earlier. Weijin is now lecturing them, and he asks Guansik what Mr. Chien could have possibly offered him for him to do such a horrible thing. Meanwhile, Mr. Chien is offering a USB flash drive with a copy of the midterms exam to his student's mother. At the same time, Weijin also confiscates another flash drive from Guansik. Weijin finally realizes Mr. Chien's modus operandi. He targets smart students coming from broken families so they can't say anything if something happens and then brings down their grades so other students who paid him can increase their own rank. With his evidence secured, 
Weijin smiles as he prepares to go to school Mr. Qian. Weijin and Hanrim are at Hanrim's gym discussing Mr. Qian's crimes. Hanrim shares that if they surrender the flash drive to the police, it will spell the end of Mr. Qian's teaching career. However, Huijin objects to this plan since Mr. Qian would end up only being punished for leaking the exam. Huijin wants him to punish him for everything he's done wrong instead. Later at school, Huijin gives the teachers their own midterm exam. If they fail, they will be dismissed from their jobs. They have one week to earn points by doing good deeds, but the largest part of the exam is to get the signature of forgiveness from the students they tormented. This proves to be difficult since the students are now taking revenge on their teachers for all the corporal punishments they gave out. Because they needed their signature, the teachers couldn't fight back. As for Mr. Qian, he must get the signature of both Guan Sik and Choi. He first approaches Guan Sik and asks him for his signature and progress report on his task. As a response, Guan Sik just punches him in the face and berates him for making him do horrible stuff. He starts beating Qian up, and as a signature, he burns through Qian's midterm paper with his cigarette. Weijin, who was watching again from the rooftop, congratulates him for the one signature. Later, the teachers clean up the school as part of their midterm exams. Qian is wondering what caused Wan Sik's change in attitude, but his thoughts get interrupted when trash suddenly starts raining from above. All the students are throwing trash out the window while chanting at them to resign. The next morning, one of the teachers, Ms. Kang, passes her letter of resignation to Huijin. She admits that the kids don't want her around anymore, which is proof of how much she mistreated them. She's still going to ask their forgiveness, but she realizes she doesn't deserve to teach them anymore. She is about to leave, but Huijin stops her and tells her that all her students actually signed her exam already, showing that they already forgave her. Huijin then encourages the other teachers to do their best too to earn their students' forgiveness. Thus, Qin is now kneeling in front of Choi asking for his forgiveness. He even offers to resign, but deep inside, he hopes that Choi doesn't ask for that. Choi, however, just retorts back that he can do whatever he wants. He had decided that he wouldn't let a piece of trash like Qian affect his life anymore. Qian spends the next few days trying to get Choi to forgive him. Qian offers him some burgers in the hope of getting into his good side, but Choi just plugs his ears with earphones and completely ignores him. Qian goes out and throws the bag away, annoyed at Choi's attitude. Huijin arrives and then warns him that he and the gym teacher are the only teachers left who haven't passed the exam. And unfortunately, they only have one day left. Qian gets home annoyed, but his mood instantly lifts when his eight-year-old daughter calls him. His daughter asks him for some money, and not wanting to disappoint her, Qian promises to send it tomorrow. Later that night, Huijin finds Qian waiting for him on the way to his home. He walks past Qian who instantly tells him he doesn't have to forgive him, instead he's ready to make a deal. They'll give him the midterm exam papers as well as ensure his rank and graduation as long as Choi signs Qian's forgiveness midterms. Unfortunately, Choi just flicks the flash drive back at Qian and continues walking away. Left with no choice, Qian grabs Choi and forces Choi's finger to stamp on the paper. A voice suddenly scolds him from behind, and it was Hui Jin again watching them. Huajin kicks Qian in the face and tells Choi to go back home. Qian begs Huajin to let him go, telling him about his family and daughter. But Huajin points out that now, he's just apologizing for his own sake, not for the people he hurt. Nevertheless, Huajin is still giving him one last chance. If he passes this test, then he'll let Qian go. Qian is elated at this, but Huajin suddenly calls out to a girl, and it was Yeri wearing her felon attire. Qian tries to amicably speak to Yeri, but she just plants her shoe in his face. While Weijin watches, Yeri pummeled Qian for everything he had done to her. In the past when she was in middle school, Qian forced her to clean their classroom even though it was the day before the midterms. Her classmates also relentlessly bullied her, to the point that they cut all her hair off. When Qian sees her, Qian just insults her some more. One day while working as a waitress, Yeri received the news that she didn't even get admitted to her dream school because of her bad grades from Qian. Her co-workers console her and Yeri tries to go back to work. That's when she saw her classmates, who she knew had lower grades than her in the past, now celebrating their acceptance to their dream school thanks to Qian. Yeri then realized that she was sacrificed by Qian because the other girls paid him. That was the moment she promised herself that she would never let a teacher take advantage of her ever again. Yeri picks up a large stone and holds it up against Qian. She is about to bash it down on him when Weijin speaks up and asks her if she wants a murder charge added to her crimes. No one would stop her if she did. 
Yuri freezes, and Chien quickly flees but ends up falling down a flight of stairs. Yuri yells at Huijin that she doesn't care anymore since she already has a record. But Huijin answers that it doesn't really matter. What matters is the stain in Yuri's heart with the name of his old teacher who died because of her, Yang Sugo. Huijin points out that she knows what it feels like to be wronged by someone, yet Mr. Go's family must be experiencing the same thing a hundredfold. Murdering Qian now would mean she doesn't really deserve a chance at a proper life, but if Yuri really wants a fresh start, she should beg Mr. Go's family for forgiveness. A few days later, the news reports about a teacher who has been receiving bribes to boost students' rankings. In order to do so, the said teacher not only leaked test answers, but also sabotaged excelling students from rough backgrounds. One of his victims is Yuri Han, who had just recently been jailed for causing a teacher's wrongful death. Now Yuri is writing letters to her victim's family, not asking to be forgiven, but just to say sorry. Hanrum compliments Huajin for not only bringing Qian to justice, but also getting Yuri to reflect on her actions at the same time. Three months later, Yuri receives a letter while in jail. It was from Mr. Go's wife telling her that she doesn't need to send any more letters. Although she still cannot forgive Yuri, Mr. Go would have seen how sincerely she had reflected and would have forgiven her already. Thus, she just needs to live a good and honest life, and that is already a genuine atonement for Mr. Go. Yuri cries as she hugs those caring words. Inside a train, a group of middle schoolers is loudly telling stories to each other when an old man stops in front of them and asks them to let him sit. The one in the middle stands up seemingly to let the old man sit, but he instead bumps into him, causing him to fall. The kid then steals the old man's cane and insults him in his face. The other passengers started whispering to each other, urging someone to call the police. However, the kid just flips them off and tells them that even if they call the police, he's 14 so he isn't going away. Meanwhile, Hanram tells Huijin that her stay in the TRPA would be extended after her commanding officer learned that he and the Minister of Education, Gang Sook, were alumni of the same school. Over a round of drinks, they decided that Hanram would be staying in the TRPA for the indefinite future. On the other side of the city, the kids from earlier are now bullying another kid named Sehun, uncaring about their trending video of bullying the old man from earlier. Their leader, Hyun Chiol, points out that the police can't do anything to them anyway since they are minors. After practicing their boxing on Sehun, the group leaves, looking for the next thing to do. One of them suggests going to the beach after seeing one of their classmates post a picture on the beach. Unfortunately, they have no money to get there. That's when Hyanchil spots a car and gets an idea. Wajin and Hanrim are driving to their next assignments when another car abruptly swerves in front of them. Wajin sees that kids were driving and tells Hanrim that they should follow them. Someone seems to need schooling. According to Korea's law, those aged 10 to 14 that commit a crime are examined as a juvenile protection case. In other words, no matter what they do, they will not receive a criminal penalty. This includes murder. Meanwhile, Sehun stands up from where Hyunchil had beaten him up, with rage all over his face. In the streets of the city, Hyunchil and his friends continue dragging their stolen car, almost hitting pedestrians, and end up colliding with another car and into a pole. They quickly try to make a run for it, but Weijin and Hanrim catch them. Hanrim asks if they should take them to the police, but the kids just laugh and tell them to go ahead so they can just get away for free. Huajin realizes that they are right and instead asks them where their school is. In Hyanjin Middle School, Sehun is once again getting beat up. Through this whole ordeal, he just keeps thinking that in 13 days, he'll be 15 and he will be of criminal liability age. Sehun finally gets knocked down and the kid cheers the bully. Another kid, Juwon Min, sits on his head and smokes a cigarette. Juwon asks where his henchman, Hyanjil, is and leaves to go find him. Meanwhile, Sehun stands up from behind ji and glares at him. Within the 13 days that he didn't get a criminal penalty, he had promised himself that he'll murder ji Min. Sehun pulls out a knife and is about to stab ji but another kid abruptly shows up. Sehun hides his knife while the new kid informs them that they should go to the second floor. They hurriedly go there and to their surprise, it was Huanjin leading Hyun Chiel and the others who are now wearing handcuffs and a sign dangling from their necks, stating that they are thieves. Later that night, Ju Wong and his friends are talking about the scene made by Hui Jin earlier. They are worried about what the TRPA might do to them, especially if Si Hoon rats them out. However, Ju Wong scolds them for being afraid and points out that they are just 13 years old. That means they are invincible. They can easily take care of Hui Jin if they want. 
Juwon's friends are shocked by his statements, and they point out that even Guwon Tech, one of the trashiest schools in the country, got schooled by Hua Jin. Meanwhile, one of their friends who was browsing her phone starts screaming in happiness and shows them the expensive shoes that she wants. She laments that they are too poor to buy them, but Ju Wong suddenly has an idea. Ju Wong then leads his friends to the supermarket. There he quickly breaks the glass door and tells his friends that he also just wants the shoes. They all put on some masks and started ransacking the place. They steal some cigarettes they plan to sell as well as the cash from the register. One of them sees a phone and asks if they should steal that too. However, the phone's presence makes Juwon realize that someone must be there, and he quickly shouts at them to run. Unfortunately for him, he bumps into the supermarket owner, a big guy who has 20 years of experience weightlifting at the gym. Juwon hits the guy in the face, but the man just hits him back. The man then orders them to not move as he calls the police. In answer, Juwon just smirks. Later at the police station, the kids are casually taking pictures while the supermarket owner talks with the police officer. The police officer knows them, pointing out that they're habitual criminals. Unfortunately, they just call the kids' guardians and release them when they arrive. The owner is dumbfounded at this, so the police officer explains that they cannot do anything since they are just minors. The police officer then asks him if he hit the kids and the owner admits that he did after they hit him. Nevertheless, the police officer told him that he needed to write a report. Meanwhile, the kids are just posting selfies on the internet about their escapades at the police station. Their guardians then arrived and to their surprise, it was Huajin who came to pick them up. Outside, the kids thank Huajin for bailing them out and proceed to leave. Huajin tells them to stop and follow him, but Jiwon just flips him off. They start to run, forcing Huajin to chase after them. When he rounds a corner in pursuit of them, a blade almost catches him in the face. Thankfully, he dodges the blade wielded by Ji Wong. Ji Wong smiles at him and asks him if he actually murdered someone else before. Ji Wong points the knife at Hui Jin and nonchalantly threatens to stab him if he starts messing with their school. Ji Wong charges at him with a knife, but Hui Jin just pulls out a pair of handcuffs from his pocket, dodges Ji Wong, and clamps the handcuffs on him. Seeing their leader easily captured and blindfolded, the other kids flee but some well-placed strikes from Hanram also knock them out cold. Wedgen then tells the kids that they are all under arrest on charges of attempted theft and murder. The blindfolded kids have no idea where they are being taken as they hear them being transported outside the city. The girls were dropped off in a separate place while the boys were dropped off in another place. When they finally remove their blindfolds, what welcomes the kids are the scenes of inmates watching them from a barbed fence while a guard guides them inside. They have been brought to Jinchen Youth Detention Center. After they were processed, Jiwon and his friends were thrown into a room where a large inmate welcomed them as newbies. They recognized that the inmate was currently using their friend Han Chiol as a backrest. The inmate orders them to recite their crimes one by one while Ji Wong smiles as he realizes that the whole thing is just a show. They didn't even go through a trial so there's no way he's in jail. Wajin is probably just making them all scared with a visit to a prison in the hopes that they will learn a lesson. When the inmate tries to question Ji Wong about what his crimes are, he stays silent. His insubordination causes the inmates to go close to his face and threaten him, but Ji Wong knows that they can't hurt him anyway since they aren't real prisoners. He just stares and smirks at the inmate, but a sudden punch to the face destroys all this. Another inmate had stood up and slammed him into the wall. Ji Wong looks at the inmate and the guy seems familiar to him. The inmate then knees him in the groan and tells him that the youth detention has rules. If someone is unruly, their sentence is longer. But even if he murders Ju Wong, his sentence will be the same because he already has the maximum penalty. This awakens Ju Wong's memory, and he finally remembers where he saw the man. One year ago, he was in the news for murdering seven people. Yet he was smiling when the cops arrested him. He is Ma Jiam, the murderer, and he tells Ju Wong that in this prison, no laws can protect him. While Ju Wong is getting his rude awakening in another prison called Cheonju Women's Prison, the delinquent girls Huajin dropped off are now being treated as slaves in their jail cell. Their crying and incessant whining annoys the leader of the cell, Yuri Han. Jiwon had always been sent to youth detention centers a few times in the past. However, he never considered it that bad if he went there from time to time. He has no criminal record, and he gets to have a vacation. But in juvenile prison, everything was different. He is now being forced to do a handstand while the other inmates force rice into his mouth. When some rice trickles out of his mouth, Madhyam kicks him in the stomach and shouts at him to not spill rice. 
Their day starts at 8 a.m. as the guards make all the inmates line up. Even here, they aren't safe because the other inmates stab them with pens if they stand too close. At 3 p.m., they are allowed to go on a ride for physical education. They play games like foot volleyball, but it was in fact shooting the ball at their faces. At 4 p.m., they go inside for a shower. Jiwon can't help but stare at the scared and tattooed bodies of the others showering with him. But when one winks at him, it terrified him to his core. 7 p.m. was free time. This was the toughest part of the day. While the other inmates relax and read magazines, the newbies are forced to sit upright with their hands politely on their knees. When their posture isn't straight, they get pummeled by a plastic bottle filled with water. The plastic bottle is a unique weapon in prisons because it's soft and leaves no wound, so it doesn't show that one's been hit. Jiwoon notices that a guard was passing by as the inmate beats them up with the plastic bottle, but the guard just looked at them and left. Jiwoon believes he's in the worst prison in the whole of Korea. Later that night, while everyone is sleeping, Jiwoon ponders how long he still has to endure this hell. It's been five days, but there seems to be no sign of stopping. His vision suddenly gets obscured when Magyum steps on his face on his way to the bathroom. While he's busy, Jiwoon pulls out a pen and holds it against Magyum's neck. He starts interrogating Magyum on what he knows about how long they have to stay here. After all, the TRPA must be working with them. However, Magyum just elbows him in the stomach and then steps on his head when he falls to the ground. Megium asks him what the TRPA is and if it's about the guy who brought them here. If it is, they can just directly ask him. At that moment, Huijin, wearing a guard's uniform, slams on their cell door and asks them what all the ruckus is all about. Huijin enters their jail cell and Ji Wung yells at him to let them out since they already had enough. He threatens to sue Huijin for sending minors to prison. In response, Huijin just hits him on the head with his guard baton, knocking him out. He scolds him for yelling in the prison, and Magyum points out that yelling at a guard is grounds for being sent into the punishment chamber. When Juwon was younger, there was a noisy cat outside their apartment. Annoyed at it, Juwon threw an ashtray at it from their balcony, but he accidentally murdered someone instead. He was mortified at this, afraid that he'll be sentenced to death by the police. However, they just let him go. That's when he learned that under the Juvenile Act, Children under the age of 14 are incapable of criminal responsibility. That's the moment he started abusing his position as a kid and started doing all kinds of illegal stuff. But now back in the present, Juwon wakes up in a very small room. He realizes that he must have been sent to solitary confinement. At first he was relieved to be out of the reach of Magyum and his fellow inmates. But as time went by, his mind slowly unraveled as he could not tell the time and he feels like he was suffocating in the small room. He pounds on the door asking to be returned, and that's when Huijin enters his cell. Huijin puts a pen and paper in front of him and tells him that if he can write why he thinks they were put there, then they'll be let go. Ji Wong is elated at this, and Huijin leaves him to it. Ji Wong smiles since he knows he just has to pretend to regret everything he's done, and Huijin will let them go. Thus he starts writing the most pathetic and miserable apology he can, and he deeply reflects on what he learned. When Huijin comes back to read it, Huijin, however, just blows his nose on his paper and tells him to do it again. Jiwon goes back to writing, making it sound more desperate and without his ego, but every time he passes it, Huijin just rejects it. Jiwon couldn't handle it anymore and tried to attack Huijin. So Huijin puts him in handcuffs and leaves him there like that for a day. The day passes with Jiwon in the most uncomfortable of positions, and he realizes prison really is hell. After eight days of solitary confinement, Juwoong's cell is now full of crumpled papers, but Huijin still rejects his latest submission. Huijin checks some of the crumpled paper on the ground, and he finally laughs upon reading it. He tells Juwoong why he's submitting random stuff when he had the right answer all along. He shows Juwoong what was written on one of his discarded drafts and tells him that's the real reason why he's there. Back in their original cell, Juwoong and his friends are changing into their normal clothes. Huijin opens the door and tells them that they are now released, and Ji Wong's friends can't help but cry tears of joy. Ji Wong was about to step out when Megyum called out to him and reminded him that he'll still be there for the next few years and that he'll be waiting for them again. A few hours later, Megyum is exercising in the yard when Huijin arrives and tells him he did well. On the bus back home, Ji Wong is remembering what he wrote in the paper that convinced Huijin to release them. He wrote there that he would rather die than go back to prison. Huijin explains that he knows human nature doesn't change in a couple of weeks, so he knows Ji Wong would never regret his mistakes. So instead, he opts to show the kids their future. 
Most of the inmates there were kids just like them who belittled the law and didn't realize the seriousness of their crimes. But doing crimes is addicting, so he knows that Jiwon must be already addicted. So the next time they do a crime, they will probably be sent there. Meanwhile, Madium shares with Huijin that he wishes the TRPA already existed back when he was still a student. If they did, then he probably wouldn't be forced to murder his bullies to protect his own life. He asks Huijin if now, everything would be better, and no one would be forced to murder their own bullies anymore. Back in the city, Sihun, who was still contemplating murdering Ju Mung, throws away his knife. After talking with Magyom, Weijin meets with another juvenile inmate who just came out of solitary confinement. He asks the inmate for his name, and the inmate answers that he is Ju Chil Cho, 20 years old. Weijin asks him if he remembers Di Yun Choi and Ju Xiol, upon hearing the name, bursts into laughter. He admits that he will never forget the feeling of beating her to death. Ju Chil shares the memory of beating Di Yun to death. According to him, it was May and he was sweating like a pig, but the school refused to turn on the air conditioner. Thus, he was about to ditch school, but his homeroom teacher blocked his way. She was shouting about something, but it was too hot to listen, so Ju Chil just started punching her. He even brags to Hui Jin that his punch that day was the best punch in his life. If only the school turned on the air conditioner, or his homeroom teacher didn't block him, then he wouldn't be in prison. That's why he insists to Hui Jin that it's not his fault. After hearing his confession, Hui Jin exits the prison and angrily tries to light his cigarette. When he fails, Gang Sok lights it for him and tells him that he thought Hui Jin would be arrested for murder on the spot. Hui Jin answers that the murderer is already being punished so he doesn't have to anymore. He also understands that even though the murderer is making fun of the victim in front of him, he could only clench his hand. He remembers how two years ago, Gangsok stopped his drinking and tells him that they'll be making an organization that disciplines those who hide behind juvenile law. They'll prevent anyone else from going through what they went through. Meanwhile, the world of sports is currently being taken by storm by two up-and-coming basketball players, Soyeon Kang and Jayeon Kang, the youngest national representatives in women's basketball. The sisters are currently attending Sun Yen High School. Soyeon Kang was the top scorer at the previous year's National Sports Festival, and Jayeon Kang recorded for most assists. Not only that, but Soyeon Kang also has more than 200,000 followers on social media with her model-like physique and outstanding beauty. After being interviewed by a news reporter, the basketball team finishes their practice, and the members thank their captain Soyeon. The siblings then head into the locker room, where in one of the lockers, they greet one of their members who they stuffed in a locker, a girl named Yunha. They tell Yunha that no matter how hard she tries, no one will help her. They don't know that they are the next target of Hanrim. Back in middle school, Yunha's height of 5 foot 8 inches brought her to the attention of their school's head coach. Back then, she played various sports like baseball, volleyball, and judo. But something happened that motivated her to choose basketball as her main sport. She was mesmerized by the shooting of Soyeon Kang, a sophomore from a nearby school. She wished to play on the same team as Soyeon someday. That's why when high school rolled around, she applied to the women's basketball high school, the one where Soyeon goes to. But like any sports team, her school life did not go smoothly. The freshmen get hazed for ridiculous reasons. But one of them, her roommate Jayeon, was exempted from hazing because she was the sister of Soyeon. Jayeon also used her position to order around Yuna. It came to a point that when Yuna denied doing her bidding, Jayeon threatened her with a box cutter, so Yuna retaliated with her judo. Unfortunately, hurting Soyeon's sister made her punishments much worse. No one passes her the ball anymore, the hazings became her responsibility, and she was always ordered to massage the others. Even when she became a second year, this did not change. While she's suffering, Jayeon and Soyeon are selected as the national team for the Asian Games. She tried to let the reporters know about their bullying when they came over, but she failed. And her last hope, the TRPA, did not even show up. She is about to hurt herself, but someone suddenly calls her over for their basketball practice. They enter the gym, but to their surprise, they have a new temporary coach with the name Hanrim Iam. However, Soyeon immediately picks on her due to her small height compared to theirs. Soyeon asks Hanrim if she can even handle them with her small physique, so Hanrim almost slaps her with the wooden sword she was holding. She tells Soyeon that she understands Soyeon just wants to take the lead, so she'll let her impertinence go, but she won't let it go next time. When their practice starts, Hanrim immediately notices that Yunha was exercising by herself while the others are playing basketball. 
She tries to tell her to join the game when Soyeon speaks up and advises Hanrim to leave Yunha alone since she has special instructions from their coach to improve her stamina. However, Hanrim doesn't budge and points out that she's been exercising for an hour straight, while Jayen is already drinking energy drinks after a few shots, so their sense of judgment clearly cannot be trusted. She orders Yunha to go join the game again, and this time, Soyeon puts her hand on Hanrim's shoulder and reminds her that she's just a temporary coach. Hanrim squeezes Soyeon's hand and points out that right now, she has the authority, so her orders are what matters. Hanrim then immediately passes a ball to Yuna, who easily makes a three-point shot. Meanwhile, Soyeon is glaring at them with her arm red from where Hanrim squeezed it. Later at the storage room, Jayen starts beating up Yuna for her audacity to hold a ball earlier. Soyeon also speaks up and tells Yunha that she must be tired. She smirks at her and advises her to quit the team, and if she does, they will stop bullying her. Yuna's mind immediately flashes back to when she tried to hurt herself, but now she was able to shoot the ball. She apologizes to Soyeon and tells her captain that she still wishes to play. Soyeon pulls Yunha by her hair and slams her by the door. She then orders the other team members to slam the door right at Yunha's hand to cripple her. The door quickly closes, but Hanrim stops it with her fist. She shouts at the whole team to get down and Soyeon tries to tell her that they were just playing a practical joke. She was just disciplining Yunha as their team captain. Hanrim doesn't listen to her excuses and punches her in the nose. She reminds Soyeon that she already warned her earlier. After Hanrim punches Soyeon, the other basketball members encircle Hanrim. With their height, they easily tower over her. Soyeon then reminds Hanrim that she can't handle them with her small physique. Soyeon's words just make Hanrim smile. Jayen makes the first blow by trying to slap Hanrim from behind. Hanrim dodges her and swipes one of the girl's legs under her, bringing the girl down. She then kicks another girl in the face and elbows Jayen in the chin. With everyone now down, Hanrim approaches Soyeon and slams her foot beside her legs. She then tells everyone that from now on, she'll manage everything. As her first order of business, Hanrim commands everyone to go home. Soyeon tries to protest and reminds her that the summer competition is soon, but Hanrim tells them that they can win it without having a training camp. Thus, the basketball team goes back to their normal routine of school and training. One of their training, Jayen makes the members squat for not taking their training seriously. When Yunha stumbles and Jayen tries to hit her again, Hanrim is there, stopping them. During their practice games, Soyeon and Yunha bump into each other, causing them both to fall. Yunha apologizes to Soyeon, but Hanrim shouts out that it was an offensive foul by the captain, so she shouldn't apologize. She also scolds the rest of the team for not allowing Yuna to join their practices when she had excellent defensive skills. Pent up with their irritation on Hanrim, the siblings edited a picture of Soyeon to add a bruise on her left cheek. Jayen then shares it on her social media to frame Hanrim as being an abusive coach. Hanrim even sees it on her own feed, but she just calls their attack cute. The post went viral on the internet. Even internet celebrities are making news about it. Jayen smiles at her successful public lynching of Hanrim, but the news didn't stop there. An anonymous informer also released screenshots of Jayen's messages about Yunha. In the messages, pictures of her bullying were shared and Jayen's use of rude language was revealed. Furthermore, graphics-related workers had also concluded that Soyeon's photos were edited and faked. Not only that, the news also revealed that their temporary coach is a member of the TRPA. Jayen shakes in her seat upon watching the news, but Hanrim arrives in her classroom and tells her that now all Jayen's secrets are out and they need to talk. Jayen tries to escape Hanrim by running out of her classroom. She runs past all the other students in their school, but all of them have already seen the news. They know that Jayen is a bully and that the TRPA had come for her. She also sees Yunha and her rage immediately fills up and she threateningly walks to her. But before she can do anything, a carton of milk falls on her head. Looking up, she sees a student yelling at her that she deserves it. Everyone is yelling at her to apologize to Yunha, while some are urging Yunha to punch her. From that moment on, social media became full of controversies about her. Some are making videos asking whether Soyeon is pulling some strings behind the scenes, while others are talking about Hanrim Iam of the TRPA even mainstream news picks it up especially when Jayan's middle school teammate appeared on social media revealing that all the school violence happened under the direction of the older sister, Soyeon Kang. Jayen goes to her sister crying, asking what she should do now that everyone is leaving death threats on her social media. 
Soyoung consoles her sister, pointing out that others are just jealous of their talents and success. For now, they should just release an apology video. She instructs JN to admit to everything she did, and that everything being blamed on Soyeon herself is just slander. JN lashes out, telling her that she was following her orders, but Soyeon isn't having any of it and pulls out JN's hair. She tells her sister that if they leave it as is, then they will both go down instead of just one of them. This way, Soyeon might be able to save her when the issue has died down a little. Thus, JN creates a remorseful apology video owning to her mistakes and promising to faithfully go through the investigation of the TRPA, she also preemptively quit the basketball team. She also clarifies that her sister had nothing to do with it. People ate the video up, and they all started forgiving Soyeon. At school, Soyeon also hands over Jayan's letter of resignation to Hanram. Hanram asks her how it feels to send her sister to hell while she survived, but Soyeon doesn't answer her question and instead tells Hanrim to leave since they need to focus on their basketball competition. Hanrim rejects her advice and gives Soyeon the list of starting members they'll use in the competition. Soyeon sees Imna's name on the list and she immediately rejects it, pointing out that Hanrim doesn't know the first thing about basketball. Hanrim smiles at Soyeon while she continues shouting, and then she tells him that she leaked only Jayan's bullying to the media because it's the best punishment for her. As for Soyeon, she has something else planned. She knows that Soyeon is just bullying Yunha because they both know Yunha is better than her. Soyeon quickly dismisses her claims so to prove that she's right, Hanrim tells Yunha to start warming up. Before Yunha and Soyeon's one-on-one -on -one match starts, Soyeon makes Hanrim promise that she'll leave if she wins. Soyeon was confident that she'd win because Yunha had no chance to practice the whole year. And yet, when their match starts, Yunha not only manages to block Soyeon, but also scores as well as her. Two years ago, Soyeon first saw Yunha when she played with Jayan's team. Their coach was also amazed at Yunha's skill. Even Soyeon can recognize that before, Yunha was just tall, but now, she also has the basic skills and techniques. Seeing her potential as a rival, Soyeon advised their coach to scout Yunha so that she can keep her under her thumb. That's when their bullying started, and she even blackmailed their coach so that he wouldn't train her. Back in the present, Soyeon is now getting frustrated because Yunha is starting to get the upper hand, managing to steal the ball from her. She can't understand how Yunha is so good when they didn't even let her join the practice. They didn't know that throughout high school even when Yunha was going through all her bullying, she woke up at 4.30 a.m. and went out to train by herself. Back in the court, Yunha slips by Soyeon's defenses and shoots the ball. Seeing that she's about to lose, Soyeon grabs her by the hair and pulls, yelling at her that she should have quit when she had the chance. But this time, Yuna grabs Soyeon's clothes and performs a judo takedown, throwing Soyeon to the floor. She shouts at Soyeon asking if she wants to be treated the same way she's treating others, and she steps on Soyeon's arm. After stepping on Soyeon's arm, Yuna holds her hand and starts twisting it. She reveals to her that this game isn't fair. Soyeon has no idea about Yunha's skills, while Yunha had spent every moment in that gym watching Soyeon. She had studied Soyeon's every single movement like shootings, techniques, and even the way she trains. However, it wasn't for revenge. She watched her because she liked how Soyeon played basketball so badly. Yuna thought that if she just worked hard, then Soyeon might acknowledge her. But now, Yuna sees that Soyeon doesn't care about basketball anymore. She's just an asshole. Yuna then walks away, leaving Soyeon on the floor. Hanrim reveals to Soyeon that Yuna didn't want her to get punished since she's a treasure in women's basketball. Instead, Yuna just wants to play in the same team with her at least once. However, even if Yuna forgives Soyeon, Hanrim can't let it be. For her, Soyeon doesn't deserve to be a member of the national team. A few days later, Hanrim conducts a press conference wherein thanks to the TRPA investigation, they learn the violence at the women's basketball team was led by the team's captain Soyeon Kang. As a result, she and her sister have been disqualified from the national team. The two are currently on trial in juvenile court on charges of school violence. Hanrim then addresses all the athletes who dream of becoming professionals that may be watching her. She tells them that the player's duty is not the best play but to give joy and inspiration to the audience with their best play. Back at school, the women's national team is practicing. The coaches lament how unfortunate Soyeon's situation turned out to be. She was a beautiful influencer with a proven track record. If she became a pro, Soyeon would have been a star who had a chance to revive women's basketball. They then notice that one of the players, a girl named Yunha, 
is playing amazingly well on the court and they start wondering who she is. Hanram's press conference goes viral and one of the viewers who watches it is a woman who starts getting annoyed. She criticizes Hanram's thick makeup and flashy red hair. She also criticizes how Hanram is targeting girls since the human rights of female students are already at the bottom. The woman then finishes the file she was creating, which was a compilation of additional educational materials for students and sends it to her group. After finishing her mission, Hanram returns to the TRPA headquarters. Hwajin starts teasing her about her press conference and even shows her that new tubers are making video essays about her. Their boss, Gang Suk, arrives and gives them their next school to visit. It was about a school where elementary school students are being brainwashed. At the said school, a little girl is tearfully lifting a sign saying she is a discriminator. She was being punished by her teacher for allegedly saying discriminatory things. The teacher is the very same woman that was angry at Hanram earlier for punishing female students. At home, a single father had just found his daughter's diary. There, he horrifyingly learned that his daughter is being bullied because she said she thought in a different way than the others. Their teacher had labeled her as a discriminator and is now being punished. Hanrim and Huijin quickly drive to the school. Hanrim is starting to shake in anger about kids being brainwashed, but Huijin tells her to calm down. He has a plan on how to catch her. At school, the teacher in question, Ms. Sangi, is busily creating more educational materials. She is writing her own stories to let children read instead of fairy tales, with her stories full of her own kind of moral lessons. Someone messages her, telling her that their educational site has been leaked, and they have been reported to the Ministry of Education for brainwashing. However, Ms. Sangi replies that they haven't done anything wrong. She's not brainwashing the kids, she's just trying to make a world without discrimination. Ms. Sangi is walking to her classroom when Huijin and Hanrim introduce themselves to her. Huijin informs her that they are there to learn from her. During their TRPA missions, there were issues of gender discrimination. And since Ms. Sangi is one of the experts in the field, they were hoping to get lessons from her. Ms. Sangi is glad that someone is interested in her field of study, and she happily invites the two to attend her class. In class, the students are reading the stories Ms. Sangi prepared especially for them. Hanrim is surprised to hear a child read a curse word and the sudden violence in the story. Ms. Sangi explains that traditional fairy tales have some old-fashioned discrimination that doesn't fit the modern era. As such, Ms. Sangi remade the stories from a modern perspective. Next, Ms. Sangi shows the kids statistics on the number of soccer players in amateur soccer. Since the men outnumbered the women, she concludes that the playground is exclusive to the boys. She also shows them an ad showing men and women in the workplace. She points out that women are wearing skirts while men are wearing pants, so that means that the media are unconsciously forcing them to play gender roles. During an activity, Huijin notices that one of the kids is wearing a sign on her necks, so he asks Ms. Sangi why. Ms. Sangi informs him that the kid, Somi, was unwilling to follow her class policy, so she decided to use shock therapy to teach her. Outside the classroom, the father is horrified to see his daughter Somi sad and wearing a sign. He barges into the room and shouts at Ms. Sangi. He demands that Ms. Sangi apologize to Somi, but Ms. Sangi just reminds him that every teacher has a different teaching method. She also points out how bad it is that a single dad like him would invade his own daughter's privacy by reading her diary. No wonder his wife divorced him. The father is about to slap Ms. Sangi for his insults, but Weijin stops him. Slapping a teacher would violate the teacher's rights and would put the dad in trouble. So instead, Hanrim goes ahead and slaps Ms. Sanghi with all her might. Huajin explains to Ms. Sanghi that they have been informed that she provides extreme indoctrination to kids. Besides that, she was also rude to a parent's concern which crosses the line even more. Ms. Sanghi calmly admits that she was rude, but she cannot accept that her teaching is indoctrination. She's just getting the class to pursue the value of equality, which is not indoctrination. Wajid admits that there might be some misunderstanding because they only attended one of her classes. Thus, he and Hanrim sit on the students' chairs and state that they would act as students. During break, a girl named Yumi shows the new dress that her dad bought her. Her friends start complimenting her. But in another part of the classroom, another group of students looks at them with anger. Meanwhile, Ms. Sanghi is pondering about what to do now that the TRPA is in her classroom. However, she just takes it as an opportunity to get her methods to be recognized by the Ministry of Education and be adopted as an official educational method. If she succeeds, she doesn't have to go through their secret website anymore. When she enters her classroom, Ms. Sanghi sees that her students are quarreling. 
Miss Sangi intervenes, and the student tells her that the clothes are talking about Yumi's appearance. The boys also admitted that they complimented Yumi's clothes. Ms. Sangi points out to them that whether they complimented or insulted her clothes, the remark is discrimination. Huijin interrupts and states that discrimination on appearance is indeed bad. However, this should only be pointed out when someone's insulting their appearance, not complimenting it. Ms. Sangi argues back that as girls grow up, they are implicitly praised for their pretty hair or clothes. This would result in the girls thinking that if they dress up prettier, they'll get compliments again. In that way, students are gradually being taught toxic femininity. Wajin, however, retorts that all that doesn't matter if the kids are happy. Wanting to look pretty is not a matter of gender, but of an individual's preference and taste. Teaching ideal values is good, but ignoring individuals is fascism and bad. Later, the class is discussing jobs and professions when something in their textbook catches Ms. Sanghi's eye. Pilots, doctors, and police are all drawn as men while the teacher is a woman. She angrily bashes the book for showing stereotypes about occupation and gender. One student raises his hand and voices out that male police officers are stronger since men are strong and run fast, so they're better at arresting criminals. Ms. Sangi explains to the student that it's true that men have a physical advantage over women. However, women's roles are bound to exist in any job. She then asks Hanrim if she agrees with her since she knows Hanrim is from the military special forces. She implores Hanrim to tell the students what the role of women in the military is. During lunch, Ms. Sanghi remembers the conversation she had on their website with fellow teachers to have the same belief as her. They were divided on whether they should hide first and lay low for a while or if they should use the opportunity to present their teaching philosophy and the values they believe to the world. Nevertheless, they all cheer on Ms. Sanghi. Thus, Ms. Sanghi smiles at the students who still believe in her and asks them for a favor. During class, Ms. Sangi is discussing changing the bathroom signs to more non-stereotypic ones when Somi raises her hand. She points out that it's going to be hard to tell the bathroom signs apart if they look the same and that someone might get them wrong. Ms. Sangi is about to scold her again when Huijin advises her to try listening to the student instead of cutting her off. After all, debating about issues would be conducive to raising the so-called awareness that Ms. Sangi wants. Ms. Sangi smirks at his suggestion and readily agrees. When Ms. Sangi asks the students if anyone disagrees with Somi, a girl named Neon raises her hand and shares that it irritates her to see a skirt drawn on the women's restroom sign. Only ignorant people like Somi won't be able to tell signs apart if they change it. Somi tries to point out that there are children who are younger than them that can't even read yet, but Neon is already loudly looking for people who agree with her. More students stand and they all start insulting Somi for not being able to distinguish the signs. She then thanks Guijin for the debate idea and continues with the lesson. From that moment on, arguments crop up all the time in class, with those who support Ms. Sanghi shouting at the others who don't. It came to a point that when her students now share their opinion, the others don't try to voice their own opinions. Ms. Sanghi smirks at Huijin and Hanrim since her plan worked. They couldn't do anything since they were the ones who suggested having debates in class. Society has always followed the side with the loudest voice, and in this situation, it was the students who followed her. Her inner monologue was interrupted when someone raises her hand and tells Ms. Sanghi that she disagrees. It was Somi again. Nayong angrily strides towards Somi and pushes her. She shouts at her that people like her are why discrimination still exists. Ms. Sanghi realizes that Nayong is going too far, and she shouts at her to stop. Before she can intervene, a shoe hits Nayong in the face. It was thrown by another student who was annoyed at Neyong screaming all the time. The abrupt situation blows into a full-blown physical altercation as both groups confront each other. Wajin slowly stands up and punches the fist on his table, breaking it in two and capturing everyone's attention. He then tells everyone that just like his desk, this class is also divided in half. When someone has a different opinion, they all start gnashing at each other like enemies. He then asks Ms. Sanghi if polarizing the students into extreme opposites is her purpose in education. Ms. Sanghi never wanted any of this to happen. In the past, she was just a part of a simple academic study group. One day, one of them mentions how kids make extremely sexist remarks toward women these days. From that moment on, their topic was fixed on gender discrimination and hatred. They then mention an online discussion board for teachers to discuss these kinds of problems and try fixing them. To realize a society without discrimination, Ms. Sanghi put in more effort and dedication than anyone else. Slowly but surely, she climbed up the ranks in their secret group. Back in the present, she screams at Huijin that her methods were failing because of him. 
Wedgen, however, points out that the kids would continue to encounter people with different opinions. One opinion is not superior to the other. But what she's teaching the kids is that their ideas are superior and forces others to agree with them. He asks Ms. Sanghee if what she wants is a Korea where everyone is polarized and fighting against each other. Ms. Sanghee starts to cry and tries to explain to Wei that no, it's different from the value that they are seeing. However, Wei immediately notices and asks her what she means by they. Are there more teachers who are executing the same education method as her? Ms. Sanghee tried to backtrack, but it was already too late. Wajin tells Ms. Sangi that he doesn't necessarily disagree with the value of gender equality that she is pursuing. It's just that her method is wrong. If she wants to know what the proper way is, Somi would be able to tell her. He then encourages Somi to speak out and share her honest opinions. Somi starts reading out her thoughts on gender equality. As a general foundation, she believes that both men and women should have equal rights and communicate respectfully with each other. She starts listing out and discussing her suggestions one by one. On her last suggestion, Somi starts tearing up. She tells them that just like Ms. Sangi mentioned, her parents are divorced. They yell and argue about who's having a harder time and they fight over whose idea was right. If only they didn't yell at each other, then her family might still be together. As such, she wants everyone not to get angry and yell at each other just because they have different opinions. Wajin compliments her and agrees that pursuing values that are neutral and right without matters that incite conflict is how public education works. Meanwhile, Ms. Sangi slowly stands up. Han Rim moves to protect Somi, but Ms. Sangi just pulls out her phone and photographs the gender equality Somi discussed. Later, she sends the picture to their secret group chat and tells the other teachers how proud she is of her student. She is about to ask them if they can add that to their curriculum but she suddenly noticed that the group chat is already empty beside one other person. The other person tells Ms. Sanghee that she has always done a great job. However, they have decided to expel her for their group's solidarity. Ms. Sanghee then closes her laptop and ponders what she should do. The next day, all that Hanrim and Weijin found on Sanghee's desk was a letter of resignation. Hanrim is getting angry that they never got to find out who they were that Ms. Sanghee mentioned yesterday, but Weijin tells her to stop when he finds a memory card in Ms. Sanghee's resignation letter. The next day, the news reports about the investigation being conducted by the TRPA revealed the truth behind the brainwashing of elementary school students. Through the group's website, they were able to see the horrifying files they disseminate such as how to win over parents, means to induce isolation in student groups, or even how to handle investigations and legal matters. There are also about 10 to 20 seniors within each rank, and each senior systematically manages their members within their group. Unfortunately, the group works as a branch organization for each school district, so even Ms. Sanghee who had a senior rank doesn't know all the other seniors. Hence, to reveal the website completely, the Ministry of Education and the police had established a team dedicated to investigating the issue. At school, Ms. Sanghee is tidying up her desk, preparing to leave. She bids farewell to her fellow teacher, but the teacher ignores her and calls her a betrayer. When she exited the room, Weijin was there waiting for her and helps her with her stuff. While they were walking, Ms. Sanghee admits that up until then, she had never doubted her way of teaching. It's because everyone around her whispered that it was the right thing to do. In other words, she was brainwashed by them just like she was brainwashing the kids. It's not that she's claiming that she's also a victim, it's just that she finally realized how it must have been for the students when she, an adult, was unable to resist those influences. Outside, Weijin asks her if she wants to say goodbye to her students, but Ms. Sanghee rejects the offer. The only thing she can do left for her students is to disappear from their sight forever. Weijin smiles at her and tells her that she still has a lot to learn from her students. Behind her were the two girls, Somi and Naeyong. Naeyong gives her a rolled up paper and when Ms. Sanghee opens it, there are messages from her students asking her to come back to teach. There was even a message from Somi thanking her for teaching them about equality. Ms. Sanghee hugs the two girls, crying and apologizing for all the bad things she's done. Meanwhile, Weijin rejected Ms. Sanghee's resignation because she cooperated with the investigation and she sincerely regretted her wrongdoings. Instead, she was suspended for three months. Afterward, the Ministry of Education surveyed elementary students and their parents nationwide to understand the current situation of brainwashing in education. They warned the teachers that stern action will be taken if the same thing happens again in the future. Various civic groups and teachers' organizations held rallies claiming that the website was fake and that Minister Gangshok is undermining gender equality. 
In response, Minister Gangshak shouts at them that he wishes it was all fake too, but they don't know if this is truly a fabrication unless they start the investigation. Meanwhile, the two TRPA wardens are driving when Wei Jin notices a convenience store and asks Wei Jin to stop the car so he can buy some cigarettes. Inside, he bumps into a kid picking a lot of food. He helps the kid with his food but notices that his face is full of bruises. Wei Jin then goes to pay for his things and the kid takes the opportunity to run outside. The store employee was about to chase him, but Wei Jin offered to pay for the kid's food. Outside, he follows the kid to an alley where the kid was quickly devouring all his food. The kid starts choking on the food, so Wei Jin gives him the milk he bought. While the kid was drinking, he tried asking him questions, but the kid got scared and ran away. He quickly follows him and sees that the boy bumped into a woman who called the kid Ninseo. Wei Jin asks her if she knows the boy and the woman defensively explains that she's a preschool teacher. A few minutes later, they are now at the park and Wei Jin has explained everything to her while Minsu sleeps on her lap. Wei Jin asks her if she knows anything more, so the woman starts explaining everything. Minsu attended her preschool in the past. Unlike other children, Minsu was very quiet and didn't play with the other children. One day, Minsu started choking on some food and he coughed up some blood. She quickly called Minsu's mother to tell them that she was taking Minsu to the hospital. However, they told her that it wasn't needed since Mincio will be picked up instead. He was usually dropped off and picked up by his mother, but that day his father came to pick him up. She tried to introduce herself to him, but the father just grabbed Mincio by the arm and dragged him out. When Mincio didn't come back to school for over a week, she went to check on him. She was about to press the doorbell on his home when she overheard Mincio being scolded by his father. Mincio was trying to plead for his father to feed him, but his father shouted at him to not be bothered while he's playing his video games. She was then horrified to hear loud slapping noises coming from inside the apartment. The next day, she went to every clinic in the neighborhood until she found the one Mincio had visited. There she learned that Mincio's bloody coughing was likely due to intestinal rupturing. She called Child Protective Services right away and Mincio stopped coming to school completely after that. About three months later, she was walking home at night when she bumped into Mincio with his dad. The dad greeted her while Mincio was just standing beside him bruised and quiet. The dad then quietly whispers to her that based on her expression, she must be the one who reported them. If she tried that again, then the dad promises to do something to the kid. She then found out later that child protection services didn't do anything beyond talking with the parents. Back in the present, she is now crying beside Huijin. Huijin explains that children that are young can't communicate reliably so child protection services must rely solely on the parents' statements. She asks him how he knows that, so Weijin introduces himself as a warden from the TRPA seeing that, she quickly begs him to do something about Ninseo's situation. However, Weijin sadly apologizes since the situation is outside his jurisdiction. She gets sad upon hearing this and Weijin then tells her that they must get the boy home or else they can be charged. He volunteers to take Ninseo home and asks for his address. Later, Weijin carries Ninseo home. He is pondering if he should call the police, but he decides not to. He then repeatedly presses the doorbell of Ninseo's home, and Ninseo's dad quickly barges out, angry at the disturbance. Weijin is about to introduce himself as the TRPA, but his mood suddenly changes, and he states that he's just a passerby. Ninseo's father notices Ninseo on Weijin's back. He tells him that Ninseo was wandering around, so he asked around for his address. Meanwhile, Minsio's dad is angry at him for sneaking out. He grabs Minsio by the hair and pulls him inside the house. Wajin asks him about Minsio's multiple bruises and starvation, but the dad glares at him and asks him who he is for asking such questions. Wajin coolly answers back that as a citizen, it's his duty to report crimes. Minsio's father calls out to Minsio and asks him if he's ever been hit or starved. Minsio haltingly answers no, and the dad warns Wajin to never bother them again or else. He is about to close the door when Huijin blocks it with his foot. Mincio's dad exits the house and tells Huijin that Mincio is his flesh and blood. Even if he does hit him, why does Huijin care? He threatens to punch Huijin, but Huijin immediately knocks him unconscious with his own punch. He enters the apartment and puts Mincio's dad on the bed, explaining to the kid that his dad seems to be super tired. Meanwhile, he surveys the house and sees trash all over and unwashed dishes in the sink. Wajin asks Mincio where his mom is and Mincio explains that his mom is at work and usually comes home really late. 
Outside, he was surprised to bump into Mincio's preschool teacher. She explains that she was worried, so she followed him. She asks him if punching Mincio's dad would do anything. But Huijin tells her that Mincio's dad probably takes his anger out on his child and will probably do it again as soon as he wakes up. There's no way to stop it unless they'd want to move in with them. However, that statement gave Huijin an idea. The next morning, Mincio's dad wakes up to find his son eating. He asked him where it came from so Mincio explains that Huijin bought it yesterday and he bought one for Mincio's dad too. However, Mincio's dad kicks out the table with all the food in it and asks Mincio where Huijin is. Mincio starts crying and his dad is about to kick again, but loud music from outside brings him to a stop. Mincio's dad checks it out and learns that it was coming from the apartment next door. He slams on the door shouting at the occupant to quiet down, but lo and behold, who opens the door was Huijin himself. Mincio's dad is shocked to see him and asks him what he's doing there. Huijin states that he'd obviously signed a contract with the apartment, so he technically leveled up from being a passerby to a neighbor. Mincio's dad attempts to punch Huijin again, so Huijin dodges and slams him onto the wall. Huijin asks him why he's always solving everything with his fist and calls him Don Chiel, surprising him that he knew his name. He then warns Don Chiel that he's sensitive to neighbors, especially crying kids. The next day, Don Chiel is back to playing his MMO games. And where is Mincio? Mincio is tied up against the wall so he can't leave. Mincio cries out that it's hurting, and he promises not to sneak out anymore, but Don Chiel ignores him since he's too engrossed in his games. Unfortunately, Don Chiel fails his quest, and he slams his fist at the keyboard. He then asks Mincio how many times he must warn him not to bother him when he's playing. His whining distracted him, and he lost. Their door suddenly bangs with a couple of knocks, and Weijin's voice shouts out that Don Chiel got defeated because of his fingers, not because of anything Don Chiel did. Don Kiel shouts out that he's just educating his son, but this makes Wajin barge into the room and threatens to take a picture of them. Then they can just let other people decide if it's education or worse. Don Kiel is dumbfounded since he locked the door, but Wajin drops a pin and tells him that he didn't notice. Don Kiel tries to excuse that he's just teaching his kid not to go out again and endanger himself, that's why he tied up Minseo and locked the door. Meanwhile, Wajin approaches him and starts choking him. He tells him that educating is for the good of the child and what parents do for their selfish convenience is called abuse. A few hours later, Mincio and Don Hiel are eating. Mincio's voracious eating causes the food to go all over the place, so Don Hiel slants his hand on the table and screams at Mincio to not make a mess at the table. He screams at his son to put the spoon down since he doesn't deserve to eat it. From next door, Huijin loudly states that six-year-olds are undoubtedly going to spill some food. This became the routine in their household. Every time Don Kiel tries to punish Mincio, Huijin shouts at him to stop. One day, Don Kiel is trying to smoke by the window when Huijin calls to him from the street below and states that he shouldn't smoke with the kid in the house. Instead, he can join him down there. Don Kiel slams the window and holds his head, frustrated that he can't do something to stop Huijin. He then hears Mincio calling out his name on repeat while playing, seemingly making fun of it. Don Chiel fully gets annoyed and takes out a hammer from his cabinet. He then warns Mincio that he won't be coming back for a long time. Meanwhile, he goes to the door where Huijin can be heard making a ruckus. Don Chiel plans to murder him and just go to prison. When he opens the door, he quickly brings down the hammer on Huijin's head. Huijin was shocked but reacted instantly, catching the hammer with a baseball glove and telling Don Chiel that he was pathetic. At the TRPA headquarters, Chairman Gang Sok lively calls out to Huijin to join him for a smoke break. Unfortunately, Hanrum reminds him that Huijin applied for leave for around two weeks. Meanwhile, Huijin had just caught Don Chil's hammer and ordered him to go out. A few minutes later, he's now wearing the baseball glove and a baseball hits him right in the face. Huijin tells him he shouldn't be playing games all day. Don Chil throws the ball back at Huijin with all his might, and Huijin casually catches it back with his own gloves. Next, Weijin calls out to Mincio and gently throws the ball at him, which Mincio also catches with his gloves. Weijin compliments him and urges him to throw the ball to his dad. This goes on for a while until Weijin leaves, letting the father and son play with each other. Mincio has the largest smile on his face as they play. Afterward, they buy Mincio a toy from the mall and then eat together at a nearby Korean barbecue. Later that night, they were walking home with Don Kyo complaining how Mincio easily fell asleep on his back. 
Wajin, however, points out how amazing it is that even though Dongqiol is a bad father, Nincio can still be so happy when he plays with him. Maybe that's just how kids are. No matter how terrible their parents are, kids have no one else to depend on. Parents are their whole universe, and no matter what their parents might do to them, they can't hate them. And that's the only reason Don Chiel is alive in Hui Jin's eyes. Even now, he'd gladly break every bone in his body and chuck him in front of a police station. But if he did that, Minso's world would come crashing down around him, so he won't do that. So the best thing is for Don Chiel to change. Hua Jin warns him that this is his last chance, and if he hears Minsio cry one more time, he won't hold back anymore. Later at home, Don Chiel scrolls in his phone through pictures of Minsio as a baby, as a toddler, and as a kid. Their door slowly opens and Minsio's mother comes in. She greets Don Chiel and Don Chiel throws a beer can right by her side. He shouts at her that he warned her never to show her face again. She apologizes while crying and Hui Jin hears all the commotion right while he's showering. Hua Jin sighs and remarks that old habits do die hard. Minso's mom kneels in front of Don Chiel and begs for his forgiveness, promising to never do it again. Their commotion wakes up Minsio and his mom quickly hugs him and apologizes to him for being late. Hua Jin was about to knock on the door, but he hears their emotional reunion and stops. The next day, they are eating together as a family when Minso's mom sees that he's making a mess while eating. She tries to warn him not to do that since Don Chiel might get angry, but Don Chiel tells her that it's fine. It's just what kids do. Don Chiel suggests that she take Mincio to the park since he has a new remote-controlled car. This surprises Mincio's mom, but their breakfast is interrupted when Hui Jin loudly knocks and calls out for Don Chiel. He tells him to get ready after breakfast since he has a surprise for him. A few minutes later, Don Chiel found himself at a construction site wearing military fatigue. A large man shouts at him that he's now an intern at the Special Forces Interior Contractors. In the distance, the boss is talking to Hui Jin and commenting that he seemed to have brought them a typical unemployed hoodlum. However, it was a special request from the great Captain Na, so they won't say no. He points out that all their workers are former Special Forces, so would Don Chiel survive? Hua Jin smiles and replies that Don Chiel might not be in the Special Forces, but he is a dad. Meanwhile, Mincio and his mom are playing at the park with his RC car. His mom asks him if Don Chiel bought his new car and Mincio happily answers that their neighbor did. He also loved how his daddy had stopped hitting him now and was very kind to him. Later that evening, Don Chiel is breathless and tired after a long day of construction work. His boss congratulates him and remarks that he helped more than they thought he could. He then encouraged Don Chiel to return tomorrow and handed him his wage for the day. Even though Don Chiel looks scrawny, he knows how to handle construction tools, as if he worked in construction for at least two years. While he was walking home with Hui Jin, Don Chiel was surprised to see that his pay was higher than usual. Hua Jin offers him a smoke and tells him that now, he can bring home some fried chicken which will surely make Nincio happy. He asks him if he has ever done construction work since he seems to know his way around it. Don Chiel denies it and tells him that he just did random jobs and manual labor for three and a half years. It was the last year of high school and Minso's mom was a year under him when she got pregnant, so he couldn't do anything else except physical labor. They got kicked out of school and out of their homes. Nevertheless, Don Chiel promises her that he'll take care of everything. He did manual labor during the day and deliveries at night. One day, his former classmates saw him working and started making fun of him. That's when Don Chiel asked himself what he was doing with his life. If it wasn't for that one mistake, he would have enjoyed his 20s, just like everyone else. Hua Jin slaps him on the head and warns him never to call Mincio a mistake in front of the kid. Dong Chiel's life might be more difficult because he had a kid but that's not an excuse to treat him badly. Dong Chiel retorts that he might look like an asshole that takes his anger out on his kid, but he assures Hua Jin that he loves his family. He might have been hard on Mincio, but there's a good reason for it. At home, Mincio's car is now in the trash can broken. They were about to enter their apartment when they heard Mincio's cry. Don Chiel quickly barges in and asks Mincio's mom what happened. She explained that Mincio accidentally drove the car into a wall, breaking it, and now Mincio won't stop crying. Don Chiel was about to shout at him, but he remembers that Hui Jin is still outside. Instead, he promises to buy a new one for Mincio with the money he earned and gives him the fried chicken. Later, Minso's mom is shocked to learn that Don Hiel really did work. He gives her the money and tells her that she must bring Minso to school tomorrow since he'll be working. She smiles and reminisces that now, 
everything seems like it's back to their old days, the ways things used to be. At school, Min Seo is much happier now playing with all the kids, and even the preschool teacher is happy to see that. She goes to get some snacks, leaving the kids to play. One kid gives Min Seo an excavator toy, telling him that he should play with it instead since his dad is a construction worker. This angers Min Seo and the preschool teacher came back to see Min Seo beating up the other boy. He is about to smash the toy into the boy's bleeding forehead, but thankfully she was able to stop him. Their parents are called and Min Seo's mom bowed her head in apology to the other parent. The teacher insists that it's her fault for not watching the kids, but the kid's mother scolds Min Seo's mom and tells her that it's obvious why her son is like that seeing that she's a teenage mom. Later, they go home and the teacher catches up with Min Seo's mom and apologizes for what happened. She then tells her that children who are victims of domestic violence have a higher chance of behaving violently to their peers, so she asks her not to be too hard on Min Seo. Min Seo's mom smiles and tells her that it's okay since Don Kiel is a good man now. While they were walking home, Min Seo's mom asks Min Seo if she's right, his daddy is a nicer man now. However, now that he's nicer, he's become a naughty boy. Back at their apartment, Wei Jin is talking to Chairman Gangshak about his leave. He mentions that he might be going back tomorrow, and the chairman was glad to hear it. After the call, he wonders if he should say goodbye to the family. He hesitates since he's afraid Don Kiel might go back to his old ways now that he knows Wei Jin is gone. His thoughts were, however, interrupted when he heard a commotion from the neighbors. Don Kiel is shouting and beating his wife, threatening her since she did it again. In the neighbor's house, Don Kiel is kicking Min Seo's mom, while Min Seo is lying down beside them unconscious and wet all over. Hua Jin barges into Min Seo's apartment and sees Don Kiel standing over the beaten bodies of Min Seo and his mom. He strides toward the two and asks Don Kiel if he had called an ambulance. He also checks the kid's condition and when he hears the heartbeat, he quickly calls the emergency number. Don Kiel tries to stop him from calling but Wei Jin slaps away his hand. He tells them that the mother is beaten up while the child has passed out from drowning. As for the father, his life is in danger. Hua Jin hits Don Kiel square in the face and he falls to the floor. Hua Jin asks him why he tried stopping him from calling. Is he that afraid to be discovered as dangerous? Don Kiel stands up and answers back that it's all Hua Jin's fault. He only kept Min Seo in line so that this wouldn't happen. He tries to attack Hua Jin and Hua Jin slams his head on the ground. Don Kiel's excuses are making him angry, and he prepares to pummel Don Kiel's face. However, Don Kiel suddenly cries out that it wasn't him. It was the mother. She waterboarded Min Seo. She caused Min Seo's internal bleeding before, and she also threw the RC car. In the past, Don Kiel felt that his life was ruined because of having a kid. But he's not the only one who felt that way. He admits that he hit Min Seo a few times, but his wife was on a completely different level. He shouts at his wife to be gentler on Min Seo, but she just replies that she knows it won't harm him. After all, she survived the beatings her own dad did to her. From that moment on, Don Kiel made Min Seo's wife promise not to lay a hand on Min Seo. Instead, Don Kiel will keep him in line. That's why Don Kiel did all those things. If he didn't, his mother might actually do worse. Back in the present, Hua Jin punches Don Kiel and tells him that he's not protecting his family. He was just lazy to control a grown woman with problems. Instead, he tried to control a little kid. He shouts at Don Kiel that they don't deserve to have a kid. The emergency services arrived to see Hua Jin pummeling Don Kiel's face. Thus, he was sentenced to prison where Chairman Gangshak arrives to bail him out. In the hospital, Min Seo wakes up to see his preschool teacher reading to him. He asks her where his parents are. She smiles at him, strokes his head, and sadly tells him that his parents won't be able to come since they aren't ready yet to raise him. The night that Min Seo's family was rushed to the hospital, the doctor discovered Min Seo's wounds and called the police. Min Seo's mother refused to answer any questions, but Don Kiel told them everything that happened. Thus, they were put on trial. As for Hui Jin, Gang Sok tells him that the victim didn't press any charges. He asks Hui Jin to lay low since a lot of people want to see them go down. Hua Jin points out that Gang Shok himself told him before that they weren't going to last long anyway, that they would get shut down the first chance they get. That's why they must do as much as they can right now. Nevertheless, Hui Jin apologizes since he knew he was out of line. In the past, they allowed the perpetrators to clean their act up. But this time, the perpetrators meant the world to the victim. Meanwhile, Min Seo is crying at the hospital begging for his parents to arrive. Six months later, Min Seo's parents were sent to prison. When he was released after a few months, 
Don Quixote watches his son in the orphanage happily playing in the snow, and he walks away. However, Mincio sees him and runs after him. Mincio slips in the snow and starts crying so Don Quixote was forced to help him up. Don Quixote points out that Mincio now has kids to play with and no one to scold him so he should be happier. He admits to him that he's been a very bad daddy so he's not allowed to be with him. He still has a restraining order as part of his sentence. However, he promises to be a better person and get permission to be with Mincio again. They make a pinky swear and Wajin watches them from a distance. In a condo someplace else, a mother knocks the door on her son in the bathroom and calls him for dinner. When no one answered, she calls her husband and asks him to open it. After a few minutes, the dad decides to pick the lock and scolds his son for not opening it. However, they see that their son is unconscious in the bathtub with the water stained with his blood. Meanwhile, in their son's room, his notifications keep popping up with messages from his bully. The bully was suspended for five days after the son reported him but that five days is already up, and he can't wait to bully him again. A few weeks ago, Sang Wook was shaking in nervousness as he went in front of the school committee of their school and reports that he's been bullied. At school, they all play rock, paper, scissors. It should be the fairest game in the world. Sang Wook was also forced to play, and every time he loses, he gets slapped. But when he loses, he gets punched instead. Between Sang Wook and his bully Sang Hak, rock, paper, scissors are not a fair game at all. He wasn't the only victim of Song Hack. He also steals the gadgets of other kids. Even when other people try to stop him, they just get hit with a chair by someone and get ganged up on. Song Hack's lackeys make sure he holds his iron grip. Even so, other kids got it easy. Sang Wook's torture doesn't stop at school. When Song Hack is out with his friends, they are made to act as seats for them. Song Hack used them to show off his powers to girls. Some of the experiences were even so bad that he couldn't tell them to the school committee. One day, they crossed the line for Sang Wook. They made him say and degrade his own mother's name. That was the moment he decided to harm himself. He didn't tell anyone because the news is always filled with reports of school issues getting covered up. That's why when the teacher's rights protection law was amended and the school-run committees were dissolved, he was elated. They were replaced by committees that included lawyers and experts, all overseen by the Office of Education. Since they were no longer run by the schools, Sang Wook thought he had a chance. But after the committee's deliberation, the leader Seong Hak only got suspended for five days while his lackeys only needed to write apologies and take a class. The committee had a new way to evaluate bullying with rubrics and score points. The committee scored Seong Hak's bullying as 10 to 12 points out of 20, which only equals getting a suspension. The lackeys throw their apology paper at Sang Wook, while Seong Hak just smiles creepily at him. 12 points out of 20 or 60 out of 100 was how the adults quantified Sang Wook's misery. Sang Wook reported it to the TRPA before he tried taking his life, but he figured that they wouldn't even look at a 60 point case. Back in the present, Sang Wook wakes up in the hospital after his failed attempt to harm himself. His mother hugs him tightly and asks her why he did that. But while his mother was hugging him, all Sang Wook could think about was how he was going to do it again. He quickly Googles it while his mom is still busy, but a notification changes everything. He cryingly promises to never do it again to his mom since he doesn't think he has to die anymore. In their group chat, he had just received a picture of Sean Hack beaten up by Hanrim of the TRPA. A few hours earlier, Sean Hack's suspension ended and their teacher gave him the normal warnings and guidelines for going back to school. Sean Hack happily smiles and assures his teacher that he has nothing to worry about. He is now a changed man. However, a few minutes later, he's already out smoking with his goons whipping up other students with their belts. This is all happening while Huijin is still on leave, where he was stopping and teaching Don Chiel how to be a good father to Min Seo. Even though he's technically on leave, he's still in communication with Hanrim and asking her to send the worst cases for him to read through. However, all cases seem to be getting worse and worse and Hanrim just wants to punish them all. She cannot even choose which ones need to be prioritized. Wajin reassures Hanrim that she can choose since she's also a TRPA warden and reminds her that helping individuals is only a small part of their duty. Their real goal is to make what's happening in schools known to the public. With that advice, Wajin hangs up and Hanrim ponders which problem she should choose. Meanwhile, Seon Hak is back to his past bullying antics which now include choking a chubby student named Seon Jun. Then, they celebrate when Seon Hak beats his former speed record on how fast he can make Seon Jung pass out. A female student arrives and scolds Seon Hak for being too harsh to her favorite couch. 
The girl then proceeds to happily sit on the unconscious Seonjung and asks Sean Hak how he managed to dodge being expelled. Seon Hak laughs and tells the girl that he just had to look remorseful while apologizing and promising to never do it again. Afterward, the school violence committee recognized his harsh bullying, so they gave him the severe punishment of five days of suspension. They all laugh since they cannot believe that the adults think five days of suspension is a harsh punishment for students. After class, the girls ask Song Hak where they're going to hang out today. However, their teacher suddenly arrives and starts shouting at Song Hak for not listening to his explanation earlier that day. He must go to a special education class after school. The counselor is already waiting for him on the field. Song Hak and the other bullies are forced to go to the field grumbling about how they already wrote their apology letters so they shouldn't have to take another class. To their surprise, the counselor waiting for them is a red-haired attractive female teacher named Hanrim. They didn't recognize her as a TRPA agent, thus they all start checking her out while Hanrim explains that they need to be compliant during class or their class will take longer. Sion Hak smirks and tells Hanrim that he wouldn't mind spending more time with someone like her. Therefore, he probably wouldn't be compliant. Hanrim smiles and tells him that for the first day, they'll start with some games of rock, paper, scissors. Sion Hak wins the round and asks Hanrim if he can get her number as a prize. Nevertheless, Hanrim never loses her smile. A few days earlier, Hanrim had told Weijin that she had finally chosen their next case. It was about the insufficient punishment by the school violence committee. Weijin asks her why she picked that one, so she explains that it's much like bike theft in Korea. Korea is typically a safe country where no one would steal a backpack left in the middle of the street, and yet bike theft is still prevalent in their country. That's because people think that stealing bikes isn't a big deal. And just like bike theft, school violence is seen as something that's not a big deal. Back in the present, Hanrim punches Song Hak in the face, surprising the other bullies and passing students alike. Hanrim then reminds Song Hak of his own game, Rock Paper Scissors, where he gets a slap for losing and a fist for winning and next, choking until he passes out. She is doing all of these because Hanrim wants to crush the common belief that school violence is not a big deal. Sean Hack is wondering why their special education teacher is choking him. Thankfully, his questions are answered when other students finally notice Hanrim and recognize her as a warden of the TRPA. He squeezes Hanrim's arm to escape from her chokehold, and even Hanrim is surprised at his strong grip. However, he realizes that being choked feels good. With a smile on his face, Sean Hack passes out from Hanrim's chokehold. An hour later, Sean Hack's friends wake him up in the infirmary. Seeing their beaten up faces, Sean Hack laughs hard as his friends explain that they were also forced to play rock, paper, scissors after he passed out. They couldn't believe how hard she hit, which is probably because she's from the special forces. However, Sean Hack just blows some blood out of his nose and tells them special forces were not. Hanrim is still just a chick. Later, Song Hak and his friends are going home when they notice the commotion that their school group chat has become. Someone has sent a picture of Sinan Hak getting beaten up by Hanrim to the other students and they are all cheering for Song Hak's downfall and are thanking Sang Wook for reporting him. Sion Hak smirks and decides to punish Sang Wook for being a tattletale. Meanwhile, Sang Wook and his mom are on their way home from the hospital. His mom is very happy to see that Sangwook's mood immediately changed now that the TRPA has arrived, and he is even excited to go back to school. Sangwook heads home first since his mom must go get some groceries. He was riding the elevator texting with Seonjoon over the end of their bully days when the elevator doors opened, and Sangwook saw that Sean Hak and his friends were waiting for him. One of the bullies grabs Sangwook by the throat and slams him back inside the elevator. Meanwhile, another bully closes the doors and Seong Hak makes fun of Sang Wook's happiness. He then tells Sang Wook that he doesn't care if he gets expelled or punished. What he cannot stand is one of his toys, meaning Sang Wook snitched on him. Suddenly, the elevator door opened again and this time, it was Hanrim. Hanrim was surprised to see them, but she immediately goes to Sang Wook's rescue and kicks Seong Hak away from him. She presses the top floor button and then tells Sean Hak that she was on the way to Sangwook since Sean Hak might try to get back at the victim. And yet, she never imagined that Sean Hak would do it on the first day. She asks Sean Hak why and then punches him in the face. But this time, Sean Hak doesn't budge but instead even licks Hanrim's fist and tells her that she doesn't scare him. At that moment, they finally reach the top floor. Sean Hak grabs Hanrim's arm and starts squeezing it calling her scrawny and taunting her to try and escape from his grip. 
In response, Hanram's smirk intensifies. She then remarks how her job is hard sometimes. At the end of the day, high school students are still kids, so she's never sure how much she has to hold back. But in Son Hak's case, it's clear that she doesn't need to. She then orders everyone to follow her to the rooftop where Son Hak still continues to mock her. Hanrim pays them no mind but instead announces that for their next class, they'll apologize to Sang Wook on their knees, and they can stop only when Sang Wook says they can stop. If Sang Wook doesn't say stop, then they'll be there till morning. Sinan Hak walks towards Sang Wook and blackmails him to say that everything's already good. However, Sang Wook finds the courage to say that he never forgave Shang Hak for everything yet. Sion Hak is about to punch him for his insubordination, but Hanram's kick is faster and almost hits Stamon Hak in the face. She warns Song Hak that it's time for him to kneel. Sean Hak finally gets irritated and punches Hanram. She managed to block the punch, but she was blown away and her arm throbbed from the impact. Meanwhile, Sion Hak continues to belittle Hanram and removes his uniform, showing off all the muscles he has from going to the gym. However, Hanram still creepily smiles at him. In another place, Gang Sok is calling Huai Jin again asking him when he's going back to work. He expresses his worry over Hanrim since with Huai Jin's leave of absence, Hanrim has been assigned to male students this time. Gang Sok was planning to only assign her to all girls' schools since he was afraid that she might get hurt by males. Huai Jin laughs out loud at Gang Sok's worries and reassures her that when it comes to physical combat, even Huai Jin is no match for Hanrim. Meanwhile, Sinan Hak is screaming in pain from Hanram's kick. Her kicks were so painful that it felt like he was being cut by a knife. He tries to counterattack with a punch, but Hanram dodges and kicks him in the side again. Blood soaks Song Hak's wounds, and he realizes that his shirt's been ripped. Hanram raises her foot to kick Sean Hak again, and he realizes that Hanram has been using her heels to cut her. Hanram slams her foot down on Song Hak's thigh, stabbing him in the flesh with her heel. Everyone is horrified at the brutality of Hanrim. Hanrim informs Song Hak that they would have been better off if Wajin was assigned to them. Wajin would have tried all kinds of approaches to get to Song Hak, but Hanrim's only way of dealing with bullies is with violence. She then steps on Song Hak's face and asks him if he's going to kneel in front of Sang Wook or not. An hour later, Sang Wook is back in his room watching a video of Song Hak on his knees apologizing to him. The video makes him smile while in another place. Sean Hak is slamming his fist into his bedroom wall, irritated that he must go through such humiliation. Later at school, other students gossip and take pleasure in Sean Hak's humiliation by Hanrim. When Sean Hak arrives at his classroom, he glares at Sang Wook while walking to his desk. Unfortunately for him, Hanrim catches him and asks him if he wants to repeat their lesson. Sean Hak tries to explain that he was just looking and not hurting anybody. But Hanrim declares that glaring at his victim with such venom can be considered as retaliation. And since Sinong Hak won't seem to change any time soon, she orders Sinong Hak to keep his head down and stare at the ground while he's still in school. Sinong Hak tries to protest, but he immediately flinches when Hanrim threatens to kick him. Later, the other students see Sinong Hak truly looking down even when he was walking through the corridor, and they all start laughing at him again. A pair of students even kicked him in the back before running away. Sion Hak shouts at them, but other students immediately take a picture of him, not looking down and send it to Hanrim. Hanrim appears and tells Sion Hak that it looks like she doesn't have to keep an eye on him after all. The other students would do the job for her. Sion Hak tries to explain that someone kicked him, but Hanrim just squeezes his injured thigh and laments that if only the school violence committee moved him to another class, then he wouldn't have to suffer like this. After class, Hanrim's third lesson begins at the gymnasium. Before they start, however, Song Hak suddenly announces that he'll quit school. Hanrim is just there because she disagreed with the school violence committee's decision. But it's not like he bribed them or anything. He was prepared to get expelled anyway, so he'll just quit school. He was about to leave the gymnasium when suddenly, the boys they bullied entered the room, including Song Jin and Sang Wook. He laughs at them and tells them to get out of the way. Song Jin instead pushes him back into the room. Hanram then places her wooden sword on Song Hak's forehead and informs him that he cannot leave. Just like how a drunk driver cannot escape punishment by stating that he won't drive anymore, school violence is also a serious crime and criminals need to be educated. Until Sinan Hak finishes her course, he'll be under Hanram's rule. The next day, Sinan Hak is outside of the school pondering if he should still go in. Since the other students are now bullying and humiliating him, 
he just decides to ditch school. If he could just wait for a few weeks, the extremely busy TRPA would probably leave soon. Unfortunately, Hanram stops her from leaving and drags him back by the ear. She warns him that if he runs, then he'll truly learn how good the special forces are at tracking people down. During lunch, the bullies are all hunkered down and having a meeting over their situation. They cannot even look up now because they're scared that one of their classmates would take a picture of them. Some wonder if they should just skip school but this time, Sion Hack advises that they should just stick it out. Their mandatory special education class is only five sessions and they have already finished three. The TRPA will leave after their classes and then they can get their revenge on the other students. For their next special education class, the bullies are all surprised to see their parents in the room. Hanram had given them a paper detailing all the misdeeds their children had done. One of the parents reading was sang mom and she angrily starts slapping Song Hak upon learning everything her son had to endure. Hanram explains to the other parents that it's important for parents to understand exactly what their children did and how much pain they'd caused the victims. One of the bully's mothers asks Hanram if their son really needs to be put on some humiliating public display when they have already apologized. Instead of Hanram answering, however, Sang Wook's mom shouts out that her son slit his wrists. How would the other parents feel if their children tried to take their own life? One of the bully's fathers advises Sang Wook's mom to stop slapping the kids. She's only hurting her hands. Instead, she can use the metal pipe he had found outside. The kid tries to call out to his dad, but the dad strikes him with the pipe, yelling at his son that he isn't his son. He didn't raise a monster. He then shouts out to the other bullies to kneel and accept their punishment. That night, Son Hak's thighs are bruised and wounded from the beating he received, but he knows that he only must endure one more session and all will be over. At their last session, Hanrim asks Son Hak to share his final thoughts and experiences. Son Hak was surprised at this, but he realizes that Hanrim is just another adult government employee who doesn't have to work any harder than the minimum. Thus, Son Hak shares with the others how thanks to their special education class, he realized how much pain he caused others and that bullying is wrong. He fakes some tears and thanks Hanrim for her guidance. And thus, Hanrim announces that the school violence prevention course is officially put on hold. Sean Hack and his friends get confused why it's only put on hold and not complete. However, Hanrim explains that the violence committee has an administrative appeal system where the victim student has 180 days after receiving the committee's decision to file an appeal. In Sang Wook's case, he filed an appeal the day he received the decision. Unfortunately for Sean Hack, the committee accepted the appeal on the day of their last class. Thus, it looks like their classes still aren't finished. The day of the appeal arrives and Han Rim accompanies Sang Wook to the Jeonggi Province Office of Education. Han Rim asks Sang Wook if he really wants to do an oral appeal, but Sang Wook assures her that he feels much better with her there. The members of the disciplinary committee enter, including Mr. Kim from the Disciplinary Action Adjustment Committee and Mr. Junbin Lee, a youth human rights attorney. Sang Wook recognizes Mr. Lee as one of the members of the former committee who handled his case. Hanrim tries to shake Mr. Lee's hand, but Mr. Lee smacks away her hand and tells her that he doesn't like the TRPA when the hearing starts. Sang Wook narrates every horrific thing he had gone through under Song Hak's bullying. And yet even after he got his punishment suspension, Sinong Hak mocked the committee's decision and sent Sang Wook texts, threatening revenge. If Hanrim didn't save him, he would have been hurt much worse than before. He made this appeal because he can't keep going to the same school as Song Hak. After Sang Wook's statement, Mr. Lee next explains why they decided on five days of suspension. Mr. Lee elucidates that he believes the action taken by the committee was appropriate. After all, their aim is to correct students, not punish them. No matter how serious the case, there is always room for consideration when the student shows remorse. Most students deny any wrongdoing, but Sion Hak acknowledged every crime he did and showed that he was remorseful. Thus, they cannot go beyond suspension for a student that shows remorse. They also did not change their classes because they wanted to give the two students the chance for reconciliation. Hanrim suddenly interrupts Mr. Lee's statement and exclaims that Sinon Hak does not actually feel remorse for what he did. She monitored Sinon Hak all throughout her assignment and she never once saw him show true remorse. Sean Hak even mocked the lightness of the punishment and didn't hesitate to take revenge. She believes that this was all made possible by the committee's poor decision. However, Mr. Lee points out that Sean Hak's behavior can also be caused by the TRPA's extreme methods. 
As a youth attorney, he has been to many students, and they are calling the TRPA as undertakers because once the TRPA gets involved, things go beyond corrective action. The students are treated like criminals and their lives are ruined. The videos of Han Rim on YouTube truly show that she lives up to the TRPA's violent reputation. That's why when she showed up, Song Hak probably felt like his life was over. Is it possible that her presence is what pushed him over the edge? Juveniles are still immature so they should be given chances. Taking away such chances will only push them to commit more wrongdoings. Sang Wook can't take what Mr. Lee is saying anymore so he abruptly stands up and shows him the scar on his wrist. When Son Hak told him he would get revenge, he was so scared that he tried to take his own life. Should they just call what Sinon Hak did as wrongdoing and let it slide? Mr. Lee replies that this is why he called juveniles immature. Did Sang Wook never think the school would try to protect him? Maybe his emotional instability led him to imagine the worst case scenario. Could it be that he's making this appeal because he wanted revenge? The accusation causes Sang Wook to start dry heaving and flee from the room. Sang Wook cannot believe that adults don't really care about their pain. In his hurry to get away, he bumps into a man who points him to the bathroom. However, the man seems to be familiar to Sang Wook. Meanwhile, Mr. Lee also asks Hanrim if they truly believe that the answer to violence is more violence. Do they really stand for true justice? Hanrim is getting flustered and is about to fight back when Huajin abruptly enters the room and tells Mr. Lee that he's mistaken. Huajin explains that he understands how the goal of the youth justice system is rehabilitation, not punishment. However, the TRPA exists to protect the students and teachers whose rights have been violated. Therefore, their activities are geared toward helping the victims. Meanwhile, Mr. Lee also elucidates why the youth justice system emphasizes rehabilitation over punishment. This is because most youth offenders come from poverty, neglect, and domestic violence. As a result, kids end up in the streets and get caught up in crime. Children cannot choose their family, so the responsibility of youth crime lies partially with society. That's why it wouldn't be right to force the youth to take full responsibility for their actions. Rather, it is society's duty to educate and give them another chance. In response, Huijin narrates how before he joined the TRPA, he didn't know much about teens. As such, he played games to get a taste of youth culture. He's not very good at it, so he ended up hearing a lot of bad words. He still wouldn't give up playing, but the other team would also continue playing with them, taunting them the entire time. For him, that's also how bullying works. Humans derive pleasure from feeling superior to others, and bullying is a violent expression of that phenomenon. In other words, rehabilitation is very difficult because bullies bully for pleasure. That's why it's best to separate the aggressor and the source of their pleasure, the victim. Mr. Lee asks Huajin for proof that Sean Hak was bullying for his own pleasure, but it was Sang Wook who answers. He told them how Sean Hak called him a toy when he came to get revenge. He admits to Mr. Lee that he does want revenge against Sean Hak. However, what he truly wants most is to go to school without being terrified. After hearing this, the committee leader thanks them for their statements and informs them that they will give their verdict after some deliberation. Later, Hanrim goes to take Sang Wook back to his house while Huijin waits for the results of the appeal. In the parking lot, he notices Mr. Lee lighting a cigarette so they share a brief smoke. Mr. Lee asks Huijin why he looks like he thinks he won. The outcome of the appeal was decided before it was even started. Mr. Lee remarks that the current administrative appeal was quite uncharacteristic. They usually take three to six months to finish. But this case only took two weeks from acceptance to verdict. The reason for this speed was the meddling of a certain very powerful organization. In other words, the TRPA, which is why the verdict will be exactly what Huijin wanted. Sion Hak will be transferred to another school. In other words, this wasn't a victory through reason, but power. Huijin tries to point out that they didn't do anything, but Mr. Lee quickly replies that he doesn't mean the TRPA forced the committee. This is just how bureaucracy works. Would the committee really go against the Minister of Education, their ultimate superior? Furthermore, TRPA's methods had already attracted a lot of public attention and the media is sure to report their every move. However, this isn't going to end with Son Hak's transfer or expulsion. Due to the results of the case, Son Hak was thrown out of his gym. Not only that, but everywhere he goes other people are now making fun of him. The mistakes he made as a youth will affect Son Hak for the rest of his life. Mr. Lee then asks Huajin if branding a minor like that is okay. Huajin replies that if Sean Hack truly feels remorse, then he will view that branding as retribution, not a shameful marking. 
After all, Huijin has seen this happen time and again while doing this job. The first step toward a second chance is true self-reflection. Mr. Lee tells Huijin that they probably won't see eye to eye, but he also promises Huijin that if the TRPA ever gets dissolved, then he probably have a role in it. He then drives away, leaving Huijin behind who feels like they will probably meet again. Suddenly, Huijin's phone rings and when he answers it, to his surprise it was Yuri Han asking him for pizza. A few hours later, Huijin is at their prison bringing her pizza. The truth was Yuri invited him to visit because of an issue with another inmate. The other girl accompanying Yuri introduces herself as Yujon Oh, a girl in prison because she murdered someone. The problem is that her sister, a third year in middle school, is missing. Yujon explains that their father was abusive, so she left home in her first year of high school. Half a year ago, her sister contacted her to tell her that she had also run away. They would write each other letters occasionally, but she got one last letter two months ago, and then they stopped. Yujon hands the letter to Weijin, but she suddenly freaks out. Yuri calms her down and tells her that Huijin is not a bad man. It turns out that Yu Zhang has a fear of men. Reading the letter, Huijin learns that Yu Zhang's little sister found someone to take care of her before all the letters suddenly stop. Yuri then asks Huijin if he had ever heard of the term helpers. Meanwhile, in a secluded place somewhere, a girl is trying to quietly sneak out but sadly, she was caught. Yu Zhang narrates that the person she murdered was a helper. The guy gave him food and shelter. But every night, he would do things to her. One night, she couldn't take it anymore, so she hit his head and accidentally murdered him. She's worried about what situation her sister might be in right now and she's not even sure if she's still alive. Yuri consoles the crying Yujong and promises her that she'll and Weijin will find her sister. Wajin is surprised to hear this, but Yuri just looks at her with a scheming face. A few hours later, Hanrim is surprised to see Weijin with Yuri, who is now out of prison. She angrily berates Huijin but Yeri points out that if they want to catch a helper, they would need the help of a miner like her. Yeri points out that Hanrim wouldn't pass off as a miner, so they need her help. The two girls start arguing and Huijin leaves, telling them that they should split up so their search would be more efficient. A few minutes later, Yeji starts taking pictures and finishes creating her account. She then posts a tweet looking for people willing to help a runaway. In less than five minutes, the two girls watch as thirsty men start messaging her telling her that they can give her money and a place to stay. Yuri hypothesizes that if Yu Zhang's sister is being held captive, then she's probably being forced to do illegal work. As such, they should try the men offering work first. Later, Yuri meets up with a guy and gets into his car. Meanwhile, Hanram stealthily follows them in her own vehicle. The man starts bragging about money so Yuri asks him if he really has a job for her. However, the guy admits that he's willing to let Yeri stay with him for a few days. Annoyed that her plan failed, Yeri demands that she be dropped off. When the man protests, she angrily shoves open the door, damaging it against a pole on the side of the road. The man stops the car to check on his car and curses Yeri, but Yeri kicks him away. The man threatens to take her to the police, but Yeri points out that he's done worse for abducting a minor. She then leaves and goes back to Hanram. With their first target of failure, Yeri was about to message another man when she noticed that there was news about a middle school runaway being murdered. Wejin hurriedly goes to the police and shows them a picture of Yujong's sister, asking them if she was the girl found dead. After his trip to the police station, Wejin calls Hanrim and Yeri to inform them that the victim wasn't Yujong's sister. Nevertheless, this is still bad for them because when a case like this happens, it makes the other helpers more nervous which leads to more incidents. Meanwhile, the next scene shows that the girl who tried to run away earlier was Yu Zhang's sister, and she was beaten up for trying to run away. The person who beat her up reports to the others that the girl might not be able to work for a while since her face is messed up a bit. Instead, they can just get a different girl. The person had also seen Yuri's posts on social media. Later that night, Yuri and Hanrim are planning their next move when Yuri points out that it doesn't make sense that Yu Zhang's sister would go to a helper. After all, she knows that Yu Zhang went to prison for murdering a helper and Yu Zhang also warned her sister how dangerous they are. That means there's something that could help them narrow down their suspects. The two then start eating when they abruptly hear a commotion coming from another room. They quickly go to investigate and they see a girl running away. They follow the girl to a stairwell where they see a man beating up the girl who tried to run away. Hanrim immediately punches the man and attempts to call the police. However, the girl quickly stops her and begs her not to call the authorities. Hanrim tries to assure her that she won't get into trouble, 
but the girl points out that the police would contact her parents. She would rather die than go home. Hanrim was surprised at this, and even more so when Yuri suddenly held her down. Yuri then tells the girl to run away while she holds down Hanrim. After the girl leaves, Hanrim angrily asks Yuri why she stopped her when they could have helped the victim. However, Yuri coldly explains one thing she had learned from her time in prison, is that there are more hellhole homes than anyone can imagine, and the only answer for kids is to run away. Unfortunately, all authorities call the parents, including shelters and the police so kids cannot ask them for help. They can't even get part-time jobs without their parents' permission. There's nothing a runaway can do. Meanwhile, Weijin calls Hanrim and tells her that he has been talking to another group of runaways. From them, he learned that there might be one helper who could have convinced Yu Jong's sister to lower her guard. He then sends the suspect's profile to Hanrim, and the two girls immediately agree that the suspect might be their target. The next day, Yeri meets with their suspect, a woman helper. Yeri narrates to the helper how she's been running away from home for the last six months. The helper assures Yeri that she knows what it's like to be a runaway girl since she also ran away when she was 15. That's why she now spends her free time helping other girls like her. There are more girls like Yeri in her place. Meanwhile, Hanrim is eavesdropping on their conversation from a listening device on Yeri. Yeri shows the woman a photo of Yu Jong's sister and asks her if that girl is in her place. She explains that she's a friend of her sister and she ran away too. The woman thinks for a moment and asks Yeri if she's talking about Yanjong oh since she is at her place. A little while later, she brings Yeri inside a house where a group of girls are also staying. The woman asks where Yanjong is, and the girl explains that she went out for a while. As such, the woman volunteers to cook since they have a new housemate while Yeri chats with the other girls. One of them introduces herself as Seo Lian and tells Yeri that they aren't expected to do anything so she can just relax. They then share a meal while Hanrim is also eavesdropping and eating in her car. The woman gives Yeri more food and reassures her again, telling her that there are no men there and they are just like one big family. Looking at the smiling faces of the other girls, it does look like a family. However, Yeri still wasn't fooled since she knows it's impossible for a group of teenage girls to live together and none of them be bossy. These girls are probably planning something since she used to do the same thing all the time way back in her bullying days. A few hours later, Yeri falls asleep and the other girls immediately encircle her. The helper woman tells them that they know what to do and leaves the room with Seo Leong. Outside, Seo Leong asks the helper how she always makes new girls fall asleep so quickly. The woman explains that runaway kids are usually starving and tired, so if someone just gives them some food and makes them comfortable, sleep comes naturally, especially in a place with a warm family atmosphere. Meanwhile, the other girls inside start taking pictures of Yuri and are about to pull up her skirt when Yuri finally stops pretending she was asleep. The helper and Seo Liang suddenly hear a loud racket coming from inside the house and when they enter, they see that Yuri had knocked out most of the girls. Yuri had learned that they were forcing girls to work for them by taking naughty pictures of them and using that as blackmail. Seo Liang angrily kicks Yuri, but Yuri is quicker and electrocutes Seo Liang with a hidden taser. Scared that she's next, the helper quickly dials someone on her phone and tells them that she needs help in room 6. Yuri laughs and tells her that she's not alone either. Outside, a man goes out of a car to enter the house, but Hanrim is already blocking his way. Inside the house, Yeri is electrocuting the helper and demanding that she reveal where Yunjong truly is. The helper explains that Yunjong is currently working. She's out fooling around with lecherous old men. Yeri was about to attack the woman again in anger, but more girls abruptly arrived from outside. Seeing their boss being attacked, they quickly go to her defense. Outside, Hanrim had knocked out the guy who tried to enter the house when she heard from her phone that Yeri was being overwhelmed by the other girls. The helper orders the other girls to bring Yeri to the boys' room so she'll learn her lesson. The girls drag Yeri outside but thankfully Hanrim has arrived and punches the girls. She then grabs Yeri's hand and they flee outside. The boys from the boys' room also see them and start chasing them too. Thankfully, they manage to hide from the numerous runaway kids by hiding on the rooftop of a building. Hanrim wonders how many kids the helper has and Yuri guesses that it must be at least six rooms full of people because the woman called their room room six. But first, Yuri implores Hanrim to look for Yunjong since she might be in danger at her work. Hanrim's phone suddenly buzzed, and it was Huijin informing them that she might have found Yunjong. 
Meanwhile, the helper is scolding and beating up the runaway kids for failing to capture Yeri. They plan to ask Yeonjong if she knows Yeri since she's clearly the one Yeri was looking for. Meanwhile, Seo Leong asks their helper why Yeonjong is working when her face still isn't fully healed. The helper admits that Yeonjong's client tonight doesn't seem to care about her face as long as she's a middle school student. Yeonjong is in a car outside a karaoke place where her guard is yelling at her to get out of the car and start working. Yeonjong begs her guard if she can skip tonight since she has a bad feeling about her customer today. Not only that, but she's also afraid due to the recent news of a runaway girl being murdered. Her guard reassures her that he'll protect her if she does her job right. Thus, her guard leaves her behind, promising to pick her up when the job is done. Yeonjong notices a couple of policemen patrolling, and she was about to ask them for help when she remembers how her father used to beat her. The memory stills her hand, and she forces herself to go to her job. Upon entering her customer's room, she is horrified to see the guy singing a crazy song. However, the guy stops singing when she enters and asks her if she wants a turn at the karaoke. The guy is waging himself pretending to be a customer. An hour later, Yeonjong is confused since she only spent the whole time singing. The man's time is almost up and yet he never laid a finger on her. Out of nowhere, the man then calls her name and tells her that he was there because her sister asked him for help. She gets horrified when he sees the man has her sister's letter, and she asks him how she got her letter. Is he stalking her? Does he have her sister? Wajin tries to calm the panicking girl down, but Yeonjong abruptly runs away from the room. Outside, Wajin manages to catch up to Yeonjong and stop her, but her guard suddenly interrupts him. The guard tells him that if he wants more time, he'll have to pay more. Wajin punches the guy numerous times and tells him that that's his payment. He was about to go talk to Yeonjong again, but she had already gotten into a cab that drove away. Thankfully, Hanrim and Yeri quickly arrive in their own car, and they call out to Huijin to get in. Meanwhile, Yeonjong is being scolded by the cab driver after he found out that she doesn't have any money. She promises to pay him back if he just leaves his phone number. But the cab driver already has other plans. He recognizes from her clothes that Yeonjong must be a runaway teen working the streets so instead he offers that she stays in his place as payment. Yeonjong realizes what the man wants, and she quickly runs away again. She had never understood why her sister ran away when she was little. Her sister was always positive, had good grades, and never made any trouble. And yet, when she was in her first year of middle school, her sister left their home. She couldn't understand why, but a few years later when her body started maturing, she finally understood why. Her sister had no other choice, and so did she. When she ran away, she tried to get a job to support herself, but the establishment asked for her parents' contact information. She tried to explain that her father would never permit them and instead would come and get her again, but the establishment owner tells her that it's the law that they cannot take responsibility for her without her parents' consent. She leaves without getting a job, and that's when she meets the woman helper. Yeonjong knows that almost no adult will help runaway teens like her without any ulterior motives. But if she wanted to stay alive, she had no choice. Thus, she accepted the woman's offer. Back in the present, Yeonjong is crying in the stairwell of a random building, not knowing what she'd do next. Suddenly, a girl comfortingly hugs her. She asks the girl who she is, and the girl explains that she's a runaway like her. It's supposed to be cold tonight, so she was just hoping to hug her, so they won't freeze to death. Thus, Yeonjong allows the girl to hug her all the while thinking of her older sister. Meanwhile, Huijin and Hanrim happily watch over Yuri hugging Yeonjong. They were glad that they decided to bring Yeri along after all since the kids clearly don't trust adults anymore. She then tells Hanrim to watch over the girls while he guards them outside. Hanrim asks Huijin what they would do with the wound helper since she's clearly using all the runaway kids as workers in crime. Huijin smiles and tells her that taking care of that whole operation is actually very easy. Later that day, the TRPA's website and social media account announced that they will be launching a new runaway support group. There will be free food and housing, and they promise not to contact their parents nor collect any personal information. A few days later, the helper woman is at the department store shopping for new bags and clothes. After paying with her credit card, she receives more messages from people asking for more girls and boys. Happy that her business is booming, she calls Seo Leon and orders her to send some of the boys and girls to their clients. However, Seo Leon tells her some bad news. Half of the kids they've been sheltering had run away last night. Meanwhile, more and more kids are answering the TRPA's call for safe shelter and Yuri assures the oncoming kids that they'll be taken care of there. 
Not only that, a group of girls that came from the woman helper's old place apologizes to Yunjong for hitting her and being mean to her. Their boss made them do it, but now that they're all safe, they just want to be safe. Yunjong smiles at them and happily welcomes them to the place. Even Hanrim and Weijin are glad that their plan is working. Wajin remarks that most runaways don't leave home planning to commit crimes. It's just that they don't have anywhere to stay so they're forced to. If they have a warm place to sleep and food in their stomachs, they won't get caught up in crime. Hanrim also suggests that they catch the helpers before they run away while all the kids are safely in their care. Wajin informs her that the helpers probably won't run away since people who have tasted that kind of money would probably not easily surrender that. Meanwhile, the helper woman is once again beating up one of the girls who tried to run away. Later, Seo Liang suggests that maybe they should just shut down their operation and move to the province. With the money they earned, they could just open a cafe or something. Unfortunately, the woman helper admits that she is broke. Not only does she have nothing saved up, but she also won't even be able to pay off their next month's credit card debt. Seo Liang angrily grabs the helper's shirt and demands that she get her pay. After all, the helper promised to pay her six months worth of rent when she became an adult. The helper calmly jams her cigarette at Seo Liang's face and shouts at her that she should be thankful for her. If not for the helper, she would have already been beaten to death by her stepfather. Or else, should she still call her stepfather and report her location? This suddenly gives the helper an idea and she announces that if the TRPA shelter won't contact the kid's parents, then she will. At the shelter, Yeri is telling Yunjong stories about her sister in prison. They are planning to visit her the next day in prison so Yeri suggests that they should go to sleep. While lying down in bed, Yunjong can't sleep since her body is used to working during the night. She kept thinking about her sister and based on Yeri's story, she realized that her sister probably felt safest in prison. Meanwhile, her phone suddenly rings and what she reads from it shocks her. A little while later, all the girls who ran away from the woman helper are slowly coming back to her with their heads down. The woman smiles at them and threatens that if they were even one minute late, she would have told their parents where they are. She then abruptly grabs Yanjong by the hair and starts slapping her around for running away. She tells them that they were fools to trust the government since they would just call their parents and send them back to their hell homes. She reminds them that for runaway kids, there's no place where they would be safe. However, Yunjong suddenly speaks up and replies to the woman that there is a place where they will give you a warm place to sleep and three meals a day. It's a place where parents or even cruel people like the helpers cannot follow. She then reaches into her pocket and pulls out a knife. Back at the shelter, Yeri wakes up to find a letter from Yunjong telling her that she'll find her sister herself. Meanwhile, Yunjong slashes the helper with a knife, wounding her in the arm. Yunjong had started muttering to herself about how long she can stay in prison where she'll finally be safe from her father. The helper tries to order the other kids to stop Yunjong, but they're all afraid of the deranged girl wielding a knife. Realizing that Yunjiang is planning to murder her, the helper runs away for her life. While running, the helper realized that prison doesn't sound bad compared to being a runaway teen. When she herself ran away back then, she went through hell. While running, she ended up bumping into Hanrim and Yuri. Hanrim immediately punches her in the face, knocking her down. When Yunjong appears wielding a knife, Hanrim calmly tries to convince her to put it down. Instead, Yunjong is about to bring down the knife on the unconscious helper. But Yeri suddenly hugs her and tells her that if she does that, the TRPA would send her to prison like what they did to her. Yunjong replies that going to prison is what she wants so Yeri should let her go. Yeri instead tells her that what the TRPA wants more than catching bad guys is the safety of the victims. She assures her that the wardens have always been three steps ahead of the bad guys. As such, Yeri promises that no one's going to get dragged back home. The woman helper laughs and tells them they won't be able to keep that promise. After all, she had already sent the text informing all the parents of the runaway kids where their children are. Meanwhile, the front of the shelter is filled with parents shouting at Weijin to bring their kids out. They accuse Weijin of kidnapping their children illegally and threaten to call the police. Yunjong trembles at the thought of seeing her dad, while the helper shouts out that that's why people like her are needed so runaways can have some place to stay. Yuri and Hanrim cringe at what she's saying, and they inform her that they already took that into account. In fact, it's a good thing that the helper called the parents. At the shelter, Weijin starts handcuffing the parents and tells them that he's glad they're there and calling the police. He then points out their own crimes, from sexual assault against a minor, domestic abuse, child negligence, or gaslighting. 
he assures them that he has enough handcuffs for all of them. In a flash, Wajin was able to put handcuffs on all the parents rallying in front of the shelter. He then informs them that they are all criminals who drove their children out on the streets through domestic violence. Nevertheless, he'll give them one last chance to get out of their cuffs if they follow him. Inside the shelter, he hands out a waiver giving the parents consent to allow their children to stay in the youth shelter. If they sign it and promise never to go near their children again, then Huijin will let them go. One of the mothers nervously exclaims that she never laid a finger on her son's Sikhan, so she doesn't understand why she's there. She just wants her son back. In response, Huijin pulls out a phone and plays a recording of her son narrating about his life. His mom had piled an enormous amount of pressure on him to study hard. One time, he fell asleep on his desk while studying and his mom ran into his room with a kitchen knife and threatened to take her own life if he didn't study. Sikhan only saw three choices in his future. Either he dies, his mom dies, or he runs away. Thus, he chose to run away. His mom tries to explain herself to Huijin that she was just trying to motivate her son, but Huijin points out that what she was doing is a form of emotional abuse. He then plays another one of the kid's confessions, this time narrating how her father was a violent drunk. Another recording tells of how his father puts him on a leash and is starred by his jobless father. Lastly, he plays Yu Zhang's confession, revealing how her dad used to beat her senselessly. However, this was just a way to stop her so she wouldn't struggle when he sexually abused her. With all their crimes now laid out in front of them, he tells them that if it was up to him, they would all be in jail now. Unfortunately, their kids don't want to send them to prison so as a compromise, he would just get their signed consent. Yu Zhang's father suddenly speaks up and tells him that his daughters are just lying. This encourages the other parents to all start yelling that their kids are just lying, and it would be their words against theirs so they can just call the police. Suddenly, Yun Zhang enters the room. She had returned with Hanrim and the others, and she yells out that they aren't lying. With her face still bleeding from the earlier flight, she tells them that she knows why they're not afraid of the police. It's because the police had already come to their homes before, but they didn't involve themselves in family matters. Well, this time, she's going to tell them everything her dad did. She's going to make sure her dad would live the rest of his life branded as an abuser. Her dad gets angry and abruptly charges at Yanjong. Hanrim and Yeji quickly step in front of Yanjong, but what stops the dad from his attack was a kick from no other than the female helper herself. She was planning to just enjoy watching the kids get dragged back to their homes for rebelling against her, but seeing the parents reminded her of her own abusive parents. She yells out to all the parents there that she had sold their daughters to perverts and their sons to crime rings. If they misbehave, she starves and beats them. And yet, they never ran away. Why? Because she's still better than most of their own homes. She laughs at them and points out that most helpers are past runaways too, so if they're curious to see what their children's future looks like, then they can just look at her. The female helper then picks up the waiver consent form and tells Huijin that his waiver wouldn't change anything. Instead, children should be judged of whether to throw away their parents. A few minutes later, Yun Zhang's dad is getting dragged away by the police while he screams threats and obscenities at his daughter. The female helper is also being taken away by the police when Yiji happily tells her that they'll meet again soon, confusing the helper. Meanwhile, the two TRPA wardens watch as the other parents leave after signing the waiver. Hanrim comments on how sad it is that the parents came and yet no children even came out to see them. She also kind of agrees with what the helper lady said earlier. Huajin tells her that if they allow kids to disown their parents, it will cause chaos. However, there's still some truth to what she said. Adults only make things worse as shown in the case of the special immunity rule for kids under 14 years old and as to how the school violence committee judged bullying. A group of runaways arrive and ask them if they really won't tell their parents where they are. Huajin nods and tells them to follow him inside. A few days later, Yu Zhang and Yeji read a letter from her little sister, who is now slowly going back to school. They also get a new cellmate, Hayame Yeo, the helper woman who exploited all the kids. Yeji throws a book at her, and the helper woman was surprised to see that she was a convict all along. Yeji then introduces her to Yu Zhang and tells her that this was the woman who mistreated her younger sister. Yu Zhang cruelly orders the woman to clean up the room, starting her laborious hazing and penance for her crimes. Meanwhile, Hanrim and Weijin bade goodbye to the youth shelter director and apologized for causing such a commotion in the past few days. Before they leave, the director tells them that a kid arrived wanting to talk with them directly. The kid, Ju Zhang, tells them how he was rescued by fishermen after barely escaping from their town. 
Hua Jin asks him if he wants to press charges on his parents, but Ju Zhang clarifies that his parents are good people. But the police also probably wouldn't help since the ones who tried to murder him are the whole town itself. A few days ago, in Ju Zhang's town, a storm was raging outside the police station when a lady suddenly stumbled inside. The police on duty recognizes the lady as the new teacher and asks him what happened. The lady is about to tell him how the town tried to murder him when one of the townspeople himself entered the station. He then borrowed an umbrella from his nephew, the policeman, and volunteers to take the teacher home. Realizing that even the policeman wasn't on her side, the teacher had no choice but to go with the man. While walking, the man warns her that in their community, town law overrides national law, and if someone breaks it, it will get a town punishment. The man starts dragging the woman by the hair as more and more men arrive to help him. This was what Ju Zhang witnessed, and he begged Wei Jin to go save his teacher. Yu Zhuang's dad had always dreamed of a simple life in the countryside, so they decided to buy a house and move to a quiet town. However, it wasn't long before the neighborhood association arrived and asked them for 30 million won as association fees. His dad was horrified at the exorbitant amount and tried to explain that they went into debt after buying the house, but the men threatened that they seemed to not want to be a true resident of the town. From that day onward, they were treated horribly. Women would dry fruits in front of their house blocking the road, manures smeared on their walls, and untrue rumors spread around. Yu Jong was also bullied by the kids of the other townspeople. No one was on their side except for one person, his teacher, Nis Son, who was also from Sewell like them. Yu Jong knows that Nis Son was also having a hard time with the townsfolk. She was always dragged by parents to help with farm work and was forced to drink at social gatherings. She was the only reason the boy could even tolerate the town. Mr. Gu, the town head, arrives and once again invites Miss Son to a social gathering. Left with no choice, she was forced to accept the invitation and she promised Yu Zhang to talk to the townsfolk and get them to stop bullying him. Meanwhile, at home, his father had given up and decided to just pay the association fee for the sake of his bullied son. He hands Ju Zhang the money and tells him to give it to Mr. Gu. However, that's when he witnesses Mr. Gu dragging Miss Son by the hair. Miss Son promised never to reveal what she learned during the meeting. But Mr. Gu reminds her that he is the law in this town. Thankfully, Ju Zhang decided to intervene at that moment and take pictures. The flash saved his teacher. The townsfolk started chasing after him. He never knew what happened to Miss Son. Thus, Wei Jin heads to the town holding the evidence given to him by Ju Zhang. On the boat to the town, Wei Jin puts on glasses and a wig on Hanrim and tells her that she will be going undercover. Since public officials would just make the town more wary, they would cast off their authority and identity. When they finally reach the town, Mr. Gu welcomes them and leads them to the teacher's quarters. The two introduce themselves, with Hanrim being the newly transferred teacher sent by the Ministry of Education and Hui Jin explaining that he's her older brother who just tagged along. While Hanrim leaves with the principal Mr. Na, Mr. Gu and the men demand Hui Jin that they should pay 5 million won as a neighborhood association fee. They point out that since his sister would probably be staying there for at least two years, then they should try to be good neighbors. Hui Jin refuses to pay and points out that even in his old job, they weren't that shameless in stealing from people. One of the men grabs Hui Jin by the shirt and threatens him, but Mr. Gu stops the man and warns Hui Jin that he would be crying back later. Mr. Gu walks away telling his men that they should focus first on finding Gu Zhang with their pictures since the new arrivals would be staying there indefinitely. He also wonders what Hui Jin meant when he mentioned his old job. At school, Mr. Na welcomes Hanrim into his office. Hanrim asks Mr. Na if he should really be smoking indoors, but Mr. Na explains to her that in this town, they don't really bother with such little details. He then tries to grab Hanrim by the thigh while warning her that in this town, the elders get the say and the last teacher who disobeyed them got punished. Meanwhile, Hui Jin is looking for Ju Zhang's address throughout the neighborhood. When he reaches it, he discovers that it was currently being attacked by Mr. Gu and his men. Ju Zhang's father tried to protest, but Mr. Gu tells him that their son had stolen his family heirloom and he won't stop until he gets the boy. Ju Zhang's dad grabs Mr. Gu by the shirt and screams at him that they themselves are the most worried about their missing son. He was supposed to pay Mr. Gu, but he ended up missing. One of the men kicks Ju Zhang's dad and was about to hit him with a stick when Hui Jin stops him. He threatens the man, but the man wasn't phased and swings his stick at Hua Jin. Meanwhile, Hanrim had caught Mr. Na's hand who tried to grab her thigh, 
She asks him what happened to the past transfer teacher who got punished while slowly squeezing and crushing his hand with her own grip. Mr. Ne cries out and asks if she's not a teacher but instead a thug. Back at Ju Jong's house, Weijin had knocked out the man who just tried to hit him with a stick. He then asks Mr. Gu how he himself can be town head since getting his men to beat people up and extort their money sounds very much like his old job, and it looks like this town of his is the perfect spot for Weijin to start his own turf. At that same moment, Hanram explains to Mr. Na that she's not a thug, her older brother is. After scaring away Mr. Gu and his men, Weijin civilly returns the money from Ju Jong and explains that his son is safe with them. After he leaves, Han Rim arrives to tell him what she learned from Mr. Na. Mr. Na had told her that Miss Son has been absent from work for three days now. However, it's fishy that three days ago was also the same day that Ju Jong escaped. They try to visit Miss Son's place, but no one answers the door and the electricity meter hasn't moved either. A policeman arrives and asks them what they're doing there so Han Rim explains that she's the new teacher and she was lost. The guard points them to their own place, but the two TRP wardens have noticed that the policeman has been tailing them for a while already. Mr. Gu probably ordered him to do it. Later that night, the town elders are having a drink, and they share information on the two newcomers. Mr. Na tells them how Hanrim had squeezed her hand, and his thug brother might be the reason why she's so confident. The policeman also arrives and reports to them that Huijin and Hanrim went snooping around Miss Song's residence. Meanwhile, Mr. Gu's servant, a huge hulking man, serves him some liquor but accidentally spills it because of the policeman's movement. The policeman gets angry and starts beating up the servant. At school, Hanrim introduces herself to the school's faculty, but no one acknowledges her. Wajin warned her earlier that they probably won't get a warm welcome because of what they did, and it looks like his prediction was right. Mr. Gu also arrives at the school, and everyone enthusiastically stands up and greets him a stark contrast to how they welcomed Hanrim. Mr. Gu informs them that a typhoon is coming later tonight, and he was hoping to borrow a teacher to help them build an embankment. Of course, Hanrim was the one selected. On the way to the port, Hanrim apologizes for her brother's behavior yesterday. Mr. Gu tells him that five years ago, they also had a bit of a misunderstanding. A reporter and a detective came pretending to start a fish market business, but of course they also stopped them. Hanrim gets suspicious and asks him why he's telling her this. Meanwhile, they finally reach the warehouse where they're building the embankment and Mr. Gu lets her in. Inside were a couple of men who surrounded Hanrim. He then tells her that what she was doing yesterday was like the trouble they had and asks her if Huijin is really her brother. It was very suspicious that they arrived a few days later when they had lost a boy. Hanrim squeals and cries out that they're scaring her. Her brother wasn't a reporter but just a normal thug. However, her very poor acting just enrages the men, and one grabs her hair and pulls. To his bewilderment, the whole hair was removed. Hanrim sighs since her undercover work is over but she's glad. She was annoyed that Huijin got to act as a thug while she was forced to act as a good girl. She also wanted to be a thug too. She definitely made quick work of the men, knocking them all out. Hanrim then twists Mr. Gu's arm and demands to know where Miss Son is. Mr. Gu confesses that he has no idea where Miss Son is. She ran off in the other direction when they went chasing after Ju Jong. They are also still looking for her. Hanrim realizes that he was telling the truth from his way of speaking. But before she can act, Mr. Gu's servant suddenly tells her that she should stop. Hanrim quickly elbows the guy in the face, but the servant was unfazed and instead just wraps her in his big arms and carries her like a sack. Hanrim was shocked at his immense strength. He was probably stronger than Weijin because Hanrim couldn't even move an inch. Mr. Gu compliments his servant Whale and orders him to teach her a lesson. However, Whale exits the warehouse and just gently puts Hanrim down and waves goodbye. Mr. Gu whacks Whale with a shovel and scolds him for disobeying orders. Whale replies that he can't hit ladies because his father said so. Mr. Gu suddenly receives a call from his men telling him that Huijin is making trouble all over the island. First, Huijin destroyed a car blocking the road and scolded the guy for extorting money from a passing truck. Next, he pesters the women to stop spreading mean gossip. Then he berates the people for throwing their trash on the sidewalk. When the policemen came to stop him, he just kneed him and knocked him unconscious. Later, the elders were once again having a meeting on how to get rid of their two troublemakers. Thunder rumbles outside signaling the arrival of the storm and Mr. Gu smiles. He remarks that in weather like that, no one will suspect if one or two people mysteriously get hurt. 
Meanwhile, Hanram also reports to Weijin that the townspeople also don't know where Miss Son is. She also asks why they're having the meeting by candlelight instead of light. Wajin informs her that it's because they're expecting guests soon. And right on cue, the two TRPA wardens hear people sneaking near the house. Outside, a group of townsfolk had arrived bearing various weapons expecting that the two occupants of the house were asleep because the lights were off. Inside, Weijin and Hanrem prepare their batons and happily wait for the fight to start. The policeman is about to quietly open the house's door when Huijin suddenly slams it open right in the policeman's face. The others quickly attack them with their makeshift weapons while Huijin orders Hanrim to remember her tactical training. In a flash, they were able to get past all the armed townsfolk and Huijin provokes them to try and catch them. With the whole group chasing them, the two TRP wardens head to the forest. A few minutes later, the men are looking for them inside the forest, but the darkness and rain made it harder than it should. However, they are still confident that they'll win since they know this forest more than the outsiders. In a flash, one of them disappears as Huijin strangles one of the men while the others aren't looking. A few seconds later, Hanrum quietly dangles from a tree and strangles another one. One by one, they were eliminating their pursuers. They were no match for the special training of the two special forces. At his house, Mr. Gu is waiting for a report from the townsfolk about their mission, but when one of his men called him, they report that something strange was happening. It started with 30 men, but now, there are only 4 left. Unfortunately, they couldn't explain more since Huijin and Hanrim arrived and attacked them. Huijin tells the remaining men that he'll let them go if they tell him where Miss Son is, and this time, Mr. Gu's servant Whale replies that he knows where she is. However, he wants to know first why Huijin is looking for her. Even the other men are surprised that Whale knows where she is, but Huijin hits them and announces that the only one who can talk is Whale. Seeing Huijin attack, Whale slams his fist at Huajin, but Huajin blocks him with his arm. The block breaks Huajin's wrist while Whale informs him that even though he cannot hit women, he can hit bad thugs like Huajin. He cannot give the nice teacher to bad people. Hanrim volunteers to handle Whale, but Huajin points out that this isn't fair to Whale who can't fight girls. As such, he'll handle Whale while Hanrim takes care of the remaining townsfolk. From Whale's perspective, everyone, whether young or old, had looked at him the same way. They always tell him that he was dumb and slow, so they punish him. This makes him think that he deserved to be beaten and insulted. But then, Miss Son came and showed him what it was like to be treated as a fellow human being. From that moment on, he decided that no matter what happens, he will protect her. Therefore, he must fight Huijin who was looking for her. Meanwhile, Mr. Gu was warned from the phone call earlier that his plan wasn't working so he is looking for a new place to hide from Huijin. Whale keeps on throwing powerful punches at Huajin, but he cannot seem to hit the guy. Meanwhile, Hanrim finishes knocking out all the other men who tried to attack them. Huajin dodges Whale's next punch and counterattacks, hitting him clearly on the chin and on the knee, bringing the big guy down. Whale shields himself as he thought that Huajin was pulling out a knife from his pocket, but Huajin just shows his ID to him. He apologizes for hitting Whale and he explains that they're not thugs. They are from the TRPA, and they are here to help Miss Son. Based on what Whale said earlier, he must be protecting her from Mr. Gu. Therefore, he asks Whale again where Miss Son truly is. A few days earlier, when the whole town was chasing Gu Zhang, Miss Son also managed to escape from Mr. Gu's grasp and run away. Thankfully, Whale was there to help her hide from Mr. Gu. He took her to a safe place and even brought her clothes and some food. He then promised to take her to the mainland when the typhoon was finally over. Miss Son asked him to call the TRPA for her, but Whale wasn't allowed to use the phone, and he didn't know how to use one even if he had one. Back in the present, Whale apologizes for hitting Huijin and informs him that he hid Miss Son at the shack that the city fishing club built since he was the only person who goes there to clean. He then volunteers to lead Huijin and Hanrim there. Meanwhile, Miss Son is at the shack waiting for the typhoon to pass while writing a journal about everything she experienced. She hopes that even if she fails to escape, then her journal might at least help the TRPA to know what happens. She then hears a noise outside the shack, so she excitedly opens to let Whale in. However, it wasn't Whale. It was Mr. Gu who was also hoping to hide there. Mr. Gu smiles at her and locks the door behind them. A few minutes later, Whale and the TRPA wardens arrive, but what was inside stuns them. The inside of the shack was empty, but the wardens instantly observed that someone had broken in. 
Whale tells them that the only person who has a key is Mr. Goo, while Huijin picks up the journal and realizes that every page of it was torn out. He quickly shouts at the others to follow him since there's only one place Mr. Goo would go. Mr. Goo had taken a tied-up Miss Sohn to the port and was asking her why she had written all the bad things down like that. In the past, Miss Sohn had volunteered to come to the island town as soon as she passed her teacher certification exam. She did it because she learned that education was deteriorating in island towns, and she wanted to do something about it. Her friends worried about her adjusting to the local culture. But the moment Miss Sohn saw the view from the island, she knew she had made the right choice. But then she started running into completely unexpected problems. The townspeople would call on her the whole day, constantly violating her work and personal life. She could handle it because she was the only victim, but then, she overhears some kids planning to bully Gyojan just because their parents told them to do so. He decided to talk to the elders about it, but they once again forced her to drink and intimidated her into silence. During their meeting, she leaves to vomit from excessive drinking and cries that she couldn't stand up to them. Out of nowhere, a voice from a window asks her if she's okay. Looking inside, she saw Whale tied up and beaten. Whale assures him that it's normal since he messed up, so Mr. Goo beat him up. Instead, he insists that she go home since the elders were planning to do something to her after she gets drunk. He was beaten up because he protested. Unfortunately, Mr. Goo found her there and she ran for her life. Back in the present, Mr. Goo tells Miss Sohn how some reporter also tried to tell the truth about them. Thankfully, he gaslit them by accusing them of hateful regionalism. Now surely no one would notice if they reported that one woman was swallowed by the sea during the typhoon. Mr. Goo was about to kick her off the port and into the sea when Whale suddenly punched his teeth out. He then asks Miss Son if she's okay, who can't help but cry. Whale removes Miss Son's bindings and helps her stand up. Meanwhile, Mr. Goo recovers and shouts at Whale for hitting his master. He demands that Whale toss Miss Son to the ocean or else she would tell the authorities about them and ruin their lives. However, Huijin suddenly speaks up and points out that they would then need to shut them up too. He throws his ID at Mr. Goo and reveals that they are the authorities. He then orders Hanrim to finally arrest Mr. Goo. Mr. Goo quickly tells Whale to defend him because if he goes to prison, then something bad will happen to Whale's father. Thus, when Hanrim tries to cuff Mr. Goo, Whale swings his arm and slams Hanrim to the ground. Whale apologizes to Hanrim for hitting a lady, but if Mr. Goo goes to jail, then his father would die because Mr. Goo is the one who pays for his father's hospital bills. Hanrim readies herself for a fight, but Weijin stops her and asks Whale if he had seen his father. Whale explains that he cannot visit him since his father is in a coma. Wajin asks for Whale's real name and resident registration number. Whale knows his real name, but he doesn't know his own ID number. Thankfully, Miss Son knows it since she was planning to investigate Whale's situation when she got back to the mainland. With that information, Weijin calls his contact in the military and asks him to look someone up for him. After a few seconds, his contact explains that Whale is registered as a missing person from 15 years ago and his only family is his father. Wajin passes his phone to Whale so he can hear the information about his father. 15 years ago, Whale arrived at the port looking for a job to help his hospitalized father. A young Mr. Goo exploited him because of Whale's mental deficiencies. When Whale asks for his payment a year later, Mr. Goo tells him that since Whale doesn't have a bank account, He's been sending his wages to the hospital every month. Whale thanked him and went back to work. He worked from dawn till late at night, with Mr. Goo punishing him if he made a mistake. However, he didn't mind it and he was happy because he was helping his father. But now, the Weijin's contact explains to Whale that his father had died 14 years ago due to an illness, one year after Whale himself went missing. Whale tries to ask Mr. Goo if this is true, but Mr. Goo had already run far away. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't far enough. Whale grabbed him by the head and slammed him to the ground. He then asks again if his father is dead, and Mr. Goo explains that Whale should be thankful to him since he's been taking care of him all these years. In response, Whale pummels his face with Huijin and Hanrim just watching him get his revenge. A few minutes later, Whale finally stops on his own. He then points out that if Huijin and Hanrim's job is to teach people, then can they teach him what he should do now with his life? Two days later, the typhoon passed and Mr. Gu as well as his cronies were arrested. The police found a few more people who were being exploited like Whale, and they also found bags of cash Mr. Gu had accumulated from the exploited workers and extortion victims. The media quickly caught on the news and the town's reputation was completely ruined. 
As for Whale, he was detained on charges of assault since Mr. Goose's shattered face prevented him from avoiding prosecution. However, the police are all kind to him since they were still angry at the island's inhabitants. The news shows that residents are all angry at Whale for hurting the person who fed him and that the other accusations are all false. The policeman points out that the town would probably stay the same if the same people are living there. After he gets released, Whale tells Huajin and Miss Son that he's going back to the island. They try to explain that a lot of people want to help him so he can do anything he wants, but Whale admits that he saw the news while he was in prison. The news said that the teachers' quarters were too rundown and that the government shouldn't send lady teachers anymore. Others say that the town needs more police, but Whale thinks differently. If the town must change, then the people must change first. Since he lived there for 15 years, he must go back and make sure that people like Miss Son and Ju John are safe. Huajin and Miss Son smile, and they ask him to take care. Meanwhile, somewhere in Seoul, a teacher is having a hard time sleeping since her phone keeps ringing with non-stop calls from her student's mother and random texts. A week later at the Ministry of Education, Huajin's arm is fully healed, and he is ready for his new mission. To his surprise, Hanram only hands him one case, but what was written inside stuns him. It was a letter from a parent detailing how her child's teacher is a psychopath. The two TRP wardens head to the place where the teacher teaches, Haiyanjung Elementary School. Watching the teacher work, Hanrim was surprised since everything seemed normal. The students are listening, and the teacher is smiling. After class, Weijin calls out to the teacher, Miss Choi, and informs her that they received a report about her. To their horror, Miss Choi suddenly screams out loud and collapses. In her phone was a message from a parent threatening to report her to the TRPA. The two wardens quickly jump into action as Huijin picks up Miss Choi and Hanrim volunteers to drive them to the hospital. On the way there, they pass by another teacher who was surprised to see them, and Miss Choi being taken away. Miss Choi wakes up at the hospital where Huijin explains that she collapsed due to a panic attack and asks her if she's been feeling stressed lately. Instead of answering his question, Miss Choi brashly asks why they are there and if someone reported her to them. She then admits that it's all her fault and they can just punish her so they should leave. The two wardens exited the room confused as to how Miss Choi didn't even try to deny the report. The teacher they passed by earlier suddenly asks them if Miss Choi is okay and introduces herself as Miss Park, her co-teacher. Miss Park recognizes them from the TRPA and asks them why they were talking to Miss Choi. Huajin explains that they received a report about Miss Choi, but Miss Park suddenly asks if a parent reported Miss Choi as being mean to the students. Realizing that she knows something, Huajin asks her to tell them everything. Miss Park explains that in an elementary teacher's life, the hardest thing is not the kids, but the parents. Since most households have two working parents now, teachers get a ton of calls in the evenings. They don't mind if it's about the kids, but more often, Parents only call to use teachers as emotional dumpsters. Unfortunately, teachers aren't allowed to ignore the parents so they can't do anything about it. One day, two kids of Miss Choi got into a small fight, and although it was just a simple matter, their parents escalated it so much and demanded for a school violence committee. But when one of the mothers lost the case, she accused Miss Choi of taking the other's side, and ever since then, she's been calling and texting her nonstop. She even went to Miss Choi's home and complained to the principal about her. Miss Choi got more and more stressed and eventually, she became known in their neighborhood as a violent teacher due to online posts made by the parents. Miss Park even shows the post to Wei Jin and they recognize it as the same report submitted to them. Miss Park also confessed that she had heard Miss Choi muttering about how she was tired and just wants to get fired. Miss Park recognizes Miss Choi as a good teacher, so she wants to help her. As such, she begs Wei Jin to free elementary school teachers from the tyranny of the student's parents. After Miss Park leaves, Hanrim tells Weijin that they should file the report as a false accusation. But Weijin points out that Miss Park might be just trying to cover up for her colleague. But according to statistics, violation of teachers' rights isn't by students, but is truly by the parents themselves. A few hours later, the parents receive a text from the principal explaining how Miss Choi had taken a leave of absence and that a new teacher would be presiding over their kids. The bad parent quickly posts the text on their forum and announces that her complaint must have gone through. She relishes getting Miss Choi kicked out while Weijin is promising to make them pay for what they've done. Wearing another disguise, Hanrim introduces herself to the kids and explains that she'll be their new teacher since Miss Choi is sick and taking a break to rest. A kid concernedly asks if Miss Choi is going to be okay, 
so Hanram assures her that Miss Choi will be okay. Meanwhile, another kid asks Hanram why she looks so tired. One day earlier, Weijin ordered Hanram to go undercover as a teacher because they must figure out who was lying, the teachers or the parents. Hanram, however, rejects his plan. She agreed to be a teacher before because she only taught physical education, but elementary teachers must teach all the subjects and she clearly cannot do that. However, Huijin denies her rejection but instead forces her to just study out. Now, Hanrim is teaching math to the students, but one student speaks up and points out that her calculation is wrong. She quickly apologizes but the students just cheer her on. Seeing the kindness of the students and their concern for Miss Choi, Hanrim guesses that the report is truly wrong. At the same time, she also receives a text from one of the parents, Eugene's mom. She invited her to meet up with some other parents and Hanram quickly jumps at the chance to get in contact with them. When she got to meet them, they quickly barraged her with multiple questions, asking her age and her educational background. One asks her what happened to the previous teacher, so Hanram explains that she had to take a health leave after getting a stress-induced panic attack. She's only filling in until Miss Choi recovers and goes back to teaching. Hearing that, Eugene's mom smiles and explains to her that she's probably taking over the class permanently since Miss Choi is being punished. She then starts divulging all the secrets about how vile Miss Choi is. While Eugene's mom is blabbering on, Hanrum notices that none of what she's saying matches the report, and she hypothesizes that Eugene's mom is just making it up on the spot. Eugene's mom continues telling her side of the story on how Miss Choi took the other kid's side during the violence committee deliberation. Hanrim speaks up and points out that this is irrelevant since violence committees are run by the local office, not the schools. As such, Miss Choi can't affect the results. Eugene's mom gets angry and tells her that she should respect the parents more and not talk back. Afterward, Eugene's mom demands for a refill on the drink she's having and then threatens to leave a bad review when the server refuses to give them one for free. Hanrim volunteers to pay and remarks to the other parents that she's not cheap enough to be stingy and rude to servers, making the other parents angry. Hanrim then walks away to leave but Eugene's mom demands that they still haven't given her permission to leave. She then throws her glass of water at Hanrim, but Hanrim deftly parries it back to her face. She then angrily tells Eugene's mom that just because she's a parent doesn't mean she can order teachers around like servants. A few hours later, Hanrim is doing her workout routine while watching her phone which continuously and endlessly vibrates with texts and calls from Eugene's mom. However, she has no plans of answering because she's off work. The next day, Hanrim shows the string of messages Eugene's mom had sent her and the dozens of missed calls. She reports that she clearly made a false report and that she only managed to ignore her calls because she's only teaching there temporarily. For a teacher that must teach for years and build healthy relationships with the community, then it would be impossible to ignore the calls. She also tells him that there are experimental programs where work numbers are given to parents instead of personal ones and that teachers only need to accept calls when it's an emergency. Weijin commends her for a job well done but tells her that programs like that won't be enough to stop parents from making false reports. This isn't simply a school problem but a problem in all areas of the government. Suddenly, Hanrim gets summoned to the principal's office and when she gets there, the principal was waiting for her with Eugene's mom. Eugene's mom had reported her to the principal as being rude and throwing ice at her face. The principal asks Hanrim to apologize but Eugene's mom demands that she begs on her knees. Hanrim replies that she'll apologize if Eugene's mom also apologize for being rude to her too. Her sudden demand surprises the principal who quickly apologizes on her behalf and promises to train Hanrim better. Eugene's mom leaves and demands that the principal train his staff better. Meanwhile, the principal berates Hanrim for talking back to a parent. Hanrim points out that as a principal, it was his job to hear both sides of the story, but the principal explains that having the parents complain to the Ministry of Education and the media would just make the whole school suffer. Hanrim realizes that it wasn't the principal's fault either. He must turn a blind eye to the truth to prevent problems from getting out of hand because it would be bad for the entire school if the higher authorities or the news get involved. In the end, the real problem is the country's bureaucratic system that gives too much power to civil complaints. The principal starts worrying that the TRPA might soon come to their school, but Hanrim suddenly removes her disguise. She then introduces herself again to the principal and tells him that he has a solution for all his problems. All he must do is do exactly as she says. At her house, Eugene's mom is back to posting about the horrible new replacement teacher for Miss Choi. 
She even posted a photo of Hanram and incited the other parents against her. The doorbell rings and she opens it to find the principal outside. She then asks where Hanram and her apology are, but the principal tells her that Hanram had recorded their conversation in the cafe, and he had also reviewed the CCTV footage. From that, he learned that both parties were in the wrong, so he would appreciate it if she didn't pursue it any further. Not only that, but the principal also declares that even if the teacher is wrong, they will no longer concede to inhumane requests for teachers to kneel. After all, a school isn't a place for parents to have hissy fits. At school, the principal also gave out work phones to all the teachers and told them that they don't have to answer their work phones when they're not working. Some parents might complain, but this time, it's ordered by the Ministry of Education so they can stand firm on this. They also message the parents notifying them of the new changes, but this also infuriates Eugene's mom. Meanwhile, at school, Miss Choi joins Miss Hanrum during lunch and asks her if the work phones are the TRPA's idea. Hanrum smiles and tells her that she hopes it takes care of the problem of parents calling all day. However, Miss Choi sadly remarks that it probably won't. They tried something like this last year, but the backlash was so severe that the school retracted it. At that moment, a group of parents abruptly enter the school and demands to talk to the principal. But this time, the one who greeted them wasn't the principal, but Huajin himself. Huajin introduces himself as part of the TRPA and explains that he was the one who brought the work phone system to the school. The parents immediately swarm him and berate him with various questions, but Huajin suddenly shouts silencing everyone and then tells them that if they all start increasing their voices, it would become difficult to have a conversation. They move to another room where the parents one by one voice their complaints. One tells him that the only time she and her husband are off work is during the night and weekends, so that's the only time they can communicate with the teachers. Wajin tells her that they aren't prohibiting them from contacting teachers, they just must make sure that it's urgent and they will gladly be connected to the teachers. They can also schedule a call in advance with the teacher's agreement. One parent points out that she has a valid reason to suddenly call teachers because two years ago, a teacher also had a work number. Her son had asthma, so the teacher allowed her to contact him using his personal number, but then, the other parents pointed out that this is unfair. As such, a blanket policy shouldn't be made. Wajin agrees with her and tells her that there would be exceptions made, but the authority to decide who gets the exception would still be the teachers. If they make sure that the authority to make exceptions is protected, then no one would accuse anyone of discrimination. Eugene's mom speaks up and tells him that the whole thing just feels insulting to her. Did they really bug the teachers that much? Teachers are supposed to be mentors, but policies like this make them look like cold-blooded civil servants. How can they teach kids to be caring members of society when they're like that? Wajin agrees with her and explains that some teachers are uncomfortable with the policy. However, they weren't the ones who crossed the lines first. It's because of parents who treat teachers like their personal servants. The parents immediately take offense at this, and they all start shouting at Huajin again. Huajin tries to scold them again, but Eugene's mom points out that he can't order them because he's just a civil servant. In response, Huajin suddenly puts a handcuff on her and on the other parents. He then tells them that shouting, cursing, and personally attacking a government employee are defined as defamation and libel, all of which are punishable as criminal offenses. Huajin removes their cuffs and informs them that it was just a warning. However, things would be different when it comes to false or malicious reports. He then reveals that they arrived there because someone reported a teacher, but no evidence was found. As such, Miss Choi would go back to teaching and at the end of their investigation, they would have to press charges on the ones who filed the report. Hours later, Eugene's mom is livid at being threatened and posts again how the TRPA had taken the teacher's side. Comments arrive again voicing their support for her, but this time, more comments are against her. People are catching on that her posts are very unbelievable and if the TRPA took the teacher's side, then they're probably right. Other parents also comment that they don't know any bad teachers in their school, so she is probably lying. Seeing them turn against her, Eugene's mom throws away the phone and starts contemplating what would happen if she went to prison. Or worse, if her reputation gets ruined. Meanwhile, Hanrim and Huijin bring the good news to Miss Choi that she can go back to teaching and Eugene's mom would be charged. Miss Choi is glad to be back teaching, but she tells him that she was thinking about Eugene. He only had one fight with a classmate and his mom getting in prison might scar him for life. Thus, she begs them not to press charges. Wajin understands her reasoning, but he also points out that they have to protect all teachers' rights experiencing the same treatment as her. 
Thus, Weijin offers a compromise. Later, Miss Choi is going home, and to her surprise, Yu Jin's mom was waiting for her with a gift. She was there to apologize, but she also wants Miss Choi to admit to taking the other side of the violence committee hearing. Miss Choi rejects her offer and tries to walk away, but Yu Jin's mom grabs her. Miss Choi slaps away her hand and tells her that if she admitted to submitting a false report, the TRPA plans to drop the charges. She must think of Yu Jin and choose wisely. Yu Jin's mom angrily trashes the gift and promises to think of Yu Jin with a mischievous smirk. The next day, Miss Choi is back at school where the students happily welcome her. They also bid goodbye to Hanrim, except one student. Yu Jin suddenly starts making noise and shouts at Hanrim to never come back since she's too stupid to teach. Miss Choi demands that he apologize, but Yu Jin just makes funny faces in response. When she first came to the school, Hanrim paid attention to Yu Jin Lee because of his problematic mother. But the worst thing he ever did before was play games on his phone during class. He's never caused real trouble, so why did he suddenly behave like that? As the day goes on and Miss Choi continues to teach the class, Yujin acts more and more bratty. He talks back to the teacher, refuses to do homework, and just watches YouTube on his tablet during class instead of doing the class activities. When Miss Choi attempts to take his tablet away, he cries out that she's infringing on his right to learn. The two TRP wardens watch his new behavior and Hanrem is irritated at what she's seeing. She guesses that his mother might have put him up to it, but Weijin tells her that they should just go. He trusts that Miss Choi would be able to take care of it. Inside the room, Miss Choi hands a pair of earphones to Yu Jin and empathetically informs him that he can just pay attention when he's ready for class. After class, Miss Choi asks Yu Jin if he wants to talk about why he seems to be upset during class. Yu Jin recalls how his mother had ordered him to be a jerk to Miss Choi. He tries to protest since he likes Miss Choi, but his mother pulls out a paddle and threatens him. Remembering his mother's threat, Yu Jin slaps away Miss Choi's helping hand and tells her that he's in a bad mood because of her bad breath. Even his classmates are now stunned to hear Yu Jin badmouthing their teacher. Meanwhile, in a cafe near the school, Yu Jin's mom is listening to everything that's happening inside the classroom. She had bugged Yu Jin and is now listening through her earphones. To her surprise, she suddenly hears someone hitting Yu Jin. She was just hoping for Miss Choi to shout at her son, but the fact that she hit him made this so much better. A smile creeps to her face, and she immediately heads to the school. Yu Jin's mom barges into the classroom with her phone out and records Miss Choi atop her bloodied son. She shouts at her for hitting her son and explains that she bugged Yu Jin because she was worried about Miss Choi returning to work and it looks like she was right to be worried. However, a boy suddenly speaks up and informs her that he's the one who hit Yu Jin. Another kid points out to Yu Jin's mom that if she was listening in to her son, then she should have scolded him when he started badmouthing his teacher. They then accuse her of forcing Yu Jin to act that way because Yu Jin wasn't mean before. All the students are now against her, and they threaten to tell their parents about her bad behavior. Yu Jin's mom quickly retreats outside before anything could get any worse. Unfortunately for her, the two TRPA wardens are standing in her way, and they inform her that their investigations have concluded. Miss Choi was completely innocent, and it looks like they would have to press charges on her for filing a malicious report. Yu Jin's mom doesn't back down and cries out for them to show their evidence that Miss Choi is innocent. They probably didn't investigate the case thoroughly. However, Hanrim calmly removes her wig and reveals to Miss Choi that she wasn't a teacher, but a TRPA warden. She then assures Yu Jin's mom that she thoroughly investigated the case. Later, Yu Jin's mom accuses them of entrapment and points out that this is illegal. Not only that, how can she not do anything when her child's being assaulted? Wejin calmly listens to her accusations and tells her that they should just go to the police. Yu Jin's mom realizes that she has no other choice, and she apologizes to Wejin on his knees. However, Wejin tells her that she should apologize to her victims, not him. These victims include not only Miss Choi, but the students and parents of her class who were affected by her shenanigans. Wajin learns that there's a parent's observation next week, and she instructs Yu Jin's mom to apologize then. If she does, then they won't press charges. After Hanrim and Wajin leave, Hanrim asks him why he's giving Yu Jin's mom a week to apologize. Wajin explains that Yu Jin's mom wasn't afraid of the law, she's afraid of something else entirely. Meanwhile, Yu Jin's mom realizes that a week is more than enough time to change the narrative. She quickly edits the phone recording she has and the photo she took of Miss Choi and Yu Jin. 
She then posts all of these on social media with a narration of how the TRPA failed to properly investigate a teacher, which resulted in her child being shouted at and abused. She is about to share her post to their neighborhood online forum when she sees another post trending on the page. It was a post of a student using her mother's account to tell them how Eugene's mom is mistreating their teacher. Not only that, Eugene's mom used her own son to make their teacher look bad. The two TRPA wardens also see the post and Weijin explains to Hanram that what Eugene's mom fears the most is how her wrongs would come right back to her. He was expecting a parent to speak up, but a student posting it would make more shockwaves that might go out of control. The post continues to trend throughout social media and different online news outlets. Eugene's mom throws up due to the stress and other angry parents also storm her front door. Even her husband is angry at her for pulling another stunt like this. He was already angry at her for causing the same thing at their old place, but now she's doing the same thing in their new neighborhood. Eugene's mom bites back at her husband and blames him for not earning enough money and letting them get stuck in a crappy neighborhood. Meanwhile, Eugene comes home looking bruised and disheveled. His mom quickly comes to him concerned and asks him what happened. However, Eugene slaps away his mom's hand and shouts at her that everything is her fault. He then locks himself up in his room and his dad also leaves the house. Eugene's mom was left all alone crying with her whole world crumbling around her. A week later, the student's parents visit the class to observe Miss Choi teaching their children. While there, they can't help but gossip about the parent of one of the students, Eugene's mom. Outside the class, Weijin and Hanrim are wondering if Eugene's mom will truly come and apologize. Just before the class ends, Eugene's mom finally shows up and Weijin lets her in. She stands before the whole class and meekly introduces herself. She explains what happened in the past few months and how she used her own son against the teacher. She is about to kneel in front of the parents and ask for their forgiveness when they all abruptly charge at her and berate her for everything she's done. Meanwhile, Eugene's mom endures all their hurtful words since she just needs to tolerate these for a few more minutes and the charges against her will be dropped. However, when she looks at their faces, she sees her own face shouting back at her just like how she shouted at teachers in the past. She realizes that if she lets this continue, then this will happen for the rest of her life. Eugene's mom suddenly starts shouting back at the parents, pointing out that she wasn't alone in being a problematic parent to the teachers. The other parents also bugged the teachers, called them late at night, and even gossiped or complained about them. She threatens to reveal every nasty thing they told her about teachers. Some of the accused parents are about to physically harm Eugene's mom when Miss Choi suddenly intervenes. She implores them to just forgive and move on since Eugene's mom even took the courage to apologize. A parent tells Miss Choi that she should be the one most angry because she was the biggest victim. However, Miss Choi points behind them and informs them that no, she is not the biggest victim. It's their kids. They see the kids all awkward and embarrassed that their parents are squabbling and making a scene. Meanwhile, one of the kids, Eugene, is crying. He approaches Hua Jin and asks him if he truly takes away people who do bad things at school. If so, he begs them to take away his mom. They say you can't teach old dogs new tricks, but maybe they can make his mother into a decent human being. Eugene's mom shakes upon hearing her son's words and she tells him that he should be the first one on her side. However, Eugene looks at her with tearful eyes and points out that she had never even thought about what he's been going through. Other kids always teased him whenever his mom went on one of her rants. When she went trending on the internet, even strangers started insulting him and calling his mom the Korean Karen. He can't even refute their insults and he gets beat up as a result. He then yells at his mom that she always claimed that she was doing everything for him, but it was just an excuse for her to act like a horrible human being. He doesn't need her. He'd rather just live with his dad. Miss Choi quickly apprehends Yu Jin and tells him that although his mother might have made some mistakes, she's still his mom so he should apologize. Meanwhile, Hanrim approaches the crestfallen mother and informs her that they'll have to take her to the police now. Wajin explains to Miss Choi that they have no choice since Yu Jin's mom didn't apologize clearly and still doesn't see what she did wrong. He then loudly talks to the other parents and advises them to remember this event. In Korea, 8 out of 10 teachers want to quit and it's an undeniable fact that overbearing parents are one of the causes of this. Outside the school, Eugene's mom silently cries about all the hurtful yet truthful words her son had said to her. Hanrim asks Hua Jin if maybe they should stop this now since Eugene's mom is already suffering enough. Not only her, but Miss Choi suddenly comes running towards them, and to everyone's surprise, she kneels in front of Hua Jin. 
She begs him to stop this since this will destroy Yu Jin's family. If her student's family is destroyed because of her, then she won't be able to call herself a teacher anymore. She also advises Yu Jin's mom that the best thing for Yu Jin now is for her not to receive punishment, but for her to show him that she's capable of change. Hwa Jin helps Miss Choi stand up and remarks to Yu Jin's mom that the teacher she's trying to get rid of is one of the true teachers left at the school. The two TRPA wardens then walk away, with Hanram teasing Hwa Jin about how he was probably planning to let her go this whole time anyway. They say that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but it looks like a real teacher would be able to teach Yu Jin's mom. Meanwhile, in an alley somewhere in Seoul, an intoxicated father is going home from work while talking on the phone with his daughter. Suddenly, he gets hit in the head with a brick when he gets attacked by three masked teenagers. The teenagers then steal his wallet and even transfer his bank account money to their own phones. After sharing the stolen money amongst their group, they go right back to the gaming app on their phone, a gambling game. At the TRPA headquarters, Hanrim and Weijin are swamped with more new cases. However, there's one case that's different from the rest. Hanrim explains that it didn't exactly happen at a school, but students have been assaulting and taking money from people in the streets. Considering that they're all occurring in a single district, then Hanrim guesses that it could be teenage gangs. Just as Hanrim reported, the news also reports about a story of three high school students caught attacking an intoxicated middle-aged man in the streets. While he was unconscious, they then stole 12 million won from his bank account using his fingerprints. According to the police, the students committed the act to acquire funds for illegal online gambling. In an interview with the teens, they show no remorse but even mock the measly 12 million won they stole when they had already won 150 million won in the past. They even offer to pay it back when they win some more. Seeing this, Weijin concludes that the new case is not about teenage gangs but about something much more sinister. At Guan High Tech High School, Hyunju Kim is a third-year student working towards his dream of becoming an automotive engineer. For three years, he was a victim of rampant violence at their school, but it all changed when the TRPA arrived and set them straight. Now he's able to focus on his studies without distraction. However, the same cannot be said about his classmates. They are all now addicted to their phones, gambling all their money away. Ho Jing Lee, the best fighter in the automotive department, is one of these addicts. He was agonizing over making his last bet when another student pressed his phone, making the bet for him. He was about to get angry when he thankfully won, letting him win back all the money he lost all week. The student who pressed his phone was Honky Cho, the best fighter in the electrical engineering department who is now wearing gaudy yet expensive clothing. Wearing a 4.5 million won jacket, a 1.5 million won sunglasses, and 1.9 million shoes, he flexes his new riches to the other students and encourages them to bet more. Throughout the district, most of the teens are playing these games whether they are walking home from school or waiting at the bus stop. Hanrim and Weijin are stunned at how much gambling has proliferated around the neighborhood. In the past, people had to go to the gambling house but now, all one needs is a phone. It spreads quickly, especially for the youth, where one super spreader can introduce it to their friends, who will then get addicted and introduce it to their other friends. But when it's organized, the site operator can use the super spreader as a dedicated distributor, making the expansion more effective. Considering how fast it is spreading in the area, Huajin guesses that the gambling is organized so he decides that they should find the distributor first. He and Hanrim split up, with Hanrim talking to the kids at the bus station while Huajin sees someone he knows, Wan Yak. He asks Wan Yok how he is, and Wan Yak reports that unlike before where he's the most feared fighter in the area, he's now just a lowly grunt at work always getting scolded. Huajin asks him if he knows someone who earned or lost a lot of money, but Wan Yak admits that he hasn't been to school lately. He'll be meeting up with friends, however, and promises Hua Jin that he'll ask around for him. Hua Jin leaves happy to see one of the kids he helped is on the right path in life, but Wan Yuk just stealthily glares at him. Later, Wan Yuk meets up with Ho Zhang and Hong Ki, and informs them that the TRPA is in the area. They asked around about money-related stuff, so Wan Yuk warns his friends that they should probably be careful. Hanrim and Hua Jin are scolding various kids for gambling, but they still fail to find anything. Everyone told them that they learned the game from a friend, and it doesn't look like any of them are the distributor. They are about to retire for the day when they spot a pair of teens breaking into cars. The kids are so busy entering the cars and stealing anything they could find inside to sell that they didn't notice the TRPA warden standing behind them. Huijin quickly apprehends the two while Hanrim checks their phones. It turns out they were right. 
the two kids are stealing to fund their gambling addiction. Later, the two teens reveal everything they know to the wardens. They met some people in an alleyway who showed them the game and demonstrated how they can easily earn money. At the start, one of the kids was amazed when his 50,000 won turned into 1.6 million in just a few days. With that, he realized that he didn't have to go to school or work anymore. Unfortunately, he lost the 1.6 million won again a few days later. That's when he started borrowing money so he could play the game and earn more in the hopes of striking it rich. At first, he borrowed only 100,000 or 200,000. He didn't notice that all his debts ballooned to 4 million won. Then they started charging him interest and fees, and his debts now reached 5 million won. They can't do anything about their debts either because the guys were from Guan Tech, one of the scariest schools in the country. The mention of the school's name immediately catches the attention of Weijin since it was Guan Yuk's school, one of the earliest cases that the TRPA took. He asks the teens for the guys' names, but they don't remember. All they remember is that the guys bragged about basically running the school. The next day, Huijin visits Gwen Yuk at work, but he finds out that he has already quit. Meanwhile, Hanarim checks the school for Ho Zhang and Hong Ki, the other two big bullies of the school. However, they were also skipping school. This means that they must be the ones truly distributing the game in the district. Huijin was disappointed to learn this. He was so happy to see Gwen Yuk yesterday that it looks like he said too much, and now Gwen Yuk has disappeared. The warden spend the next few hours looking for them in computer cafes, billiard halls, and alleyways. They even visit Wan Yuk's home, but his mother sadly explains that he hasn't been home. His mother starts crying when she hears that Wan Yuk's back to crime again when she thought that he had finally changed. Meeting her also had a profound change in Huijin. The two wardens are worried that if the kids are truly back to doing crimes, then that means the kids they've worked with haven't changed at all. And if they don't change, then what are they even doing at their jobs? Wajin instructs Han Rim to tail the students they caught when they pay their interest while he continues searching for Guan Yuk. But suddenly, a car comes barreling outside and throws a bruise and battered Guan Yuk out in front of his apartment complex. Wajin quickly rushes to his aid, but Guan Yuk is unconscious. He then notices that on the back of Guan Yuk's bloody palm was the initial G Y written with a knife. A few days later, Guan Yuk wakes up at the hospital. He sees his bandaged hand and his mind immediately recalls the wound underneath and how he was beaten up by a hand with a G.Y. tattoo. The memory makes him scream out loud but Huijin and Hanrim, sitting beside his bed, scold him for being noisy. Later, Guan Yuk still refuses to tell them anything. He justifies his injuries as him getting into a fight when he bumped into someone. Unsurprisingly, Huijin doesn't believe this because he knows firsthand how good a fighter Guan Yuk is. Wajin doesn't question him, however, but instead informs him that the TRPA are back in the neighborhood because of the proliferation of illegal gambling. Not only that, but their sources also say that the ones who popularize the game are the toughest kids of Guan Tech. Wan Yeok immediately recalls the dinner he had with his friends, Ho Jung and Hong Ki. He complains to them about the expensive dinner they're eating, but the two nonchalantly promise that they can make the bill disappear. Wan Yuk remembers how Huijin asked him about money-related stuff just before that dinner, and he asks his two friends if they know something he doesn't. The two guys smirk and show him the gambling site. Hong Ki even gave him his referral ID with 50,000 won as starting money. Wan Yuk tries out the gambling app, and he quickly racks up money reaching 1.6 million won. Hong Ki assures him that it's real money, and he can even cash it out and pay for their dinner. He points out that people who work honest jobs are stupid when they can just gamble and print money. Not only that, Honky informs him that he knows the person who runs the gambling site. His referral ID boosts the win rate by 0.2% for every player he recruits. Thus, he asks Wan Yeok to help them recruit since with his charisma, they would be living like kings. Back in the present, Wan Yeok gets angry and denies knowing anything about the gambling site. Weijin calmly looks into his eyes and asks him if Ho Zhong or Hong Ki is involved. Guan Yuk is stunned that Weijin was able to guess it, and his stunned face gives Weijin the confirmation he needed. He points out that it was uncharacteristic of Guan Yuk to get emotional, but it all makes sense now. He's just trying to protect his friends. Weijin leaves to go visit the two teens, but Guan Yuk yells out after them and explains that Hong Ki's innocent. He was just being ordered by someone to do it. During his dinner with them, Waniak deleted his account to the utter shock of his friends. They cannot believe that he's just throwing away 1.6 million won like that. However, he informs them that the TRPA is around asking for money-related stuff, 
so they should just behave. They don't want to have a repeat of last time. He then leaves but Honky comes chasing after him. Honky continues to persuade him to recruit for the gambling site so they can get rich like him. Wan Yuk compliments Honky's expensive outfit, but he suggests to him that he should get out while he still can. A lot of people invested and earned in cryptocurrency last year, but now everyone is tearing their hair out. He even volunteers to introduce Honky to his job. Unbeknownst to Wanyak, someone was watching the two of them. When Honky failed to recruit Wanyak, the mysterious man threw a billiard ball right at Honky's head, knocking him out. It was the man with the GUI tattoo. With his friend knocked unconscious by a suspicious stranger, Wanyak charges at the unknown assailant. But before his uppercut can land, someone whacks him from behind, causing him to fall. The two men then pick up Honky and are about to leave, but Wanyak stands back up with his fist raised. The tattooed guy and his bodyguard admire his bravado, but they just pummel him again to the ground. A few minutes later, a beaten up Wanyak is lying down in an alley somewhere, but the tattooed boss decides to take him with them too. The next thing Wanyak knew, he was waking up tied up in a chair in a dimly lit room. All around him, he can hear the screams of people while sitting in front of him is the tattooed boss. He asks him who's screaming, and the man tells him it's the final screams of gambling addicts. He explains their modus operandi of letting people make money, then lose money, which will ultimately put them in debt to them. Then they dunk them in water. Doing those things easily turns people into slaves that bring money. One of the men enters the room dragging a drenched honky with him. Wanyak demands that they release Honky, but the man reveals that Honky is one of their best works. He owes them over 100 billion won, and he ended up selling his stuff, bringing his parents' bank books, and stealing from kids on the streets just so he can borrow more from them. Now Honky's even offering his own friends like Wanyak. Wanyak asks who they are, and the man just shows his hand with a tattoo of a girl and the initial GY over it. They used to go by a different name in the past, but their president suddenly changed it to GI. Wanyok glares at them and tells them that he also used to do illegal stuff in the past too. However, he never went that far because someone taught him that there's a line one shouldn't cross called limits. He warns them that the TRPA will be coming for them, but the guy just picks up a pen and stabs it in Wanyok's palm. He carves out their initials in his palm and replies that GI is not afraid of anyone. Back at the present, Xuajin thanks Guanyuk for the information and proceeds to leave. Guanyuk calls out after them requesting that he join them since he still needs to rescue Honki. However, Guajin rejects his offer playfully pointing out that Guanyuk had already lost to them. Meanwhile, the bodyguard reports to the tattooed man about the research he's done on the TRPA. They are directly under the Minister of Education and are former special forces. Even past gangsters got easily beaten by them. He asks his boss if they should lay low for a while but the tattooed man replies that they were ordered by their president to get rid of them. John Yeok Lee, the branch director and gambling promoter, then wears a glove to cover up his tattooed hand and starts his plan to play victim to the TRPA. For Honky, everything changed when he learned the secret formula for making money. In just two weeks, he was able to earn 100 million won by gambling. But in just one night, he lost it all again. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He started selling his stuff and even his mother's stuff just to win back his 100 million, but he never did. Until one day, Lee lent him 1 million won. This was a few weeks ago, the beginning of hell in Honky's life. Meanwhile, the gambling promoter Lee goes to meet with the TRPA with his tattooed hand covered up by his glove. He pretends to be a gambling addict asking for their help in fixing his addiction. Wedgen stares at his gloved hand but silently listens to his pleas. Meanwhile, a dazed Honky arrives and Weijin leads him somewhere else to talk. That was the moment when Lee triggered his plan. A few days ago, Honky was drenched and lying lifelessly on the floor after getting helplessly dumped in water by Lee's men for failing to pay back his debts. That's when Lee drops a knife by his side and tells him of his plans. A few days ago, he met the TRPA by pretending to be a teen breaking into cars. He also tossed them an injured Guanyo who'll tell them the real story so the TRPA wardens would probably feel sorry for Honky's addiction. This will make the wardens lower their guard around him and Lee orders Honky to stab them. He will deduct 20 million for every stab and if he murders them, he can even erase his entire debt. As such, in this delicate moment when Huijin is leading Honky away, Honky suddenly charges at Huijin with the knife and stabs him. Blood drips from Huijin's wound, but to Honky's surprise, Huijin stopped the knife's blade by catching it with his hand. 
He then punches Honky in the face with his other hand, knocking him down. Lee berates the dazed Honky for failing to even injure Huijin when he gave him a perfect plan. Hanrin realizes that Lee must be the mastermind and she quickly swipes at him, but Lee easily dodges it. He then compliments the two wardens for their skills and formally introduces himself as Jung Yeok Lee, the GUI gambling promoter and branch director. He then quickly runs away with the two wardens amazed at his speed and starts to run after him. However, this was all according to Lee's plans. Lee leads them to another alley where a group of gangsters armed with knives are waiting. Lee runs past them, leading the two wardens face to face with his men. Hanrim urges Huijin to go ahead and leave the trash to her, so he jumps up a wall and runs past all of them. The gangsters snicker at him since he left a woman all alone. And yet, Hanrim calmly pulls out two knives and faces them all. Hanrim removes her high-heeled shoes and hops around to prepare herself for combat, prompting the gangsters to laugh at her. However, one of the gangsters reminds the others that they are still facing a former Special Forces soldier so she's still more dangerous than them. The others realize that he's right, and they rush Hanrim as a group. Hanrim smirks and remarks that she's not just more dangerous than them, she's way out of their league. Meanwhile, all his running had rendered Lee breathless and gasping for air. Suddenly, Weijin jumps him from above and kicks him. Lee manages to duck under his kick, and is surprised to see him, while Weijin compliments Lee's great athletic skills. Lee asks him why he left Hanrim all alone, but Weijin replies that he's not even worried about her. Just as Weijin predicted, Hanrim goes through the gangsters like a hot knife through butter. She slashes all around her, injuring the gangsters in their arms and forcing them to drop their weapons. One shouts at her from behind and attempts to stab her, but Hanrim just scolds him for not attacking silently from behind and whacks him with her knife. One of the gangsters commends her skills, but he also points out that she still has one limitation. It's not that she's a woman, but it's that she works for the government. That means she cannot murder. This prompts the gangster to bravely charge at her with no regard for his own safety. So Hanrim throws her knife at him, catches it again, and slits it right at his throat. The others are stunned that she really murdered someone and Hanrim reminds them that special forces have a license to murder. Realizing that they are well and truly outmatched, the guys all run in the opposite direction, choosing to flee from this knife-wieldy monster. This leaves an annoyed Hanrim all alone who was surprised that the gangsters believed her. She then picks up the guy who fainted in fear after she slit his throat using the blunt edge of her knife and starts asking him questions. Meanwhile, Weijin is also questioning Lee about who runs their gambling operation. Unfortunately, they get interrupted when Lee's bodyguard finally arrives and trades blows with Weijin. With Weijin now occupied, Lee runs away once again. The bodyguard asks Weijin if he's not chasing Lee and Weijin explains that he's not after kids like Lee. He's after whoever's behind him and whoever is facing off with him right now. Lee is almost back to their hideout when a punch suddenly careens into his face. He manages to block it, but a new opponent now stands in his way. It was a patched out Guanyak and his buddy, Hojong. Lee asks Wan Yeok how they found his hideout when he was supposed to be unconscious the whole time he was there. Hojin laughs out loud and reveals that he's the one who discovered them. When they abducted Guan Yeok and Hong Ki after their dinner, Hojun managed to see them and silently follow them. And even if he's the dumbest student in Guan Tech, he still managed to memorize the name of the building. Lee sighs in exasperation and tells them that they truly are dumb. If they know that it was the bad guy's headquarters, then why are there just two of them? At that moment, gangsters start spilling out of the building, and Guaniak finds themselves surrounded. Wajin and the bodyguard continue their match, trading blows and blocking each other's strikes. Weijin commends the man's fighting abilities and he laments how adults like him use kids to take money from other kids. However, the bodyguard speaks up and reveals that they aren't the ones running the show. Lee is truly the boss of the operation and their whole gang is just following his orders. Wan Yeok also makes the same wrong assumption as he insults the adult gangsters interrupting teenagers' fights. Lee laughs and explains to Guan Yeok that these men are his underlings. Guan Yuk doesn't believe that grown gangsters would work for a high school student, but Lee narrates how his boss, the one that founded GY, once wanted to know how strong he was. As such, his boss barged into the offices of any gangsters he could find and beat them all down. After two weeks, all the criminal organizations in the town are already under him. But what is even more shocking is that his boss is still younger than Lee and Guan Yuk themselves. 
Gaoniok still doesn't want to trust what Lee's been saying, but the way all the gangsters seem to defer to him makes Lee's words much more convincing. Lee then asks Wanhyeok if he wants to join their group. He admires how Wanhyeok was able to rise as the strongest teen in town, and he has the guts to come back for revenge right now. With GEY, Wanhyeok can earn riches he can't even fathom. Lee then removes the bandage from Wanhyeok's hand to show the GEY etched on his hand, but to his surprise, Wanhyeok had added his own twist to it. A curse word. That was his answer to Lee's offer. Wanyuk then lands a powerful punch at Lee, blasting him back at the gangsters. He then warns them that no matter whether they're kids or adults, one hit from his fist and they're out. Both Hanrim and Weijin are stunned to learn that a high school student had taken over the mobs. However, the gangsters assure them that a teenager had beaten them, and the rules of the streets declare they submit to him. Weijin realizes that he's just wasting time fighting a normal henchman, and attacks the gangster once more. Meanwhile, Wanyuk trades blow with the thugs. True to his name, he doesn't fall when he gets hit, but every thug he hits falls in just one punch. Hojong is stunned to see that they are truly fighting the mobs, but a gangster attacks him too. In self-defense, he headbutts the thug and knocks him out. He realizes that he has a fighting chance and joins Guan Yuk in the fight. Lee surveys Guan Yuk knocking out his men in just one punch, and he observes that the nickname the Beast of Yuan truly fits Guan Yuk. With no more thugs between them, Lee provokes Wan Yuk, and their fight starts. Wedgen continues pummeling the gangster in his way, and he can't believe his opponent is still standing. Not only that, but if he's a henchman only, then their boss, the high schooler, is even stronger. However, the thought of a strong high schooler immediately brings to Wedgen a memory of a conversation with the girl he loved most in the world, Gayun Choi. Gayun had once told him about a student of hers she was worried about. He was a violent kid that's now rumored to be getting into organized crime. She tried talking to him several times, but she always gets scared of his size. Even the principal and dean advised her to leave him alone, but as a teacher, she cannot give up on her student. Remembering this thought of a violent high schooler that murdered someone, Weijin grabs the gangster's arm and starts squeezing it. He coldly demands the gangster to tell him what the kid's name is. Wangyuk rushes at Lee, but Lee once again ducks underneath his punches and flees. Lee quickly runs upstairs and into the rooms inside. When Guangyuk and Hojin chase after him, a baseball immediately hits Hojin on dead center of his forehead and topples him to the ground. Guangyuk quickly goes to help him while Lee smiles at them from the end of a long hallway with baseballs in his hand. Meanwhile, the gangster Huijin is facing admits that he never met the GUI's boss. The only one that has access to the boss is the branch director, Lee. The gangster then tries to fight back but Weijin is filled with unbridled rage that he easily punches the gangster's throat, bringing him down. While walking away, Weijin recalls the initials G-E-Y and the tattoo of a woman on Lee's hand. Back at the gang headquarters, Lee throws the softballs at Guan Yuk. Guan Yuk shields his face, but the softball suddenly curves and painfully hits him in the knee. Lee then starts throwing more balls, a curveball, a slider, and an ultra fastball. With each ball pummeling Guanyuk throughout the body, he falls to the ground dazed. Lee then approaches the fallen Guanyuk and starts dragging him by the hair. He throws him into a room and Guanyuk is confused to see piles of money cushioning his fall. Lee crouches beside him and tells him that it's all the money the addicts have brought them to pay off their debts. However, it's still chump change compared to the money they put into their accounts. If Guanyuk would only agree, he can have the money and the whole district. And yet, Wan Yuk still refuses the offer and shows him the curse word in his arm. That was still his answer. A few months ago, he would have accepted Lee's offer. But now that the TRPA is there, Wan Yuk knows that GUI would lose. Lee sighs in exasperation and reveals that his boss ordered him to get out of the district now that the TRPA is there. He doesn't really understand why everyone's so scared of the TRPA. Wan Yuk smirks and tells him that if he wants to know why, he can just look behind him and ask them himself. Lee quickly turns expecting to see Hui Jin standing behind him, but no one was there. Wan Yuk had successfully bamboozled him, and he punched Lee, blasting him back into a wall. Lee stands back up to fight, but Hui Jin suddenly appears and grabs his tattooed hand. As he gazes at the initialed G-E-Y in Lee's hand, Hui Jin asks him if it means Gayun. Lee is confused as to how Hui Jin can possibly know this. Not knowing Huijin's own personal history, Lee praises the TRPA's investigative skills that they even managed to learn the initials of their organization stand for Gayun. 
He explains to Weijin that it was the name of the woman that their boss murdered. Weijin quickly recalls the conversation he had with Jiuqiu Cho in prison, relishing and proud of murdering Ge Yun with a single punch. Meanwhile, Wan Yik asks Weijin if he can take care of Li, but Weijin is blinded by rage, and he delivers a powerful haymaker to Li's face. Even when he was a kid, Li loved playing baseball. At school, he even became the best pitcher, but he still never got to pitch in a game. Why? Well, his parents didn't have enough money to bribe the coach while the other students did. And so he had no choice but to pummel their coach with a bat, and that was the day his baseball career ended. Lee's life flashes before his very eyes as Huijin repeatedly introduces his fist to his body. Lee's teeth fly out of his mouth and blood pours out of his broken skin. A few seconds later, Wan Yuk realizes what's happening and he quickly restrains Huijin to stop him from murdering Lee. Huijin elbows him away and lands one last punch at Lee before he dazedly stares at Lee's tattoo once again. Huijin remembers how he tried to convince Giyun to give up on the violent kid since you can't teach a dog new tricks. In response, Gayun strikes him in the head and reiterates how she hates that saying. If that is true, then why would society even need teachers? For her, they should not give up on people that have the potential to change. She knows that the violent kid might not change right away, but maybe someday he will when he realizes that there's at least one person that never gave up on him. Wajin stands over Lee's prone body and loudly asks the dead Gayun if this is what she had in mind. She tried to change someone that couldn't change, and this is the result. He was about to attack the unconscious Lee again, but Guan Yuk suddenly struck him in the face. Wajin throws him off and threatens him to mind his own business, but Guan Yuk tells him a story. When he gave his mom his first paycheck, she cried and thanked the TRP. He is living proof that Huijin can change a person. It would be a waste to see the TRPA that helps so many people get destroyed just because Huijin murdered a teenager. Wajin was taken aback by what he said, and he realized what he had done. Hanrim arrives and congratulates Weijin for taking down the boss. However, Weijin walks away and tells her that he's not worthy. A few days later, Weijin submits his letter of resignation to the Minister of Education, Gangsok Choi. Gangsok and Weijin head to Giyun's grave where Weijin informs him of everything that happened. There's a gang organization that operates at the national level, and they have chosen the name of G.Y. Giyun's initials. Why? Because the head of G.Y. is the one who murdered her. Jiuqiu Cho, who is currently at the juvenile detention center having Gayun's face tattooed on his back. Gang Sok asks him why he's resigning, so Weijin explains how when he learned about Li's tattoo, he couldn't control himself. The only one who snapped him out of it was Guan Yuk. In the future, he's afraid that in his line of work, he might encounter GUI again, and this time, there's no one to hold him back. If he does something that can't be undone, he asks Gang Sok to process his resignation letter so it won't affect the TRPA's existence. Gangsha proceeds to tear the resignation letter and tells Huijin that the TRPA would be nothing without him. If he ever goes to prison, then Huijin can go with a clean conscience while Gangsha promises to handle the rest. He then tells Huijin to go back to work and they leave the cemetery, with Huijin promising Gayun's grave that he won't give up until Jiuqiu is released. Meanwhile, in a church somewhere, a group of children are in the choir happily singing the hymns of their religion. Meanwhile, behind a nondescript door labeled Repentance Room, a woman named Sohayan is being beaten by sticks. The priest instructs Sohayan to receive the pain with thanks, since it will help her grow closer to the holy deity. The bloodied Sohayan explains that she's not demon-possessed or trying to commit heresy, and all she asks is that her daughter, Suyel, be allowed to go to school. The priest points out that they already teach the children the word of the holy deity so there's no need, but Soyeon interjects and shouts out that Suyeol needs to learn and play with kids her age. She needs a professional teacher at a real school. The priest signals and calls over Suyeol from the Torah to ask what she thinks. Soyeon quickly approaches her daughter and asks her if she wants to go to school, but Suyeol dutifully replies that she was taught the outside world is controlled by demons. The desire to go outside is also the whispering of demons, so Suyeol tells that priest that her mom might be possessed. If someone is possessed, then that means the whole family would repent. The priest smirks and asks Sohayan if she had already prayed enough to have the demons washed away from her. If not, then her whole family, including her daughter, might have to go through the painful ritual of repentance too. Sohayan realizes that she has no choice, and she profusely prays and begs the priest to forgive her sins. A few hours later, 
Soyeon is being treated for her injuries by another girl named Juhui. Soyeon cries silently as she reiterates the need for her daughter to learn math and other basic things. Juhui, however, just smirks at her and informs her that the outside world is completely overrun by demons. Juhui Yai is supposed to be a second year high schooler if she went to school. Her family came to this place three years ago when she was in her second year of middle school. Back then, she asked her parents why they were moving places with only their clothes packed without their appliances and furniture. But her parents replied that they won't need them anymore. They then brought her to a church and in just one glance of the screaming and praying people inside, Jui instantly recognized that it was a cult. The reason they only brought their clothes is because her parents already sold and gave the money to the cult. The doctrine of the holy deity goes like this. On December 31, 1999, demons escaped from hell and took over governments and organizations around the world. They then planted the voice of demons in schools, media, and the internet so they could taint the hearts of humans. To block the demons' plans, the holy deity made the priest his agent and gave him the mission to save as many people as possible. These people gather at the church while the world outside is controlled by demons, meaning they can never go outside. But instead of schools, the children get hauled off to the farm to work. If they don't follow orders, they're starved or beaten. Juhui's brother Juyo came with them when he was seven and he's never been to school once. Thus, Juhu promises to get out of there for her brother's sake. One night, the priest summons her and instructs her to massage him. In his room were priceless vases displayed and expensive foreign cars filled his garage. While Juhui was massaging him, the priest caresses her hand, but Juhui had to endure and keep up the act all for her little brother. A month ago, Juhui started spreading the words of their gospel outside. At first she was so embarrassed, but it was the only chance she had to go outside, and it gave her a sliver of hope. And yet, it's still not easy to escape. The priest's eyes are always watching her. Juhui hands a pamphlet to a red-haired woman and espouses the devil in schools, but the woman just asks her for her age. She points out that Juhui should be at school. Juhui's adult guard pushes the woman away and tells her to mind her own business, but the woman suddenly uppercuts the man, knocking him out. With that out of the way, the woman once again asks Juhui why she's not at school. It was Hanrim Na. With Juhui's guard now gone, Hanrim once again asks her why she's not at school. This was her chance to tell someone everything. She is about to speak when the thought of her little brother, all tied up by the priest, stops her words. If she makes a wrong move here, then her brother will be in danger. Unfortunately, the moment disappears as Hanram's friend, Yu, appears. Yu sees that Hanram knocked out someone once again and berates her. She pulls Hanram away before she can cause any trouble. Hanram manages to shout out to Juhui to contact the TRPA if she ever needs help and the two women disappear, leaving Juhui alone. Later, Yu is in a shopping center trying out swimsuits when she notices that Hanrim is distractedly looking at the flyer Juhui had handed her. Hanrim can't help but be bothered about the contents of the flyer, telling people how there are demons at school. Yu quickly catch a looked attention and asks her why she looks distracted when Hanrim was the one who excitedly invited her to the beach for her vacation. Is it because of the flyer? Hanrim crumples the flyer and realizes that maybe the girl earlier is just a hired help and not really a believer. She had told the girl about the TRPA, and that should be enough. During dinner, Juhui is invited by the priest to dine with her. Juhui doesn't enjoy expensive food because she would rather eat with her family than eat delicious food with someone she hates. While eating, the priest asks her about the incident with Hanrim earlier and asks her if the violent woman told her anything. Juhui assures him that she didn't but the priest smirks and points out that is exactly what someone hiding something would say. Suddenly, a server changes the food she was eating to a bowl of dog food. The priest then orders her to eat it if she still has faith. When Juhui hesitates, the priest snaps his finger and her brother Juhiok enters the room. Upon seeing the bowl of dog food, Juhiok immediately starts devouring it like a starving dog. Juhui tries to stop him, but the priest explains that Juhiok has been fasting for the last three days for his repentance ritual. Juhui seemed to be lacking fate lately, but her brother volunteered to do the ritual for her. Juhui insists that she's not lacking faith, but the priest comes over to her and grabs her face. He then informs her that in his years of leading the ministry, he has learned to determine whether a person has faith just by looking at their eyes, and Juhui's eyes are clearly lacking. The next day, the ministry is back to their normal ceremonies at the church with Juhui listening with her brother. Juhui prays to the holy deity, to Allah, to Buddha, and even to the demons. She wishes that someone murders their priest. 
At that moment, a red-haired demon named Hanram suddenly enters, shouting about how her interaction with Jukui wouldn't stop bugging her. The adult that Hanram knocked unconscious yesterday quickly shouts out that she was the demon who attacked them outside. This starts a chain reaction of yelling and screaming by the other believers for her to be burned at the stake. However, the priest calms them down and points out that Hanram is still a living creation of their holy deity, and as such, has the right to hear their sacred teachings. With that, Hanram resolutely sits beside Juhui and happily waves at them. After the ceremony, Hanram goes and introduces herself to the priest as a warden of the TRPA, while Jubi serves them tea. She explains that she helps students, teachers, and parents whose rights to education are being violated. And according to the flyer she got yesterday, their organization sees schools as demons' lairs. Thus, she can't turn a blind eye to them, especially when numerous kids are attending the ceremony earlier. One of the adults gets offended at that, but the priest calmly holds him back and agrees with Hanram. Children still need to learn, which is why they have an alternative school run by their holy order. In fact, he even volunteers to show it to Hanram. Later, the priest and Hanram are headed into the countryside where the school is said to be located. To Hanram's surprise, the school was a quaint little place where happy children can be seen spread all over the place. Some are playing, some are sleeping, and some are listening to a teacher. The priest explains that they don't dictate what children want to do. They can play a rest when they want to, and then listen to lessons when they're ready. Hanram asks if they even teach a proper curriculum, but the priest points out that curriculums of today only barrage students with monotonous cramming for exams, thereby disregarding student individuality. Students nowadays just study to compete in entrance exams and not focus on any character building. And when these children become adults, they do the same thing to their children, making society an endless loop of competition. That is the hell called the education system. Compared to that hell, however, the kids in their holy congregation are all smiling. One child even happily approaches them and hands the priest a bouquet of flowers she collected. Hanrun knows that alternative schools tend to have more loose systems based on the values of the parents. These can cause issues due to the confined nature and freedom from the supervision of the government. But seeing the school before her, she was glad that this one didn't seem to have issues. She thanks the priest for his hospitality and is about to leave, but before she goes, the girl hands her a flower. She then tells Hanram, Come back anytime, Mr. Policeman. Hanram laughs and explains that she's not actually a policeman and she's a woman, but the mistake suddenly changes the girl's expression and the priest who is looking down with contempt on the little girl. The fleeting look of contempt fades away from the priest's face before Hanram can notice, and he explains to Hanram that a policeman came to visit them recently, so the girl might have just been mistaken. However, Juhui, who was watching from afar, was hopeful that Hanram might notice the mistake and dig deeper. In the past, that same little girl practiced all day long sending her lines while being struck by adults when she got it wrong. The whole thing was a carefully constructed act forced by the adults on the children when outsiders came to visit. They often have police or reporters snooping around because of their cult-like behavior so the kids were forced to memorize lines to deceive them all. Only through countless beatings and endless hours of rote memorization were they able to perfect their act. And so it successfully fools any policeman that visited them in the past. But now a mistake occurred just because they practiced for a male policeman, not a female teacher. Juhui prays to the gods that Hanrim noticed this error. Meanwhile, Hanrim is looking around and is starting to notice small peculiar details in the school. The kids listening to the teachers are all different ages, the kids having fun catching dragonflies are just waving their nets around, and now this girl is saying something obviously wrong. However, she can still do nothing based on the hunch. She decides to just come back next time with Huijin. Nevertheless, she is still pessimistic that they can do anything since no one is asking for help. Thankfully, Juhui suddenly grabs her and begs her not to go. Juhui starts confessing every bad thing in the place, with how they're just forced to act, and that in reality, they just get beat up on the farm if they don't work hard enough. If they say they want to leave, they get tortured and locked up for several days. Jui then points out that the little girl, Suiel, is already nine but still cannot add, subtract, or even read. They just want to go to school. Hanrim asks the priest if this is all true, but the priest points out that Juhui is just going through puberty and is in her rebellious phase. He then grabs Juhui and asks her to remember what happened to her little brother yesterday. But instead of being coward, Juhui pushes the priest away and shouts out to Hanrim that the priest also calls her every night and touches her everywhere. 
The priest strikes Ju Hui multiple times for her insolence, but Hanrim immediately intervenes and punches the priest back. The priest yells out to all his adult subordinates to attack Hanrim and brands her as a witch that came to defile their sanctuary. The adults armed with various tools surround Hanrim, who laughs at her new nickname. Someone attacks her but she kicks them back and steals their two hammers. She then remarks that outside Korea, her enemies gave her a codename, Baba Yaga. Meanwhile, Huijin continues tackling cases one after another for the TRPA with Hanrim gone on vacation leave. He now must take on four cases a day instead of two. He looks into the sky and wonders if Hanrim is enjoying her vacation right now. Well, Hanrim is indeed enjoying her vacation by bashing in the heads of the adults trying to attack her. The priest is dumbfounded upon watching Hanrim take on his whole congregation, yet still ends up winning. When all the guards are now down, Hanrim approaches the priest and grabs him by the throat. She asks him if all the allegations Juhi said are true, but the priest just starts spouting off passages from their holy book. Meanwhile, the little girl sees Hanrim choking their priest and savior, and she notices a sickle drop by one of the earlier adults. When Hanrim tries to cuff the priest, the little girl suddenly stabs her in the thigh. The priest smirks as Hanrim pushes away the girl, but two kids also grab Juhui. Even Juhyeok joins in on the action by attacking his sister with a sickle while spouting off holy passages. Hanrim tries to jump in to save her, but the little girl grabs her injured leg and hugs it, causing Hanrim to fall over in pain. When she looks up, more kids have now surrounded them armed with sickles of their own. A few days later, Weijin happily greets Hanrim at the office only to find out that she still hasn't returned from her leave. Annoyed at his co-worker, he attempts to call her, but all his calls get redirected to voicemail. Unbeknownst to him, Hanrim and Juhui are currently chained up at the headquarters of a cult. Weijin immediately gets worried upon hearing the voicemail message, since she knows Hanrim would always answer her calls. Military personnel never turn off their phones in case they get summoned for an emergency. Meanwhile, the priest stares at Hanrim's well-developed body with insidious thoughts and his hand slowly hovers near her chest. However, Hanrim tells him that he shouldn't probably add sexual assault to his ever-growing list of crimes. The priest backtracks and explains that he's just checking her wounds. Hanrim warns him that her colleague is probably looking for her right this moment so they should just turn themselves in for a lighter sentence. Instead of answering, however, the priest just shows Hanrim a letter of resignation for her to sign and implores her to convert to religion and use her sense of justice for their holy work instead. Hanrim sighs and asks them if they're planning to torture her until she agrees to sign the letter. However, the priest just smiles at her and informs her that they're not that barbaric. The next day, Hanrim and Juhui are brought outside tied up in their chairs in front of the whole congregation. The priest starts narrating to them how a believer among them was possessed by one of the most powerful demons in existence, which is why they will be performing the most powerful form of exorcism today, trashing. Hanrim realizes she will be lynched by all these people, but she observes that she can probably endure until Huijin arrives. Two adults from the group approach the tied-up girls and suddenly start smacking Juhui. Hanrim quickly argues to the priest that she should be the one being hit, but the priest replies that since she's a non-believer, then she's not qualified to participate in the ceremony. That means the one getting lynched is Juhui, not her. Hanrim turns to the crowd and implores them to intervene. Some of them must be parents, though, are they just going to watch someone's daughter get assaulted like this? The priest laughs and points out that the two adults starting the trashing were Juhui's own parents. Hanrim can only watch in horror as Juhui's parents beat her like a drum. After a few minutes, her parents walk to the side and the next person to come forward was her little brother, Juhayak. One by one, each member of the congregation steps forward and violently beats on her until Hanrim couldn't take it anymore and warns them that she's going to die. She finally agrees to sign the letter of resignation if they stop targeting Juhui. The priest shares the good news with his followers and exclaims that their miraculous trashing had moved the Red Witch into submission. They then untie one of Hanrim's hands and give her a pen to sign the paper with. In one swift move, Hanrim stabs the pen at the priest's neck and slams him into her knee. His guard is about to hit her when Hanrim warns them that she had stabbed their leader's artery. If she pulls it out, then he dies. With no one in the congregation able to defy her, Hanrim orders one of her guards to untie her and take the unconscious Juhui to the hospital. An hour later, the believers were able to show Hanrim a picture of Juhui safe and sound in a hospital bed, and they demanded that she let their leader go. Hanrim smiles and suddenly pulls out the pen, making the priest panic and run around. 
However, a few moments later, he notices that blood isn't spewing out of his neck. Hanram had been bluffing the whole time. But Hanram isn't done with him just yet as she pummels him once more with heavy strikes, ending with breaking his knee. A believer tries to strike her in the head with a metal pipe, but Hanram blocks and steals the weapon from her. She then tells them that before she thought they were all victims, but now she knows that they all abuse their children in the name of a cult. As such, she won't go easy on them like she did yesterday. In a flash, she went through them whacking and cracking their bones with her metal pipe. Meanwhile, the priest tries to limp away from her on his broken leg. The priest heads to a nearby greenhouse where the kids are playing. The kids immediately get scared of getting scolded because they are just playing around but the priest just tells them to get their sickles because the red witch is coming. However, it was too late. Hanram rips apart the greenhouse's walls and approaches them. The kids try to prepare their weapons, but Hanram easily breaks them apart. The priest tries to limp away again and Hanram gives chase. She throws the broken edge of a sickle right at the priest's shoulder, stabbing him and causing him to fall to the ground. And yet, he still tries to crawl away while Hanram slowly walks over with her metal pipe. The priest prays for God to deliver him from this evil, and at that very moment, a motorcycle comes hurtling down the road. It stops in front of him, and the rider removes his helmet. The priest was saved because Jesus himself came to save him. Unfortunately, the reality is that it was Huijin looking confused at what he was seeing. The priest bows down before Huijin and begs him to smite the witch. However, Hanran just happily greets Huijin, confusing the priest once more. Thus, Huijin smacks the priest with his helmet while explaining to Hanram that he called her emergency contact Suiyan. From her, he learned that Hanram was worried about a religious group calling schools demons. He forgives her for not contacting him because she wasn't sure of the mission yet, but he also berates her for confronting reclusive organizations by herself. Huijin asks her if it's all over already, but Hanram tells him that they still have one problem left. Behind them was a wave of kids angrily shouting at them for knocking their savior unconscious. After tying up the kids and interviewing them, Wedgen realizes how much the kids were brainwashed. They consider their work at the farm holy work and that they are holy warriors defending their faith. Even Juyak denies that he hurt his sister because for him, it was a demon. Hanrim observes that even if they put the cult's leader in prison, they won't know how these kids would fare in the real world. Wajin remarks that as children, they are especially susceptible to brainwashing. However, this can also be hopeful because they are also capable of changing fast. They would surely get better if they separated from the cult in time. But separating them won't be that easy. Even if the leader is in prison, the cult will live on. Hanram doesn't understand what he's saying, but she finally sees what he means when they exit the building. The cult members are now encircling them, begging on their knees for their cult to be freed. Whether their leader is convicted or not, the cult members won't listen to anybody else. If their leader is in prison, they'll campaign to free him. And since this cult has a strong religious focus, they also won't easily give up on their children if they try to separate them. This leaves them with only one choice. Huajin visits the priest in prison and requests him to break up their congregation before he goes to prison. If he does that, they will lighten his sentence. The priest smirks at them and points out that his believers are his strength and shield, so why would he do that? They won't be able to torture him to comply since the government can't do that. Wajin agrees with him that they won't be able to do that, but Hanrim abruptly gives Wajin her signed letter of resignation. With that, she's no longer a member of the government. Wajin smiles and leaves the room, letting the two civilians work things out between themselves. A few minutes later, the priest agrees to break up his congregation. However, Hanrim rejects his offer and tells him that she rather enjoy taking her revenge on him. The next day, the priest stands in front of his congregation once again, this time to break them up. He announces that thanks to their prayers, the holy deity had sent forth his angels and vanquished the demons. Therefore, they don't have any more reason to stay in their little paradise, but instead, head out into the world. The congregation was happy to learn that evil had been vanquished, but the moment their leader starts talking about them leaving, they immediately rebuke his statements. They accuse the priests of being possessed by demons and encourage each other to give him a trashing. Wajin scratches his head in frustration since he realized that it wasn't brainwashing or religious beliefs that kept the cult going. For them, religion isn't faith. It was an escape. The congregation starts beating up the priest in the hopes of dragging the demon out of him, but Juhui yells at them that they don't even believe in the religion. Every adult there knows that what they're doing is wrong, but they just keep doing it because they don't want to go back to the real world. 
They were all defeated in all areas of life, so when some random priest starts calling them chosen ones, they cling to that illusion. She shouts at her parents that they were just there because their restaurant business was on the verge of shutting down, so they ran away like losers. Her father charges at Juhui, but Juhui abruptly slams him. She then grabs her little brother and tells her parents that they were the ones who chose to join a cult, not them. They can keep living there all they like, but they are leaving. Jayek asks his sister if the demons are truly vanquished and Juhui sadly explains to him that there were no demons in the first place. Only a con artist who Hanrim promptly cuffs. A few months later, the priest, with his vast wealth from his followers, hired the best lawyers in the country. However, the TRPA witnessed everything in the cult firsthand and refuted all their arguments. Outside the courthouse, the priest's followers are still rallying for the release of their leader, but the TRPA can't do anything about them. It was their choice. It was enough that they were able to separate them from their kids. Hanrim felt disappointed at this, but Juhui sent her a picture of all of them studying and it can't help but make Hanrim smile. Meanwhile, Hui Jin also receives a call, and he quickly heads back to the courthouse. Somewhere in Korea, Dong Kiel Go receives his first salary as a full-time employee of the construction company Hui Jin introduced him to way back then. Hui Jin then arrives and hands Dong Kiel a letter, telling him that he has some good news. The news reports that it's been one year since the launch of the TRPA, they started by arresting the politician Kwang Pil Ryu's bully son, and now they are even taking down cults confining children. All over Korea, students talk about the TRPA, it's not sure if the TRPA lowered the rate of violations against the right to education. But students now expect the TRPA to show up if someone crosses the line. But where are the people who the TRPA had saved? Hyeonju has now graduated from Guwon Tech and been hired by a major company, prompting his past bullies to happily celebrate with him. In prison, Mr. Go's wife visits Yeri and asks her to stop sending any more letters. She points out that Yeri doesn't look sorry in her pictures with the TRPA and Yeri explains that she was just helping runaway teens then. Mr. Go's wife commends Yeri for helping people worse off than her and asks Yeri to stop by her place when she's finally released from prison and she'll welcome her with a warm meal. On an island somewhere, residents are still trying to extort money from newcomers to the island but a huge man nicknamed Whale tells them to back off. Meanwhile, Mr. Lee continues his crusade against the TRPA, writing articles and reports against them. Yunha is now the captain of the baseball team. Ms. Sanghi is teaching gender equality. The cult leader meets Mr. Chien in prison, and the 14-year-old Ju Wong truly ended up back in juvenile detention. Meanwhile, Miss Choi and Yu Jin's mom are now on friendly terms, and the runaway teens are going to school. Lastly, Dong Kiel is finally reunited with Min Seo, his son. Wejin happily watches Dong Kiel walk away with his son when Gang Shou calls him and berates him for not going back to work. Thus, Wejin goes back to work, not knowing until when the TRPA can exist, but he decides to do his best and help as much as he can until it still does. That's the end of Season 1. Please stay tuned for Season 2. Thank you for supporting this series.